29. Ten hut! Someone called, and the officers got to their feet. Even the retired admiral who supervised the station stood. As you were, Chris said. At least at this meeting, she didn't have to fight for her seat. The four captains were down the sides of the table, Samson as far from her on her right as possible. The station master took the foot. Captain Drago, whether because his ship was in the yard or because he was not navy but contractor, sat against the wall next to the door. Chris sat. That didn't go as well as I would have liked, or as bad as it could have. She gave Samson a quick glance. She was sullen and not looking at her. You'll have the rest of today to mend and fix, make your ships ready for 4G maneuvering, and we'll do it again day after tomorrow, 0900. I expect we will get away from the pier smartly this time. Captain Drago has his wasp in the yard, but I'm sure he can spare you some specialists for improving the maneuvering jets on your ships. Three captains looked Captain Drago's way. He gave a resigned sigh and nodded that he'd help them. Again, Samson stayed in her funk. I'm afraid that what you've just heard is the good news. I have a lot worse news for you and the fleet. Quickly, she filled them in on the food status for the planet below them. Three sets of eyes widened as the full extent of the situation dawned on them. Samson's eyes narrowed. So you see, we not only need to get ready to fight, but also attend to our logistics. The Marines have landed this morning to help fishermen kill predators that regularly steal their catch. I'm told that they killed two. Sadly, one led to a feeding frenzy and drove off all the fish at that beach. The other kill went smoother. The predator washed ashore and they've cut it up. <laughs> We may be finding some interesting meat in Kiet's Thai stir fries. The fishermen on that beach said it was the best catch in memory. Chris shrugged. You win some, and you lose some. Another team of Marines, two platoons of Imperial Marines with Colonel Montoya, are trying to tie in to a group of Alwins who have managed to survive in the deep woods. I understand from their latest report that they've killed two huge predators. Something between a kangaroo and a saber toothed tiger, and are planning on barbecuing it for themselves. The aroma might draw in some of the Alwins. So far, they're hiding. However, they are surviving on small game, roots, nuts, and berries. Once we get the local predators under control, we may be adding some of that to our larder. Chris leaned forward. Mr. Benson is working with his crew to create a lot of necessary gear from smart metal. Fishing boats, both harpoon rigged to take on the big eats everythings, and trawlers to bring in fish for dinner and to fertilize the colonial fields. We need airplanes to help the scientists quickly finish their planetary resource survey, and ships to move things like bird guano, rich in nitrates for ammunition. From where it is to the colonies. He needs smart metal, Kitano said. Yes, and the frigates are the only source of it we have. The plan is to pull fifteen to twenty thousand tons from each ship as you give up your hell burners. That will let us get started as quickly as we can on logistic issues. I've got a meeting scheduled with the industrial and mining interests just as soon as I talk to your subordinates in the wardroom. As the mines and plants produce steel and other essentials that can take the place of the smart metal, it comes back to your ships. Chris drew a deep breath. If our early warning system reports imminent attack, the smart metal comes back to your ships immediately. <laughs> If you have enough warning, Samson tossed in, half hand grenade, half sarcasm. We will have enough warning. We have buoys to cover six or more jumps out from here. We will know what the bastards are doing in our space. This is all stupid, Samson snapped. We're risking our ships to feed ourselves because the people we came here to save can't feed us, much less defend themselves. 
We shouldn't be sending smart metal down where we may never get it back. We should be packing up and getting out of here. Chris leaned back in her chair and took the measure of her three other captains. Samson had not impressed them before. She was not impressing them now. Thank you for your opinion, Lieutenant Commander Samson. Chris knew that was a double slap. She had not recognized her as the captain of a ship. She had not even given her the honor normally afforded a lieutenant commander of being addressed as commander. Samson's face reddened, but she said nothing. I knew the situation was bad when I took this command. That it's worse than even the king realized when he appointed me does not persuade me that it is hopeless. Other ships are coming out to reinforce us. They will need to eat. Logistics, as I have often been told, is what separates the professional warrior from the dilettante and amateur. The time may come when running is our only choice. From where I sit right now, that time is not now. We will stay, and we will prepare to fight. Now Chris did fix her eyes on Samson. Last night, I ordered you to transfer a chief to Mr. Benson. He was, until recently, the skipper of a fishing boat. We need him to command a fishing boat again, harpooning the big ones. You asked for an explanation for me ordering his transfer last night. You have it now. Will I get a replacement for him? Samson shot back. No, Chris said bluntly. Other sailors will be drafted off the frigates to help with the food issue. There are no replacements. I know this will be a leadership challenge. I expect all of you to meet it. Any questions? Chris said with finality. There were none. Then all of you, except Lieutenant Commander Sampson, are dismissed to join your staffs in the wardroom. I'll be with you as soon as possible. Feel free to discuss our food problem with them. If anyone has any ideas, <laughs> I'm hungry for them. That drew a chuckle as the officers filed out of the room. Former Admiral Benson eyed Samson, then glanced at Chris. His eyes held a good luck in them, but he said nothing. Should I shorten the table, Chris? No, Nellie. I like her just where she is. The scion of wealth and power faced the scion of a family whose navy blood went back to when ships sailed the seas, not space. They locked eyes. Chris began yet another battle for her command. 30. As soon as the door closed, Samson filled the silence. Yes, my ship has problems. All new ships do. And this is a new class and a new design that not even headquarters can figure out what to do with. Besides, my crew is sloven and needed additional training before we sailed. What happened today was not my fault. Wrong answer, Chris said. General Trouble taught me from the start that when the question is raised about a command's failures, the only answer for the CO is... Mine, sir. Samson's eyes fell to the table. We can't all be legends. Chris pulled the flimsies that Nellie had printed out and tossed them across the table to Samson. Are these the availability reports from the USS Constellation for the last week? I don't know. Maybe. Came in full evasion. Is that your signature at the bottom of each of them? It might be. I've got a cute ship's lieutenant who can sign my name better than I can. Chris liked this woman less and less. In the exercise today, your ship was able to operate just 40% of your main battery, and your reloads were few to non-existent. I told you, my crew needs more training. They're the dregs of the brigs. You think the best would come out here. 
face a helpless fight with one of them damn long knives who never knows when to call it off, <laughs> but can run away herself just fine. Chris knew the tactic. Samson couldn't face her on the facts, so she was changing the subject, throwing all kinds of dirt and mud Chris's way. Chris stayed on subject and bored in. Your reactor spent most of the exercise redlined. One went offline entirely. You were at risk of a major engineering casualty, one that threatened your entire ship. Yet you did not inform me of your problems or ask to drop out of formation. There's no way you can know that, Samson snapped, then switched gears in mid-defense. And whoever told you that is lying through their teeth. I have the reports that show my engineering was performing at 4.0. Lieutenant Commander, I was personally monitoring the Connie's engineering performance. It was because of my own assessment of the risks you were taking to cover up your failed performance that I gave the Connie specific and separate acceleration orders from the rest of the squadron. Chris had had enough of this. Lieutenant Commander, your squadron commander has lost confidence in you and your ability to perform your duties as captain of the USS Constellation. You are relieved of your command and will be reassigned to the shipyard. Clearly, Mr. Benson has more than enough work to keep all his personnel busy. Samson shot to her feet. She glowered down at Chris. You can't relieve me of my command. The Navy gave me that ship and only the Navy can take it away from me. The Navy also gave me command of this squadron, Chris snapped. You stand relieved. You're no squadron commander. Just because your grandfather lets you hold down a desk doesn't make you anything. That great-grandfather is your king, Chris pointed out through clenched teeth who, as soon as he got wind of the rumor that his old lady was alive, yelled for us to drop everything and parade across the galaxy so he could sniff at her skirts. Chris was appalled. That woman you're talking about is the former commander of Bat Crew Ron 16 and the retired leader of this colony. Since when does the Navy leave anyone behind? You know they're alive, you get them. Even if you have to cross a galaxy, Chris said, thinking of her own debt to Phil Tausig and the Hornet. The woman towering over Chris paused for a moment. Was she finally hearing her own words? If she did, it didn't seem to matter. She shook her head. You're not relieving me of command for any of that. You're relieving me because a lot of my crew came whining to you that I won't let them sleep around like the rest of the skippers do. I know. Officers enlisted, they're all merging their single rooms and fornicating. <laughs> I won't let that happen on my ship. I keep my crew in proper bunk rooms so we can keep our armor up. The rest of them may think they'll have time to armor up when the enemy shows up. I keep my ship combat ready at Condition Baker all the time. No love boat, mine. Chris refused to be led down that rabbit hole. Doggedly, she went back to the facts. I am relieving you strictly for your lack of performance today, Lieutenant Commander. For a moment, Samson continued to scowl down at Chris. Then she spat. You arrogant, self-serving bastard. You don't know what a Navy tradition is. How dare you lecture me on respect for them. You upstart. You're the one who's going to turn my Navy ships into whorehouses and your officers into whores and pimps. Here was a blatant challenge to Chris. To Chris, her entire command, and very likely, the king whose orders she obeyed. With slow, cold deliberation, Chris rose to her feet. For the first time in her life, she found her full six feet coming to good use. Now she stared down at Samson. Samson looked up at Chris and seemed to shrink even before Chris said, you will brace yourself, miss, and you will keep your mouth shut except to answer yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. 
Do you understand? Rage flamed in Samson's eyes. She wanted to do anything but follow Chris's orders. Still, Samson had worn the uniform so long that she could not but come slowly to attention. If you say anything again like what you just did, I will forget my intentions of relieving you for loss of confidence. I will have you up on charges for actions unbecoming an officer and actions prejudicial to the service, if not worse. We will let a court-martial get to the bottom of exactly how reports with your signatures claiming full battle readiness left your ship, it being in a battle zone and on standby for battle at any time. I will see you cashiered from this navy. That was too much for Samson. You may think you can prance around in this little fiefdom of yours, Long Knife, doing anything a spoiled rich brat may want. But no real Navy Court of Officers will find me guilty of anything but doing the best anyone could at an impossible job. I told everyone we needed three more months to get the Connie ready for space, but that king of yours gets word his old lady is here and we're ordered to space in a week. I'll get my command back the second we get back in human space, she said, glaring at Chris. That was not a yes, ma'am, or a no, ma'am. But I'll answer it. There are no ships headed back for human space. All of us had better start planning on being here for the next five, ten years, assuming we don't lose the next battle with these bastards and just die. Maybe you weren't listening or failed to get the message. We are all here for the duration. And here, if you don't work, you don't eat. As of right this second, you are out of a job. You can apply your competency with ships and their gear. Your fitness reports say you have some. Or you can resign your commission and drop down to the planet and look for a job. Have you cut and gutted fish, spread manure over fields? Those jobs have openings. Chris let that sink in. It looked like Samson might have actually heard some of it. Now get out of my sight. The Navy officer did a perfect about-face, but halfway to the door, she stumbled and had to make a grab for a chair. With each step she took toward the door, she seemed to deflate like a balloon. Once the door closed behind her, Chris settled down into her chair. Her heart was pounding and her mouth was dry. She felt like she'd spent an hour with puggle sticks in OCS. Abby knocked on the door from Chris's night cabin, entered before Chris replied, and offered her a glass of water. I'd make it stronger, but we aren't on the wasp. Water's just fine, Chris said. She drank it down and handed the glass back to her maid. She found herself rubbing at the tension in her scalp. Why was that meeting just about the hardest I've ever had? Because you can't kill the SOB, Abby said. Seeing them that deserves it dead at your feet kind of feels good. This civilization thing is overrated. And you are way too bloodthirsty for a maid. And you're alive because of it two or three times. <laughs> All too true. You hear anything about some place we might wrestle up some chow? Sorry, baby ducks, but all my back channels are with the Colonials, and they're at the end of their rope. I hear whispers that Ada was kind of worried that next year they might have to start doing that egg examination thing. Ouch, said Chris. I guess we got here just in time. Well, sounds like it. Chris stood. Two meetings down, two more to go. Check with Amanda and Penny. Tell them I'd like to have them at the meeting with the business folks. Penny can bring Masao if she wants. Your meeting with them is in 45 minutes. So I better get this next one over fast, Chris said, and headed for the ward room. 31. A ten hut, greeted Chris once more, and she did her best to say, 
as you were, before too many people were out of their chairs. The ward room had three long tables, pretty empty this time of day. Most present had congregated at the far end, near the coffee urn. Chris went to stand beside the urn. Either she or the coffee should hold their attention. The first exercise always looks worst. We've had ours. Now we'll do better. You have the rest of today and tomorrow to mend and make ready for a repeat of this exercise Thursday. She paused before adding, We will do better, in a voice that left no room for doubt. She searched around the room. Many were seated in groups of six around their captain. There was a group of five. Lieutenant Sims, I believe you were the XO of the Constellation? Yes, ma'am, the young J.O. said, jumping to his feet. You are effective immediately, acting captain. Getting a ship is supposed to be an officer's dream. Lieutenant Sims's face showed no joy. He looked more like Chris had invited him to his own hanging. She'd have to do something about that, and quick. Mr. Benson, Chris said. Yes, Your Highness, the old admiral replied. The Constellation will not be involved in any more squadron exercises for now. It is to go into the shipyard as soon as you finish upgunning the Wasp and Intrepid. I expect that to be in ten days or so. Mr. Sims, you and the crew of the Constellation have ten days to mend and make ready, so the Yard has little to do when they get you but remove the Hellburners and remove more of your smart metal. The man gulped. Now his face showed relief that he wouldn't be taking the Connie out any time soon, but Chris had also dropped a heavy burden on him and his crew. She expected a lot of what was wrong to be right before the Yard had to lend a hand. And Mr. Sims... If I were in your shoes, I'd set condition able and give the crew some more comfortable and private quarters. We're a long way from home and we have those bastards breathing down our neck. Things are bad enough without hunting for morale problems. Yes, ma'am. Good idea. At last, he showed relief. Now to our main problem. We came here to fight. We brought a base force, thank you very much, Mr. Benson, to keep us in fighting shape. We brought an industrial base to support us. We brought everything we thought we needed, but it doesn't seem to be enough. Chris paused. It was clear her listeners had already gotten the word. They say an army moves on its stomach and, at least in that one way, navies are the same. The folks below have been living on the edge of starvation for 80 years, and they don't have a reserve that can feed 20,000 more mouths. We must feed ourselves. And the beer, ma'am? Chris didn't see where the question came from, but she had the answer and gave it to them. Since we arrived, the Colonials have not had a drop to drink. They've given us all they have. I wondered why I was drinking water on my honeymoon. That got a laugh, but a dry one. This morning, Marines dropped down to look at several ways to increase the food available to us and the Colonials. Some worked, others were less successful. A few big-toothed critters thought to develop a taste for marine, and will be served up as barbecue tonight. More laughter. If the marines get their sights on more of them, we may be serving a new kind of burger at the Canopus Burger Bin. Some looked intrigued by the thought of a new taste, others not so much. As soon as I finish here, I've got a meeting scheduled with the industrial and mining types. We'll be going over their plans. Those plans will now include such logistical items as steel fishing boats, aircraft to speed up the survey of this planet, and trucks and ships to haul food from where we find it to where our stomachs are. They are in for a surprise. That got a good laugh. The Navy had a thing about surprising proud business types. However, we need to get more food moving into our supply chain fast. The fastest way to do that is to use smart metal, to knock together some things we need quickly. The only source for smart metal is the ships you're training to fight. We'll be offloading anything that doesn't have to be on you. Marines, scientists, hellburners. That will give us some smart metal. Chris paused. 
the room had gotten real quiet. Also, we'll be offloading more smart metal by thinning your armor. The plan is to return all the smart metal before we have to fight. How are you going to do that? Again, Chris didn't see her questioner, but she clearly spoke for the whole room. We brought jump point and communication buoys. We have enough to cover every jump within 12 jumps of this planet. If a buoy goes silent, we go on alert. If two in a row go down, we drop everything and get ready to fight. That didn't settle the question as well as it could. Some seemed sure the warning system would work. Others were doubters. Chris recognized an argument she could not win and went on. We'll also be taking some of your personnel to crew fishing boats and a freighter or two, fly transports and go hunting. Some shore leaves may involve a lot fewer bars and a lot more digging for wild vegetables and fruits, maybe even hunting for meat. Well, if we've drunk the pubs dry, I might feel like shooting something, a wag offered and got the laugh he deserved. Chris let the room enjoy the humor and waited until it sobered. Good men and women died fighting that the people on this planet might live. Yes, we've got a hard fight ahead of us, but it's one we can win. Yes, getting ready for this fight just got harder and more complicated, but it's nothing we can't handle together. When we look back on this, we will have quite a tale to tell our grandkids. Every time they hear it, they will know that they come from heroes. Dismissed. 32. Chris found Amanda, Penny, and Masao waiting in the passageway outside her quarters. Have you heard anything from the Wildwood Expedition? Amanda asked. Her Jacques was with Jack and two platoons of Imperial Marines. My last report is that they found some real ugly critters, some kind of cross between a kangaroo and a saber-toothed tiger. Amanda blanched. No casualties on our side. Several of the Kanga tigers have been invited to dinner. Jack hopes the aroma of a barbecue will draw out the locals. But no contact, Amanda said. They haven't shot at us, nor have they talked to us, Chris said. The first inning is over, and the score is nothing to nothing, said Masao. It looks to be a long ball game. And now we have our own ball game, Chris said. If you will follow me. Chris entered her day cabin. Her chair at the table was empty, as were the ones at either elbow. As soon as one of the six private reps saw that another seat was needed close to Chris, he gave up his chair. Nellie lengthened the table and added a chair for him. I can never get used to that. One of those who hadn't had to move muttered softly. There's a lot to get used to on this side of the galaxy, Chris said. Like nothing to eat, said the young woman who'd done the best talking last evening. So you've heard, Chris said. Why didn't you tell us about that last night, one of the men demanded. Because Amanda here, Chris said, indicating the lovely economist with a wave of her hand, didn't have a chance to tell me about what she found until after you left. I figured I could dump more on you, or see what you have done so far, then let you adjust as you see fit. Chris glanced around the table. By the way, weren't there fifteen here last night? Six are working on refining what we are presenting you. I'm afraid the others are trying to drink the bar dry. I'm not sure how that will help any. No doubt they will soon be cut off. I foresee career openings on fishing boats as farm hands and gathering wild roots, nuts, and berries, Chris said. They weren't bad men in human space. Your honest briefing last night was a shock to us all. I hope they'll recover. Okay, let's get started. I'm Pipra Strongarm, and yes, I can arm wrestle with the best of them. I thought I was number two in the new enterprise's management, but then you pulled out your CEO status and my boss adjourned to the bar. There has been some reorganization since last night. Two corporations, their top managers trying to drink my top management under the table, have resulted in their two-sixths of the enterprise being taken over by new enterprises. 
How'd that happen? Chris asked. With no leadership to notice, I kind of performed a gentle takeover. There are advantages, some think, to working for the company that the Viceroy has control of. Also, in the mess we're in, having a damn Longknife calling the shots, at least Chris Longknife, makes it seem like a good idea. Pipra paused. However, there being no stock exchange or financial institution to fund anything, my hold on things is purely voluntary. If I were in your shoes, Your Highness, Viceroy of Alwa, I'd walk carefully. Hard to believe as it may be, Pipra, that's how I always like to walk, Chris said. It just hardly ever comes out that way, Penny said. Let's pause for a moment and go around the table. I don't think all of you have met my staff, and other than Pipra, I don't know your names. They did the round-the-table thing. Chris found that three large corporations were represented by two men and a woman. New Enterprises had three present, one of which admitted to having been recently acquired from one of the now-defunct businesses. Chris cut to the chase. What can you do for us? We like that large crater in the northern area of the moon. It's rich in iron and has water. If we land the fabrication plants there, we can produce iron and steel almost from day one. That's a basic commodity often ignored by developed economies, but it's a good one if you're starting from scratch. As we are, Chris said. On the approach here, we spotted lithium and other rare earths for electronics, superconductors, and just about everything a modern economy needs. They are not concentrated, so we'll likely have to send two or three different mining operations out to get them. And that means three different ships and reactors. That's a problem we'll be dropping in your lap. Sometimes I wish I had a bigger lap, Chris said. I'm told that there is one reactor ready to be dropped down to the Colonials and go online immediately. There are two that will need some refurbishing that we will ship to the moon just as fast as the work can be done. The Navy Yard is booked solid. Do you have any resources you could devote to the reactor project? Don't you just love it when management plays volleyball? One of the other managers drawled. I'll send out a call for help on that one, Pipra said. About the refurbishing process, does everything have to be built from scratch, or can we cannibalize the fourth reactor to get the other ones going? I promised the fourth to the Colonials, but they may have to wait, Chris admitted. One of our batty ideas last night was to get cooperation from the natives. They seem to be taking a shine to our electric gadgets— could we earn money by selling them windmills to charge them, then use the money to hire them? The windmills are a good idea, Chris said. That would cut down on the demands being made on the colonial power supply. However, the Alwins don't have any concept of money. We'd get goodwill and some IOUs of a vague sort. But if we got them planting extra food to pay us... Pipra left hanging. And, as I understand, one of the other managers said, our marines are going to be taking out a lot of their big carnivores. That should leave them with wild woods that have been off limits to them, but that they can farm their own way. Maybe not as efficient as our way, but any food helps. The conversation went long and was surprisingly fruitful. Chris decided that even business folks, when faced with a make-it-work-or-starve situation, could do a good job of making it work. That left Chris and her abbreviated team making plans to drop down and see what a meeting with Ada might produce. The survey of the planet had turned up a copper mountain that would provide wiring, windings for electric engines, all kinds of nice stuff, if the locals didn't mind it being strip-mined. Everywhere Chris turned, there was more juggling. Then, just as Penny, Masao, and Amanda were about to leave, Professor Joao Lebeo walked in. And do you have a minute? I have some things you may find interesting. By a minute, do you mean an hour or a half hour? Chris asked. Hour, maybe less. Staff, would you hang here for a few minutes? If he starts boring you, feel free to leave. 
If I fall asleep, you can definitely leave. What I have to tell you will definitely not put you to sleep. 33. We have results back from our study of the alien mothership. Oh, and I think I can move more of my scientist's dirt side. I understand you need the smart metal from our rooms and pubs. I have asked, and 85 to 90 percent of my team have volunteered to transfer their work to colonial territory. We will need energy to power our analytical machines, as well as housing and food. If that can be assured, I think we can convert the large barn where they hold their annual harvest festival into the Alwa Colonial Research Center. That's gracious of you. Have you arranged any of this, or are you coming to see me to see if I can make it happen? The professor smiled so aristocratically at Chris. Of course, Your Highness. We will need for the Viceroy to make it happen. Why do I bother asking dumb questions? Chris scolded herself. I'll add that to my other topics for tomorrow's meeting with the Colonials, Chris said, with as much of a smile as she could manage. Nellie, you can get me on Ada's schedule for tomorrow, can't you? I'm calling. She's in a meeting right now and is ignoring the gentle reminder of her computer that she has a message coming in. Should I change the settings on her computer to be more insistent? <laughs> no, Nellie. We're their guests, not their overlords. Let me know when you get a reply. So, Professor, I thought you said you had information about the aliens and their base ships. Yes. We have examined their agricultural facilities, food having become suddenly of great importance to us. And? We have found where their dead go, I think. While much of the hydroponics gardens are part of their sewage and recycling system, there is a portion set apart. This also has that same pattern on its ceiling that we think is a star chart. While most of the ship is designed for humanity cheek to jaw, this area grows something like grain, as well as a vine that we analyzed and which produces a fruit easily converted to alcohol. Bread and wine, Amanda said softly. This is my body. This is my blood. Yes. Several of the researchers of the Catholic perspective had the same observation. We think that cremains are sprinkled in this garden, and the fruit of these plants are special to them. So the bastards may have a soul, Chris said. I would have put it a bit more gently, Penny said. Still, it shows something that we have in common, some hope for an afterlife or rebirth, the professor said. Or they just want to remember their ancestors in some fashion but can't devote much room to it, Masao said. Chris noted how each of the humans had interpreted the alien behavior within the confines of their own culture and expectations. She sighed. The aliens were alien. That was the whole idea. Oh, and they want to kill us, no matter how much they remember Grandpa or Grandma. Anything on the technical side? Chris asked. What about the reactors that were removed or the lasers? Based on the power leadouts, we know they were using superconducting cables and that the reactors were large enough to power a large city. The leads into the laser bays that were also removed were the type we'd use for a 15 or 16-inch laser. Not having one to examine, I don't know how focused the laser is, so I can only guess at range. From our experience, it seemed to be equal to our range and just as deadly. Penny said. I beg to differ, the professor said. We have reviewed the video of the battle. It is not very good, but it leaves us wondering about just how powerful their lasers were. They used a lot of them, no question about that. But regarding their range and power, gun for gun, we are not willing to give them equal power with us. 
The professor paused and gave that shrug Chris had come to expect so often from the professional scientist. We cannot be sure based on the data available, but we think the question of who has the most powerful lasers is still very much on the table. I'll try to remember that next time I get in a shootout with one of them, Chris said. If you could avoid blowing it to gas and bring something home to look at, it might be nice, the scientist said. That's easier said than done, Chris pointed out. There were other minor things the boffins were willing to estimate. The huge ship had a basic population of 30 to 50 billion people. This stopped Chris in her tracks. She'd felt guilty, thinking she'd slaughtered 10 to 15 billion. This left her stunned. Still, the professor went on. No, they had no idea how many might have survived Chris's hellburners. Half to two-thirds of the ship's population might have died in either the actual explosions or the sudden opening of the ship to the void of space. It did not have a lot of internal airtight bulkheads. Clearly, these folks intended to be the ones doing unto others, not having someone else doing unto them. The professor left, again reminding Chris that she needed to arrange for the landing of his boffins. Chris was left to wonder how fast a population that huge could adjust to the change humanity presented them with and what they might do to improve their prospects. Humanity had produced the smart metal frigates and put the 20-inch laser rifles into production. What did the bastards have in reserve? Nellie, how much room would 30 billion people take up? Do you mean standing back to back, Chris? No. Assume they get a square yard per person. Back on Wardhaven, the public land survey is still laid out in square mile blocks— 64 square miles to a township. How many townships are we talking about? A continent's worth? Think three million people to a square mile, Chris. A 100 by 100 miles square would hold 30 billion. So it's actually spacious in their moon size base. That would be hard to say. Chris thought on that for a while then remembered she needed help on her hellburner question. She had to call another meeting with Pipra, a mining expert, and Admiral Benson. Penny and her lieutenant stayed, though Amanda excused herself. If there was a mountain of copper to be strip-mined, she needed to check on its location and the local attitudes. If it was down south, the ostrich types might not mind— of course, the ore would have to be shipped north for refinement and manufacturing. Nothing came easy. I was wondering when we'd talk about those hellburners I'm collecting, the former admiral said as he quick-walked into Chris's office. Chris brought everyone up to speed on the ideas of burying the hellburners deep under the surface of three moons, close to the alien's line of approach from the jump to Alwa. The mining boss, Burkant Fulon, a man with calluses on his hand and a quick eye for details, questioned the worth of hellburners a million kilometers or so from the likely target. If we put them too close, they'll get lazed in no time flat, Chris simply said. Well, I don't see any problems. If you'd let us use one of your frigates, we could drill some good holes with their 20-inch guns. But all we'd have to show for it is a fine dust, Chris pointed out. And the problem with that is, Burkant asked. I want gravel, rocks, pebbles, and other junk to toss into their flight path. <laughs> Woman, I bet you also want egg in your beer. Speaking of, I'd settle for just a beer about now. I'm telling you what I need for a fight for your and my life. You can have a beer after we finish this meeting. A big hole in three moons— Maybe with two or three ways out, the miner said, starting a list. Lots of messy stuff left over. It's an unusual request, I must say, ma'am. You think the bastards might not trust any moon behind them. Maybe they'll laser the whole surface. I expect they will, so we may need to redig the hole 
before we can launch the Hellburners. Which will tie up more of my equipment, the miner grumbled. Do you have diggers to do this job? The former admiral asked. I got them. I may need some support stuff I don't have, a conveyor belt to get all those rocks this lovely lady wants. More use for smart metal, the admiral said. Lots and lots of uses, Chris said with a sigh. That meeting adjourned, but the yard boss stayed behind. You're going to owe me one for taking Samson off your hands, he said. Send me the bill, Chris said. Just keep her too busy to cause me trouble. I doubt that's possible, but keeping her busy, that I can do. You might also try to get her to take a fitness for duty physical. I can't help but wonder if there's more going on in her than she's saying, and she said a lot. You want me to order her to get one? Chris sighed. Uh, ask. I'll ask. Absent an order, I doubt she'll listen. Yeah. This why you stayed? Chris said, feeling suddenly tired. No. Actually, the reason was quite different. When we finally get those four large frigates spun out of the prosperity and enterprise, we're going to need to name them. I suppose someone has already decided something? Yes, your royal highness, viceroy of Alwa, but they are all to hell and gone on the other side of the galaxy. I figured you might have some opinions of your own. What are the names? Chris said, now feeling all the exhaustion of the day. The yard boss handed her a short list. She read down it. Congress? <laughs> well... They appointed me, and we've already got a monarch. Seems like a good idea. Royal, I guess that balances Congress. Constitution and Constellation. Bulwark, that seems to be our job here. Ardent? Who came up with that one? The Admiral shrugged. Chris reached for a stylus and scratched through the last name. In its place, she wrote, Hornet. She handed the list back to the former Navy man. There are the names for your new heavy frigates, he smiled. Good fighting names. I'll see that they are commissioned as such, hopefully before you get back from hunting for the old hornet. Chris found herself finally alone. It had been an exhausting day. No doubt a lot of people were cussing her name as they worked late cleaning up the mess they hadn't known they had until she showed them. Nellie, did you ever get me an appointment with Ada? Yes. You were tied up in meetings, so I held off. Is eleven o'clock too early? No. It will give me time to get down and back and maybe have some meetings here to file the teeth down on the alligators up here. Strange. Ada said something along the same line. No doubt your princess will leave me with a whole lot of work to do, Better I find out early in the day so I can get some of it done. Chris read reports until she couldn't keep her eyes open any more, then shambled off to her night quarters and barely made it out of her uniform before she fell in bed already half asleep. Is this any way for a bride to behave? She asked herself. Her husband dirt sighed, and she too exhausted to do anything if he weren't. Of course, if he were here... He'd have to be one deck down and in the next frame. She fell asleep before she could contemplate any further the unfairness of it all. 34. Nellie woke Chris at 0545. Chris, Jack Shuttle will dock in 15 minutes. Do you want to be there to greet him? It was amazing just how fast Chris shot out of bed and pulled on yesterday's whites. She had one of those female premonitions that new whites would be wasted on her returning husband. She was at the docking bay just as Longboat 2 locked in. Jack was first off. At this early hour, there were few personnel around to witness their commodore and the colonel of the Marine Strike Force throw themselves at each other 
and lock into a kiss that showed just how much they'd missed each other. They weren't alone, though. Amanda and Jacques were just as tightly intertwined. And both of the men were as muddy and grimy as if they'd been on a four-week campaign. Chris's day-old whites would need special laundering, but who cared? Was it dangerous? Both women asked their men at the same time. No, and not a bit, were their answers. The lie might have held if four Marines hadn't exited the longboat at that moment with a pole stretched between them. Dangling from the pole was the newly named Kanga Tiger. That's huge, Chris said. You shot that? Amanda demanded of Jacques. Not me. Three or four Marines took it down. Not a bit dangerous, Chris said, elbowing Jack. Since he was in full battle rattle, the armor hurt her elbow more than it did anything to him. It's all in your perspective. You're a viceroy. You go to meetings, or so I hear. <laughs> I'm a marine. I get to play in the mud and kill really nasty things that need killing. A job's a job. Chris kissed him again. Want to trade? No way would I let you go for a walk in those woods. It's not just the big things. They got little things that will take your hand off before you even know they're there. I can't tell you how much I admire the Alwyns who've set up camp in those woods, or how glad they are to find Marines willing to help them. They may have survived, but they've got no problems with seeing some of these eat em ups get their comeuppance from a Marine fire team. Another big thing with lots of teeth was carried out. It had six legs. How many of these eat em all ups are there? Amanda asked. I'm sure we can find a biologist willing to categorize and name them all. For me, they're just targets. And chow. They make good eating, Jack said. Chris adjourned to her cabin with Jack. They both needed a shower, so they saved water by sharing one. Abby was sent to get a set of greens and tans for Jack. He being her security chief, it seemed only appropriate that he accompany Chris back down to her meetings. I don't think there are any folks mad enough at me dirt side to start shooting, Chris said from a comfortable position under Jack. But I should keep an eye on you. They were decent by the time Abby got back with Jack's uniform. Chris had never slept on a shuttle flight. Jack had no trouble falling asleep as soon as he buckled in, and Chris rested her head on his shoulder. She found herself waking up as they docked. What Chris was starting to think of as her new staff were with her, Amanda and Jacques, Penny and Masao, with Abby thrown in for reasons that were not clear, as usual. Somehow, Sergeant Bruce had ended up leading the Marine Security Detachment. Chris accredited that to his having one of Nellie's kids. Officially, that had to be the reason. It couldn't be that he was just as interested in staying close to Abby as she was to Jack. Ada greeted them at the landing with the jitney. This time, Chris rode shotgun next to Ada. Before we get started, do you have any problems I need to know about? Chris asked. With the best of intentions, I know we can get off on the wrong foot. Beside Chris, the reason the shuttle had been so sluggish pulling away from the Princess Royal became clear. It must have had 500 tons of extra smart metal wrapped around it. The metal was streaming from the shuttle down the pier in a thin cable to form a cube ashore. On the other side of the cube, a chief was spinning a truck out. So far, so good, Viceroy, Ada said, after a bit of hesitation. There was a vague tone, as if she was none too confident she'd be saying that for a whole lot longer. I did get a visit from a delegation of elders yesterday, complaining about something involving renegades in the deep woods and us helping them. Since I'd never heard that any Elwyn survived in the deep woods, that was kind of a surprise. Did I miss a report from one of your survey teams about them? Chris glanced at Amanda, who got a look on her pretty face like she'd been caught with her hand in the cookie jar 
and a nod that the claim might just be true. I think that's possible, Chris admitted. <laughs> Let me guess. Some more of your Marines? No, I can't complain about those Marines helping our fishermen land a lot more of their catch. Hopefully your people can pull off these large trucks to carry the catch and other junk inland. Though I don't know how he's going to get it powered. We don't have batteries that big, and I don't know when we'll get our new reactor online. They just started landing pieces of it late yesterday. Project manager won't give me any idea when he'll be done. Your reactor is in good shape, at least the first one. We'll have to cannibalize the fourth one to get all three of them working. So what I get is what I got, and this split 50-50 may not stay that way. Ada said with sour in her voice. Ada, there are a whole lot of unknowns in everything we're doing here. I've got a set of factories about to go operational on the moon in a few days. That may release more smart metal. I've got a chief designing a fishing boat that can go out and harpoon the eats everythings and other boats to trawl for fish. <laughs> Sounds like we're going to be eating a lot of fish. It's better than eating nothing, Chris said. Yes, it is. Fish offal also makes good fertilizer. You've said that you got the worst land on Alwa. Imagine what it will do if we add fertilizer from fish bones, guts, that kind of stuff. That report did make it to my desk, Ada said. Yes, it will help. But with next year's crop at the soonest... Any chance you might get a second crop in this year if you get plenty of fertilizer and water? Amanda asked. Where's the water coming from? We're working on that, Amanda said. Once we have power, we can pump water from the deep woods. There's lots of water there. Pipes? Steel from the moon, Chris said. You folks think big, don't you? I wasn't thinking small when I took out that enemy base ship, Chris said. Ada sighed. Yes, you have a point there, and it's not one you let me forget, is it? Do you want to? The jitney pulled into the round parking area in front of Government House. There are times I wish all this was just a dream, that I could wake up and everything would be the same as it was before Granny Rita answered your call and we found out the kind of mess we're in and never knew. You know what I mean? Do they still tell the story about the ostrich that kept its head in the sand? Chris asked. <laughs> yes, to every first grader. I know, I know. But all this change coming at me like a tidal wave. You have to let me stop once in a while and catch my breath. Ada, I hear where you're coming from, but... Please realize, I had no idea what I was getting into when I talked King Ray into letting me see what this great big galaxy held. It's been one continuous surprise after another for the rest of us, too. The woman sighed. Let's go inside. If you think I'm having it bad, wait until you hear from Kuno. He's your Ministry of Mining and Industry, right? Yep. And you'll never guess where they just discovered a whole mountain of copper. I've heard about the mountain. Nobody mentioned where. How about at the headwaters of our main watershed for our year-round drinking water? That would explain why no one wanted to tell me where it is, Chris said, glancing at Amanda and Penny. Both of them were making a point of not looking at Chris. Nellie? Why didn't you tell me? The information about the water source is not in my database, Chris. I didn't know the significance of the location. They had a long meeting after that, involving lots of people from the station by conference call. Yes, it was easier to dig a big hole in the ground and extract the ore, then run it through a smelter and truck the finished product to Haven. But in the end... The miners had to settle for using smart metal to make nanos do the extraction. It was slower, but a whole lot easier on the trees and its precious groundwater. 
As for moving the scientists down to Haven, Ada and several ministers, including education, got very excited. When the full number of boffins, some four fifty to five hundred, came up, there were a few gulps. But as Ada said, if they don't mind eating a lot of fish, food won't be a problem. Housing would be more difficult, but they'd manage. The lumber mill hadn't been working at full capacity, and if the deep woods truly were becoming safer, there should be plenty of timber. That would also give the Alwins more area to plant in their mixed crops way, assuming the elders didn't find a reason to object. The meeting went into lunch. Fish rolled in thin tortillas with something like lettuce were brought in. The meeting didn't end until well into the afternoon, leaving Chris just time enough to catch the last shuttle back, and meet with her industrial team. The factories on the Prosperity had finally been separated from what would become two frigates and a pair of mining ships. If there were no more surprises, they'd be landed tomorrow. Miners could also head out tomorrow to find the minerals needed to make batteries and other modern electronic gear, such as lasers. When Jack kissed Chris good night in her day quarters, at the door to her night quarters, per regulations, Chris could claim to have had a very nice day. Thirty-five. Frigate Squadron Four pulled away from the station right smartly next morning at o nine hundred sharp, but it wasn't just the officers and crews who had learned a thing or three; so had their commodore. Flag to squadron, set condition, Charlie. Chris ordered. Right, of course. Captain Katana was heard to mutter under her breath. Five minutes later, the squadron accelerated smartly to three G's and held that speed for most of the trip out to Alwa's closest gas giant. Along the way, an asteroid belt provided them with ample opportunity to practice their gunnery and reloading speed. Chris hated the long wait for the lasers to recharge. She felt naked, waiting fifteen seconds for the forward lasers to be ready again. Once, when the Princess Royal had targets both fore and aft, it took twenty seconds to get the lasers back online. Could we recharge three lasers forward and two aft in ten seconds, or fewer lasers in shorter time? She asked. Captain Katano shook her head. If we try to pour too much juice too quickly to one capacitor, we'll fry the power cables. Chris nodded. Nellie, see what you can find out about cooling the cables more. Chris, they're already superconductors. There's a limit. Then maybe we need to have more cables. I will research what can speed up reload times, Chris. When they made orbit around the gas giant, the real fun began. Each frigate spun off a pinnace powered by a single reactor, and stood by as the smaller ship went cloud dancing for reaction mass. Once, twice, then a third time, the pinnaces did their dance. Each time, bringing a supply of hydrogen, helium, and maybe other heavier slush back to its frigate. Chris could only smile as the pinnaces did easily what the old wasp had nearly wrecked herself doing. Here was another reason to love the new smart metal. The frigates began to look like they had broken out in hives as they converted their armor to more and more storage tanks for the reaction mass. When the pinnaces returned with their last load, they kind of hitched onto their ship, leaving the whole squadron with a lumpy, bumpy look all over, and a very pregnant bulge where the pinnace settled in. I hope we don't need to fight," Captain Katano said, but under her breath, Chris chose to hear the question. If we do have to fight, we'll vent most of this to space. If we don't, we get back to Canopus Station with needed reaction mass. So the private ships can fuel up, and the ships that we send out to plant buoys can depart with a full load. There should even be some to spare in case we do need to fight. So this was a training and logistics run, the captain observed. We have to kill three birds with each stone if we're going to survive out here. The trip home was slower, never more than one point five g's, but they still got in a good shoot as they passed the asteroids. Captain Drago was waiting on the pier as the Princess Royal pulled in.
He met Chris as she was just settling down to read more fun reports from Dirtside and the potential moon base. The wasp is out of the yard. Do you still want to chase after the hornet's ghost? Chris frowned. She wasn't sure whether it was the question or the reports. Or the fact she was starting to like reading reports. That would be a truly horrible fate. The hornet is not a ghost until we bury her, Chris said. We leave no one behind. I will not have a ship stumbling upon that wreck twenty years from now to find that they survived for one, two, three years, hoping for someone to come for them. Leave no one behind is a good motto, Captain Drago said. But you'll be leaving a lot behind you if you go. Can you afford the time to bury those who are most likely dead? We've already found the expanding gas clouds that were all that was left of the battleships. Chris eyed the contract captain. Why are you arguing with me? Captain Drago took a seat beside Chris's desk. Commodore, there are good reasons to go and good reasons to stay. I want to know if we're doing this for the right reason. If we're going just because you feel you have to, or maybe it's a long knife legend thing, I might have a problem. Since we're in private, I'm asking the question. Chris shoved away the report she'd been reading. Captain Drago had followed her to hell and gotten back only by the skin of his teeth. He'd earned the right to question her decision when all hell wasn't snapping at their heels. Captain, on the old wasp, how many times did we come within a few kilos of reaction mass from being stranded in space? More times than I care to be reminded, he agreed. I don't know what we'd have done if it had come to that. No one knew where we were. No one could have rescued us. Maybe I'm heading out on a wild goose chase, but I owe it to Phil Tausig and his crew to chase them down, to do everything I can to help them if they are in need. We went one way, they went the other, and led the bastards off our trail and after them. If that's not a good enough reason for you, Captain, I can't think of a better one. It's good enough for me, and I will be going. You want me to take another ship? No, Commodore. The wasp is at your disposal. We are resupplied and are taking on some of that fine reaction mass you just brought in. I plan to take aboard enough to make all the jumps we did and a couple extra for good hunting. Then return on one tank. It sounds like you plan a fast trip. Give me an hour or two to sort things out here and I'll be back aboard the wasp. Captain Drago rose and saluted. We await your pleasure, Your Highness. Chris called her next meeting. Captain Kitano had only to step inside Chris's day cabin. Granny Rita and Pipra attended by conference call. Chris quickly told them of her intentions to leave Alwa for a couple of weeks to discover the fate of the Hornet. Pipra began to object, but Granny Rita cut her off. A commander never leaves shipmates behind. I was wondering when you'd go after the Hornet as soon as I heard how you escaped. Captain Kitano just nodded, leaving Pippa to shake her head and mutter, Navy, in exasperation. My problem, Chris said, once that was settled, is that I'm wearing three hats at the moment, military commander, viceroy, and CEO of half our industrial wherewithal. And you called us three why? Granny asked with a sly smile. Captain Kitano, I want you to take over the defense mission. You will dispatch two ships to spread surveillance buoys at all jumps within six jumps of Alwa. That won't leave you a lot of ships here until the four new frigates complete their shakedown process, so concentrate on them. Do you have any questions? Captain Kitano seemed a bit stunned by the load that had just been dumped on her, but said nothing. Granny, can I trust you to function as Ray's royal viceroy for a month, without starting a war between me and Ada? Chris, my child, you wrong me greatly, Granny said through a grin. Yes, 
I've been following what you and Ada have been up to. I should be able to maintain your momentum. And if we have any problems, I'll call the captain here. Or Ms. Strongarm. You're dumping the industrial mess on me, Pippa said. She greeted Chris's nod with a serious scowl. I've hardly gotten used to having to juggle new enterprises and the other two companies that joined us, and now I have to handle the other three as well. Lead, Chris said. Not handle. If you run into trouble, call on Granny. Chris and Pippa both got a look at Granny's big grin. It had a lot of teeth showing. Or, on second thought, Chris added, you can threaten to bring Granny into it. Yes. That should work, Pippa finished almost under her breath. I am foully slandered, Granny said, grinning. Some of us have been dirt side long enough to pick up stories of the early days of your colony, Pippa said. Lies, all lies, Granny said, smiling as she lied through teeth. A reputation is a great thing, Chris said, herself grinning. Don't waste it. Put it to use. You can never tell when you'll need it to scare some kids into going to bed on time. I've had a few sailors bring me up to date on you, kid, Granny said. And doubtless they traded you some good sea stories. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transfer my flag back to the Wasp and see if I can talk my security chief into coming with me. That brought another round of canards which Chris strove not to participate in. While she was letting that wash over her, she had Nellie ask Penny if she'd like to be included in this trip. She did, and asked if she could bring along Masao. Chris agreed. An hour later, Abby had Chris packed, and a half-dozen sailors lugging several hand trucks full of gear from the Princess Royal to the Wasp. A corporal and two privates brought along all of Jack's gear. Next morning, they were away from the pier at 0730. 36. They had already left a buoy at the jump into the system where the battle took place. Now they headed for the desperate jump they'd taken out of the system. They passed close to the still tumbling wreck of the alien mothership. A thorough scan showed no new changes in the wreck. Maybe they'd scared the bastards off. Chris could only hope. They dropped a buoy on the other side of the jump. The vacuum there still glowed from the wreckage of so many alien ships and the little bit that was the fearless. They followed the same course and acceleration to the next jump. At this speed, they could not leave a buoy. It would have to be covered by another ship. They made the same long jump they had last time. This system had seen no fight, so they sped on, picking up speed but at a slower acceleration. The old wasp's engines had started to show wear from heavy use. The next jump brought them to the system where the limping Intrepid had fought its last fight, struggling to buy time for the wasp and hornet to make their escape. Once again, the scientific measurements showed a much more crowded and warmer vacuum. The Intrepid had died hard. This time, the new wasp headed for the closest conventional jump. The Hornet had taken that one, letting the old wasp slip away through the new fuzzy jump before the aliens had a chance to take notice. They had to guess a bit. The Hornet probably also had to slow down its acceleration. Still, they put on forty revolutions a minute and crossed their fingers. The jump took them close. Captain Drago's low whistle said, way too close, to a gas giant. There's a lot of vaporized ship out there, the sensor team reported. Can't tell how much at this point, but there was a fight here. Nellie, could Commander Tausig have done a loop around the gas giant and come back at the aliens following him? I'll have to back up the system a few months. It's impossible to say where this jump was then. They do wonder. However, it does look like he could have used several of the moons as well as the gas giant itself, to help him break. It might have added some fuel to his tanks as he did it. It would have been a lot harder on the Hornet than any of the cloud dancing we did. But his ship didn't have all the containers the old wasp had. 
Captain Drago pointed out. It would be easier for him than for us. Is there any ship in this system? Chris asked, Senior Chief Benny retired. I show no active reactors. No squawkers are talking to me. Chris let that walk around in her gut for a second. She didn't like it, but it might be what she would have to take home with her. Two of her corvettes had fought the aliens and both had died. If a fight had taken place here, the odds were that it had cost the Hornet's crew all they had. Jack maneuvered his egg over to hers once more at weapons on the Wasp and rested a supporting hand on her shoulder. She gave his hand a squeeze. If I were stuck out here in this corner of the universe, I'd choke my squawker, Jack said. Is there any way to interrogate a squawker that's been turned off? Our identification, friend or foe, has three levels, Captain Drago said. On, off, and passive. What were the codes we were using on the old wasp? Senior Chief Benny needed a moment for his computer to call up the old code and send it. The interrogatory went out at the speed of light as they broke it two Gs toward the gas giant. Minutes went by. Ten, twenty, thirty. Are there any planets in the Goldilocks zone? Chris asked, trying to fill time as the clock went longer and longer. There are three, the chief reported. One a bit close to the star. The other's a bit far out. There's one about in the middle, but it's on the other side of the sun at the moment. So it might need a long time to reply to our message, Jack said. Yes, the chief answered. Hours, a day. The time passed slowly as the wasp decelerated, aiming to graze past one moon, then another, as she swung around the gas giant. Time for a reply from the closer planets came and went. I've got something. The chief didn't quite shout, waking Chris as she dozed in her egg. What? Chris demanded. It sounds like the reply code, Chief Benny said. It's weak and a bit garbled, but it's got four of the right alphas and numbers. Captain Drago, will you please set a course for the other side of this sun? Happily, Your Highness, very happily. With a sigh of relief and hope, they set a long, slowing course for a responder that had hardly responded at all. 37. That's the Hornet, Captain Drago said as they closed on their target. What's left of her? Chris agreed. Half the engines were shot away. The hull had been holed clear through in three, maybe four places. The ship now tumbled in space, derelict. The docking bays were empty. The longboats were gone. It appears to have been evacuated, Chris said. Come, broadcast on the longboat frequencies that were here. That brought no reply. Ahead of them, the planet turned. They continued broadcasting as Captain Drago brought them into a parking orbit a hundred kilometers from the Hulk. The planet remained silent, refusing to give up its secret. Sensors, Chris ordered. Get with the boffins and map that planet. Somewhere down there are four longboats and a gig. They can't have disappeared. Find them. What they found was a planet that looked like a pit of hell. Or maybe what Earth itself looked like when giant dinosaurs roamed it. The huge land mass that rolled below them was covered with dark swamps and marshes. Huge creatures chased the smaller ones, and rarely did they evade becoming dinner. How could humans survive down there was a question Chris heard far too often as the mapping progressed. Even if the humans haven't, monsters don't eat longboats. Find me the boats, guys. Find me those longboats. The search continued. It was near the end of their sixth orbit, over nine hours after they began, that the morning beneath them coughed up an island. A volcanic central core rose almost to the clouds, surrounded by sandy beaches and reefs. There, drawn up on the water's edge of a lagoon protected by the reef, were the four missing longboats and a smaller gig. 
The longboats were as dead as beached whales, their antimatter pods exhausted. Unfortunately, a study of the island revealed it as dead as the boats. No smoke rose from the fires, no sign of human habitation showed on the optical scans. They couldn't have come this far, and... Chris ran out of words. Captain Drago turned to Jack. Colonel, prepare a marine landing party. You drop next orbit. I would recommend fully armored spacesuits. Yeah, Jack agreed. Don't drink the water and don't breathe the air. If that planet's a killer, we won't bring it back. An hour later, Chris gave Jack a kiss. Find them, if you can, she whispered. But don't you go dying on me. <laughs> Trust me, I'm good at not doing that. I've had a lot of practice around you. Chris would have slugged him, but he was in full armor, and even a squid has to learn sooner or later not to punch people with hides as tough as marines. And thank you for not coming, Jack whispered back. I'm learning to be a boring senior officer, Chris grumbled. <laughs> Don't get too senior, or I'll be telling you not to go fun places either. It would serve you right, you know. That got a chuckle out of Jack and Gunny at his elbow, even as the NCO tapped the watch at his wrist. Their time together was gone. Chris drifted back, and Jack shoved off for Longboat One. He didn't look back, and she didn't expect him to. Chris glided back to the bridge. All good stuff was going on elsewhere. Why wait for it to be processed and passed along to her station? There was a limit to how much she'd let herself be senior officered out of the fun. As she went, she couldn't help but think about her and Jack. She'd often wondered how a woman could kiss her man and wave him off to where he might die. Now she found the answer. She did it because she had to. Jack was Jack, and he had a job to do, and it was a job worth doing. Meanwhile, Chris was Chris, and she had a job to do as well. Nellie, get ready to spawn some nanos. That wreck ahead of us came with two good reactors and four 24-inch pulse lasers. It may be a hunk of junk, but it's my hunk of junk, and I will not ignore anything that might help me and mine stay alive. 38. Jack had often wondered how a man could kiss his wife goodbye and head off to where he might get his head blown off. Now he knew. You went because you had a job to do. A job that someone had to do. It didn't mean he loved Chris any less. In fact, he was kind of glad to go, knowing that she would be staying behind out of harm's way. There wasn't a lot of time for introspection. He did have a job to do. He had Sal project an overhead picture of his target. It showed a big, lush green island. At a glance, it could pass for a paradise. So, what was wrong with this picture? For one thing, there was no sign of humans. No huts, no smoke, no cleared area. The Hornet's crew had been here for four or five months. Why was there no human footprint? The good news was that the picture showed no evidence of the monsters they'd spotted on the mainland. There were a few instances of something large and nasty driving fish to jump out of the water, but those were all outside the reef. It looked like the reef was keeping the monsters at a distance. Jack wondered what the fishing was like. All the time they'd studied the island, no human had gone down to toss in a line. Jack did a quick check of his fire teams. Every other trigger puller had a grenade launcher attached to their M6. If there were monsters, they were ready. All of the four marine teams had a medic attached. There were extra medical supplies secured in the back of the shuttle. Every one of his ten fire teams was prepared to fight or save, very likely both at the same time. Longboat One made an easy landing in the lagoon, then motored slowly for the beaching area. Jack and Gunny studied the long, wide, sandy beach. The noise of their sonic boom should have brought sailors down to greet them. The beach showed something like a turtle, making its way back to the sea, but nothing human. 
This is past strange, Gunny muttered. Okay, Marines, Jack said, turning to his teams. There may be monsters, so be ready. But for God's sake, let's not be too itchy on the trigger finger. We don't want to kill any good guys. Hoorah, greeted his order. Don't beach the longboat, Jack ordered. If it gets nasty, I want you to be able to back out fast and get out of here, he told the bosuns flying the shuttle. Open the forward hatch when it shows a meter of water. The longboat was fifteen meters from the beach, rocking in gentle swells, when the pilot applied reverse thrusters to take way off the boat. Gunny popped the hatch and ordered the first fire team out. Was it a coincidence that they were some of the tallest Marines in the crew? They splashed out and quickly waded ashore, rifles ready. The turtle thing, fifty meters down the beach, ignored them and continued on its slow path to water. Gunny ordered out the second team, then the third. Jack went with the fourth. Ashore, his Marines formed a perimeter, guns aimed at the trees for the most part, though four were covering the lagoon behind them. In his helmet, Jack heard the lapping waves, the buzzing of small creatures, and an occasional grunt, snort, croak, or call. Animals, all. Nothing human in the mix. Sensors, talk to me. The tech sergeant carrying the sensor pods strode across the sand, but even in space armor, Jack could see him shaking his head. I've got biologicals all over the place, some whose heart function even matches some of our own critters. Of human cardiology, I got the marines here on the beach, but other than that, nothing. Well, keep an eye out and give a holler the first time you see something. I will, Skipper. But there's something in the soil or plants that's cutting my range down next to nothing. You'll likely see something before I get a heartbeat. Jack did not like it when his technology funked out, but with 43 Marines keeping careful watch, he could at least search with the Mark I eyeball. Jack ordered the last two of his ten fire teams to break out the medical supplies and food and form a chain to pass them to the beach. With that done, he waved the shuttle out to mid-lagoon. Jack checked out the beached shuttles with Gunny and five of the medics. They were stripped of anything that might help a struggling camp and now occupied by something like land crabs. I wonder if you can eat those things, Gunny muttered on net. I'll ask Phil Tausig when I see him, Jack said. The longboats revealed nothing more. No arrow pointing inland, no cryptic note. The longboats were just as silent as the island. There may be a trail over here, Sergeant Bruce announced on net. Show me, Jack said, heading for the sergeant. It's not much of a trail, Bruce added. I can't tell if there are footprints or just animal tracks. What Jack saw was just as ambiguous as reported. He studied the beach. A high tide or two had washed the sand clear of prints. The shuttles were tied to trees. A close look at their hulls showed where they'd been tossed around on the beach, scraped against the sand and knocked against trees. Clearly this planet had weather, and just as clearly that weather was doing its best to remove any marks men had made. Let's follow the trail. Gunny, you secure the beach with five fire teams. I'll move inland with the other five. Aye, aye, Skipper, was solidly neutral. If Gunny thought an officer ought to leave rooting around in the jungle to enlisted swine, he wasn't prepared to take a solid position. Jack reconsidered his order for a second. What lay ahead was way past unknown. Officers got the big bucks to lead into those dark places where monsters might lurk. He'd made the right call. Jack sent one fire team ahead of him, then followed with the other four behind him. The Marines, professionals that they were, spread out, letting five paces stretch out between them. Eyes and guns roamed the jungle ahead and above them. Alternate Marines concentrated to the right and left of the path. They moved through a jungle that quickly became deadly quiet. Snake! A Marine called on net, 
and the teams halted, taking a knee. Even through the faceplate, Jack could see the grin on a Marine's face as she held up a headless, long, round something. It tried to bite my boot. Hardly dented the shine, sir, she said. The bayonet on her rifle dripped green goo. The sand gave way to marshy ground. The heavy Marines sank ankle-deep into mud that slithered with things that made wakes in the water. A kind of sea grass waved in the wind around them waist-high. There were side tracks through the stuff, game trails that would let something with big teeth charge them without warning. Jack was taking a serious dislike to this place. I found something, the Point Marine called. He held up a tattered piece of cloth with foam still attached to it. It looks like part of a longboat seat, sir. Jack shook off his willies and said, Let's keep going. They came to a pond. Sergeant Bruce cut off a long, tough plant, the local equivalent of bamboo, and tossed it high. It came down and planted itself maybe a quarter of a meter deep in the lake. This could have been a nice meadow before the last storm, Bruce said. Jack ordered the Marines to slog through it. At least out here they had a better field of fire at anything trying to take a bite out of them. They shot two snakes that didn't get the word. Sonic boom! Rifle fire! Sergeant Bruce said to Jack on Nelly Net. But no reaction from the Hornets crew. This is either crazy or bad, Skipper. Jack said nothing. On the other side, the trail wound uphill into the volcanic heart of the island, and the jungle grew thicker. Jack was about to order his marines to hunt around for another trail leading off the pond when Sergeant Bruce pointed uphill. Isn't that a ration pack? I think you might be right, Jack said, and led the way up the trail to its first twist. There, held down by a rock, was the foil wrapper for an egg omelet that was uniformly detested by boony rats. Censors, talk to me. Nothing new to report, sir. I've got even worse reception around this rock pile. Well, stay close. Something human passed this way. Aye, aye, Skipper. They started up the trail. There were broken limbs and branches on the trees and bushes, but it was impossible to tell if it had been done by man, animal, or wind. They came to a fork in the trail. One path led farther up, the other down the slope. Jack pointed down. Again, the trail was full of switchbacks. Under the thick canopy, the ground was covered with a moss-like purple stuff that was slimy and slippery. Marines paired up to help each other over rocks and fallen tree trunks. Maybe we should head back, Sergeant Bruce suggested. Why would anyone lug their gear over this kind of ground? Jack might have agreed, but on net another Marine chimed in. My old man is a guide in the mountains of Arcana. He'll do a lot of stuff for good clean water. That stuff we walked through looked stagnant. It would make you sick. I suspect these rocks have a spring in them somewhere. Jack took the input under consideration and found it good. We'll keep following this trail. Jack saw him before censors reported a human outside the marine line of march. He was a naked scarecrow of a man, heavily bearded and making slow, stumbling progress with the help of a crooked pole. He was on the switchback below them. Corman, forward on the double! It still took Jack a long minute to cover the ground to the wreck of a human being. In that minute, the man gave up the effort and collapsed into the mud. Jack saw why when he arrived. Diarrhea. Fecal matter dripped down his leg into the mud. Medic! To me! We got a man down! Coming, sir. I knew you'd come. I kept telling the crew, Chris Longknife won't leave us out here. The living skeleton in Jack's arms didn't look anything like the ship Captain Jack had known, but the voice said this was Phil Tausick. What happened? Jack asked, as one corpsman arrived followed quickly by another. 
They had trouble finding a vein, but it didn't keep them from quickly getting a liter of water going into one arm and a liter of glucose into the other. This planet is killing us, Phil managed to get out. The stuff we were eating tore up our guts. You had to be horribly hungry to eat it. But when you're starved and there's nothing else, what can you do? We're here, and we've got meds and food at the beach. Where's the camp? Down the trail. At the pool. The only drinkable water we could find. Thank God for a young Marine's dad. It was another thirty minutes to the camp. If Phil was bad, others were worse. Chris had been right to come as soon as she could. In another few days, they would have started dying in droves. Three had died already. A call to the wasp brought more medics down on the next orbit. Most of the boffins who knew anything about planets were back on Alwa, but a pair of astrophysicists volunteered to do their best as analytical chemists. After they ran their first set of tests, they leaned back and shook their heads. Aluminum, that and arsenic and a couple of other heavy metals, every plant is poison. Slow poison, but poison nonetheless. Phil joked on his bitter laugh. <laughs> we knew we couldn't fight the big monsters on the mainland. We had to find some place they weren't. They weren't here. He cackled again. <laughs> Now I know why. You survived until we got here, Jack said. That's all that matters. You'd have never survived on the mainland, that's for sure. Maybe I should have tried the other planets, Phil said, his voice now reduced to a whisper. But the hornet was so beat up. We killed the last three of those bastards chasing us, but they hit us good right back. They're dead? You're alive. We'll have you back on your feet in no time. Jack promised, hoping the docks could come up with a magic potion to get all the heavy metals out of Phil's and his crew's system. All his calls back to the Wasp that day were directed at getting more Marines and medical personnel flowing to the planet below. He didn't ask for Chris, and she never came on the line. Jack wondered what she was doing with her day, but didn't bother her. He had his hands full. Still, he had to wonder what was so important to keep Chris from giving Phil an immediate call. He hoped she wasn't getting herself and them in trouble again. 39. Chris Longknife breathed a sigh when the word came back from Jack that he'd found Phil, but she kept her eyes on the reports flowing back from the wreck of the Hornet. Phil had fought her until she was fit for space no more. Chris thought the old wasp was a wreck when they got her back to human space, but the hornet was little more than a lump of metal with a bit of oxygen and pressure here and there. If the reports coming up from engineering were right, however, both of the hornet's reactors were in decent shape, not something you'd want to power up and ride home, but still worth saving. The same was true of the forward 24-inch pulse lasers— they hadn't been hit, although the power lines to two were shot away somewhere amidships. Still, with some refurbishment, they would shoot again. The computers had been destroyed with thermite charges. The problem was, of course, how to get what could be salvaged back to Elwa. Chris called Captain Drago in. He called in a half dozen of his ship maintainers. Together, under Chris's unbending pressure, they put their heads together and began to solve Chris's problem. You want us to swallow two huge chunks of that hulk? Then kind of trash compact the rest of the wreckage and swallow it into the wasp as well? This incredulous three-part harmony showed a certain lack of commitment to meeting Chris's objectives. However, being a long knife, Chris didn't allow that to slow her down. Patiently, she explained again that she needed all that wreckage back in orbit above Alwa, that was her first guess as to how to do it. Do you have a better idea? Yeah, forget the whole thing, the chief engineer grumbled. Now, Princess rarely does that, Drago said. Now, how do we move that wreck?
Later that day, the wasp pulled in closer to the hornet. Then she began to very carefully apply her new 20-inch lasers to slicing certain portions of the hulk off the rest. First, the engines were cut away. Then the reactors and the delicate instruments that made them work were sliced off. While the pinnace rounded up those stray parts before they wandered off, the wasp turned her attention to the bow and its pulse lasers. Once they were free of the rest, the wasp began dicing the hull into more digestible chunks. I don't mind having the pinnace kind of engulf the reactors and lasers, Captain Drago muttered to Chris. It's the idea of using part of my beautiful ship as a trash compactor to squish the rest of the hornet into a nice compact box that worries me. If the smart metal of the wasp protests too much, Chris said, trying to sound perfectly reasonable as she laid a charge on her flag captain that had never been ordered before. We'll call it quits. We can start with the rocket engines. They're big and hollow. They ought to collapse easily. The young lieutenant on defense looked pale as he programmed his hull material to spread out, then squeeze together, with huge rocket motors in between. The moaning of the motors, or the hull, or both, rang through the wasp. However, both reports from the ship's skin and eyeball assessments from sailors on the outside said that the process went surprisingly smooth. The pinnace, with the lasers and reactors kind of lashed to one side, used the other side to nudge wreckage toward the wasp. Together, they made it happen. When they were done and the wasp's pinnace was merging back in, there were a lot of bumps and bulges on the wasp, enough to move her captain almost to tears. Almost to tears doesn't count, Chris said, scolding him good-naturedly. But my beautiful ship will be beautiful once more, as soon as we get this junk back to Alwa. Captain Drago didn't look all that convinced. Longboats were coming back as Chris finished her housekeeping chores, so she drifted down to the docking bay. She thought by now that she'd seen it all. Still, the shock of the starved sailors had her kicking herself for not launching her search sooner. She thought of all the time she'd wasted while this poor crew was having their guts torn apart by poison and wished some people like Grandpa Ray and Admiral Crossenshield could see what she saw. Politicians who called the tunes should have to physically face the price good men and women paid for their shenanigans. Chris swore if she ever found herself in their place, a risk all long knives ran, that she'd remember these faces when she was calling the shots. Then Jack arrived, drifting along with a stretcher. He waved Chris toward him, and she shoved herself away from the bulkhead and floated in his direction. Chris, Jack said, Phil Tausig wants to thank you, personally. Chris looked down on a man whose face she couldn't recognize. It wasn't just the bush of hair and beard or the gaunt, sunken eyes. There was nothing here of the ready smile or the confident commander that she'd known. Chris wondered if that man could ever re-inhabit this broken body. Thank you, Chris. I knew you'd come for us. I knew you wouldn't desert us. Thank you, Phil gushed, with tears running down his face. The water and glucose bags above his head had three written on them in grease pencil. She suspected that the poor man could cry, only because they'd pumped six liters of liquid into him. I came as soon as I could, Chris told him, taking his hand. Now, you rest. We'll be heading back to Alwa as soon as we can. Alwa? Yes, the planet we saved. It also has a human colony on it that we didn't know about when we fought off the invaders. I found my great-grandma Rita Longknife. She'd explain the full family dysfunction later. We saved the planet. They didn't wipe it out. Now Phil really was crying, though these were tears of joy. Crew, Phil managed to raise his voice. We saved the planet. Around the landing bay, 
People strapped to stretchers muttered as much joy as their broken bodies could express. Then it was all worth it, Phil whispered as he sank into a stupor. How bad? Chris asked in a whisper to Jack. We won't know for a while. We think it's all heavy metal poisoning, but there may be other things as well. They're creating an isolation sick ward just off the landing bay. As soon as we get them all moved in, we'll douse down the bay in our suits to kill anything we can. You do realize you may be contaminated. Why didn't somebody hand me a moon suit? Chris wasn't the only person in the landing bay protected by nothing more than the cotton in their ship suit. I guess the message didn't get across. Sorry about that. So we set up quarantine for us, too, Chris grumbled. We'll see how long it takes, Jack said. Inside his faceplate, he didn't look any happier about having Chris on one side of quarantine and him on the other. Fortunately, the docks did blood cultures and took samples of the mud on the Marines' boots and found nothing that looked dangerous to humans. The heavy metal contamination seemed to be the only problem. Twelve hours later, Chris was out of quarantine, which was a good thing, since half an hour later, an alien ship jumped into the system. Forty. Chris and Jack had hardly had time to finish a quick shower when the klaxon went off. Battle stations, battle stations, all hands to battle stations. They hastily dressed. Abby must have taken up mind reading because a set of Jack's khakis was laid out beside Chris's blue ship suit. Done, they shot from Chris's day cabin onto the bridge. What's the situation? Chris asked in her Commodore voice. An alien ship just jumped in using a jump we haven't used, Captain Drago reported. It's about six hours out, assuming it holds to their usual two Gs and flips at midpoint. Have they spotted us? We are not squawking, but our reactors are online and our lasers are charged. Then we can assume they know we're here and will be coming to visit, Chris concluded. We could try to run for the other jump, the captain offered. Has the navigator plotted a course? One showed up on the main screen. If they hold to their usual 2.5G acceleration and we go at 35 we should just make it to the jump before they get in range, the navigator reported. Can we make 3.5 Gs in our present condition, Chris said. Condition, Jack echoed. The wasp is pregnant with the hornet, Chris said. I was wondering where the hornet went and why the wasp has all these bumps and lumps, Jack said. You didn't think I'd abandon two perfectly good reactors, did you? Captain Drago cleared his throat. We can't make over 2.5 Gs in our present state. We'll need to drop our load to show them our heels in a run. Chris mulled that. Has any other ship jumped in? None so far, but remember, we're only getting our information from that jump point at the speed of light, so it's been a while. Captain Drago, will you please join me in my quarters? Chris said and wheeled herself in microgravity, pushed off the closest station, and launched herself for the door to her day quarters. Captain Drago did not look happy, but he followed her, Jack right behind him. "'You don't intend to fight, do you?' the captain demanded as soon as Jack closed the door behind them. "'There is only one ship. Maybe that could change any second. "'We have the twenty-inch lasers,' We should outrange them. We suspect that. We don't know for sure, Captain Drago shot back. We'll need to find out the answer to that sooner or later. Why not now? My ship is loaded down with a wreck and my sick bay full of barely alive survivors. Do you really want to fight just now? We've never had a one-on-one -on -one fight with one, not since the first fight. Admittedly, this is probably one of those four or five hundred thousand tonners the aliens are so fond of. Still, it's even odds. I'd like to take this one alive, or at least separate it from its reactors enough that it isn't blown to gas. 
Captain Drago didn't fire back a response to that, but settled down at Chris's staff table. Know your enemy, huh? Chris nodded. Have we had a better chance? They think they're coming in on a badly damaged hulk. Likely, they'll intend to board it for intelligence. Maybe they even think they can capture the crew. They're looking for one ship, Jack said, settling into the chair across from the captain. They only found one. Yes, but we've got our lasers charged and our reactors online, the captain pointed out. So, maybe they won't be all surprised, Chris agreed. But if our 20-inch lasers can outrange them, we could do damage to their lasers while we run away and keep the range where we want it. Assuming they can't do more than two Gs, Drago said. Remember, the 20 inches are our surprise. What kind of surprise do they have up their sleeves? We can always dump the Hornet and run faster, Chris said. She'd hate to do that. But if needs must, she would. I'm disliking this idea of yours, your highness. A bit less than most, Captain Drago said slowly. But I have a few sneaky tricks we can add to your pot. For the next half hour, they laid their plans. For the next half hour, no reports came into Chris's quarters of a second ship. As it began to look like they might indeed have their first ever even fight, a grin slowly spread on the captain's face. Yes, we might just have the souvenir Professor Lebeo would just love to field strip. Your Highness, would you care to take weapons again? Just for old time's sake. Why, I don't mind if I do, Chris said, sounding less like her Commodore self and more like her old self. Together, they headed back to the bridge. 41. The alien did have a few new tricks up its sleeve. A bit before the halfway point, it flipped ship and began to decelerate. The navigator plotted the course. It showed the alien warship coming to a dead stop in space a good 500,000 kilometers short of orbiting the planet. You can't park a ship there, Jack observed. I doubt they intend to, Captain Drago said, rubbing his chin. However, with less energy on their ship, they can choose how they'll close with us. I doubt they intend to give us a shot at their vulnerable stern. Yes, Chris said. They'll come at us head first, with lasers blasting. Does this change anything for you, Captain? Not at all. I don't think our plan requires them to be as dumb as usual. The Wasp continued its predictable path in orbit. They did drop off probes to keep an eye on the alien when they were on the other side of the planet and relays to keep them in the loop. At a million clicks out, the alien began to adjust its deceleration. She's aiming to arrive just as we're coming around the planet, Captain Drago reported. That will cause a problem. No way do I want to let them have a whole half orbit to shoot at us. The plan Chris and the captain had hatched depended on their ducking behind the planet right after they got their first shots off. Being stuck in an orbit that kept them in the alien's crosshairs for an hour was not healthy for them. As they vanished behind the planet for the second-to-last orbit before the battle started, the wasp flipped, applied a retro burn, and dove toward the planet. As they did, they went to a modified Condition Z, collapsing all the space not needed for battle and sending the smart metal off to the ship's sides, to be honeycombed with near-frozen reaction mass. The Wasp was going to war. Now, we'll see how he likes that surprise, Captain Drago said, a tight grin on his lips. Forty minutes later, they were looping out toward the alien ship. It was still breaking. Suddenly, it went to a full 2.5 G's deceleration that appreciably slowed its approach. You don't like that, do you, fellow? Chris said. 
as she used optics to range the alien. You thought all the moves were yours. Didn't expect us to make one, did you? A plot on the main screen showed their orbit beginning to fall back some 200,000 miles short of the present predicted point of meeting the alien. Now, Captain Drago muttered, leaning forward in his command chair. How will you take to us eliminating our final orbit? Will you charge us or choose to trail us? Your move, bastard. The alien began to cut back on his deceleration, gradually dropping from 2.5 Gs down to 1.5. He's going to come up on our rear, Chris said. Normally, that would be a smart fighting move. They'd have first shot at the Wasp's vulnerable jets and reactors, assuming the Wasp kept her rear pointed that way. The Wasp reached the apogee of its orbit and began to fall back toward the planet, picking up speed as she went. The alien was still decelerating, but closing the distance on the Wasp that, having once applied thrust, seemed just as dead in space as it had before. Of course, the alien's sensors must have told him the Wasp's lasers were charged and ready, but with the Wasp's reactors at minimum power, the alien might assume their intended victim had one shot left and could not reload. What were they guessing? Were they guessing any better than Chris? In a few more minutes, whoever survived the coming battle would know who had guessed right. Whoever guessed wrong would be dead. The alien was coming up on 150,000 clicks and closing. The wasp was falling back faster and faster toward the planet. If no power was applied, she'd graze the atmosphere of the planet 150 clicks up. Would the aliens follow them or go higher, cutting down on the time they could keep the wasp in their sights? Then suddenly, the alien flipped ship and presented its bow bristling with lasers. Surprise, surprise. Well, Chris had her own surprise ready. Flip ship, Chris ordered, as the alien crossed to within 120,000 clicks. Theory said the 20-inch lasers could do damage at that range, and the alien lasers would still be out of range of the wasp. Chris fired laser one. It reached out, hit, and the alien ship became a blur. What the heck? Captain Drago growled. Rock, sir, Senior Chief Benny retired, reported from sensors. Our lasers are hitting pumice, volcanic rock. They've coated their bow with blocks of rock, sir, for armor. Sneaky little bastards learned a lesson, Chris said, as she fired lasers two and three while beginning to recharge one. The target shed more dust, but seemed otherwise unaffected by the hits. Chris switched to lasers four and five and added the other two empty lasers to her recharge list. More dust. Laser six stirred more dust. Then suddenly there was a flare and something blew up. Maybe they needed more armor than they put on, Chris said. Flip ship again. The wasp turned its vulnerable stern to the alien but the wasp's stern had four stingers. Now, Chris fired all four of them at once, carefully aiming them for different sections of the bulbous alien bow filling her sights. These sparked explosions as alien lasers and rockets blew up. As soon as the lasers were exhausted, Chris put them in line to recharge. Flip ship, begin retrofire on my mark, Captain Drago ordered. The burn would be short and carefully calculated. Instead of blazing past the planet below, the wasp would risk the heat of the upper atmosphere, shooting through it at 110 clicks altitude. It was going to get hot. Behind them, the alien had again flipped ship and slammed on 2.5 G's deceleration, aiming to make orbit right behind the wasp, where her lasers could overwhelm and destroy the human ship. But the huge alien ship dared not follow the wasp, now tiny and tight, 
its outer hull cooled by its own reaction mass. The alien reduced its deceleration and fell behind, disappearing below the horizon. Chris watched as the laser slowly reloaded. Second after slow second ticked by. Laser one showed fully charged after 13 seconds. The other forward lasers took a full 15. This was the price of putting six 20-inch lasers on the bow of a ship whose power plant was designed for four 18-inchers. As the forward battery finished charging, the aft battery began to suck up the electricity. It was 22 seconds before all ten of the WASP's lasers showed red again. For the moment, it didn't matter. The wasp was diving down, hastened by gravity, slowed by friction. Exactly what its speed would be coming out of this orbit change was anybody's guess. Where the alien would be was also a guess. How close would it follow? If it risked following them too close, what would the atmosphere do to his damaged bow? Questions piled up, but with the ionized atmosphere blanketing the few sensors that the wasp risked using, there were no answers in sight. They blazed their way across the night of the planet below. Did the monsters look up and wonder at what the strange lights were in the sky? Would they care? The outer hull of the wasp heated up. Defense thickened the bow, changing the depth of the honeycombed armor from one to two, then three meters. The firing ports of the lasers were covered over. Isn't this new and fancy or smart metal fantastic? They vented cool reaction mass from the bow. It boiled away but protected the surface beneath. The wasp shut out into deeper space, and the hull began to cool. Quickly, they deployed their sensors, visuals, radar, and lasers. There was the alien right behind them. Its bow glowed red. Flaming chunks of it fell away. The alien captain had risked the low pass. Chris could only wonder what price his crew paid for his desperate effort, but it was paying off for her. The alien was closing fast on a hundred thousand clicks. Prepare to flip ship, Captain Drago ordered, ready for the wasp to charge the alien. But Chris was busy using the four aft lasers while she still had them aimed at the target. Short, split-second bursts speared at the already flaming ship, first here, then there. Explosion followed on explosion. Nelly, analyze the enemy bow. Is there any place not burning? Any laser pod not hit? Nelly took the controls and implied the last two short bursts from each laser. Then she got out an even shorter burst. The reactors had already started to recharge them, and Nelly got every little bit available. If there's anything alive and shooting in that hell, I can't make it out, Chris's computer reported, as the lasers went silent and the reloading began. The alien was staggered by the hits. Its acceleration out from the low pass faltered, coming not in a steady curve, but with stutters and spurts. It was hurt. Flip ship, Captain Drago ordered. Still at 3.5 G's acceleration, the wasp turned to charge the alien. With any luck, it was blind. Its sensors burned out. Not quite, nor was the damage as complete as Chris had wished. First one, then several lasers reached out from the ruined bow to try to catch the wasp. Most failed, their fire control unable to track the charging human ship, which now went into one of Nellie's jinking patterns. There were still enough lasers left in the mangled bow to crisscross the space the wasp must pass through. Two connected. The wasp rang with hits. But the wasp was committed to a course that crossed above the alien, pinning it between the planet below and the wasp's forward batteries. As they flashed by, Chris swung the bow of the wasp to bear. Four lasers reached out to slice through the stern of the alien, separating its rockets obliquely from the ship it had powered. The engineering spaces with the reactor slid off, diving planetward, while they drove the rest of the alien ship into a spin as they left. 
Chris had other targets to roast and took them under fire with the last two forward lasers. Two reactors showed along the central core of the ship. Those powered the forward batteries of lasers. If allowed to go critical, they'd blow the forward section to atoms. Nellie had gotten the locations of these two reactors from Senior Chief Benny's sensors. Now, as Chris sliced the aft reactors off, Nellie took a stab at disabling the amidships reactors. It might work. It might not. Chris had explained to her computer beforehand that no one had ever succeeded in disabling a reactor. They had no idea where the controls were or what would vent the plasma directly to space without taking the rest of the ship with it. Nellie had seemed to understand that this was not something she could approach with any hope of precision. Still, the computer had accepted the assignment. Now playing staccato notes on the two last lasers like musical instruments, she poked blasts of coherent light at the area around the reactors for fractions of a second. First, she jabbed at where the forward reactor's controls might be. Next, she slid her stabs aft, sending a few through the heart of the plasma. That might open up vents to either side for the super-hot demons to flee through. Nellie aimed her final thrusts at the possible control spaces aft of the reactor. Flaming plasma spewed from the sides of the alien ship, sending it spinning. Even in their death throes, amidship lasers tried to light up the wasp. The wild gyrations of their ship made it impossible to aim, however, and their power quickly bled away. The alien ship corkscrewed away from the planet, leaving Chris to breathe a sigh of relief. It was headed for a high apogee. They'd have time to correct its wild flight before it went crashing into the planet below. The stern with the four reactors, however, did dive into the atmosphere, glowing hot with entry burns before burying itself in a muddy plain and turning it into a blistering inferno. Maybe the monsters below should have kept a better eye on the monsters above. Flipping ship, Captain Drago ordered, then applied deceleration to cancel out their own dive into heated death. Your Highness, I hope you're happy, Captain Drago muttered, because I sincerely never want to do that again. Now that we've caught it, Jack said from his high G station beside Chris, what do we do with it? Didn't you ever have a puppy follow you home, Jack? Now we entice it to follow us. Remind me to quit asking dumb questions around you. I don't think that's my duty, as either your commodore or your wife. I'll have my computer remind me instead, Jack said, with a good Irish sigh. 42. Fighting the alien ship was one thing, Salvaging it for study was another thing entirely. As the wasp closed on it, Chris saw a wildly spinning and twisting wreck. No human could survive in that, Nellie judged, and Captain Drago was willing to accept that judgment even before their visuals showed every hatch open to space. Do you think there are any survivors in airtight compartments? Jack asked, clearly getting ready to lead a boarding party. I doubt it, Chris said. There weren't many airtight bulkheads on the mothership we examined. So it's not just victory or death, Captain Drago said. But everything goes fine, or death. I know you want to take that thing home to Granny and the good professor, but I'm not taking this ship within fifty clicks of that out-of-control hulk. Nellie, we need to stabilize that mess, Chris said then glanced at the course that appeared on the main screen. The hulk was in a wildly elliptical orbit with a high apogee, but its plunge back to the planet would be a close graze on the first orbit, followed by a spectacular crash the second. And we need to do it fast. Like in this orbit, the captain muttered. I've had my ship's feathers singed once today. I will not risk it again. Nellie noted the possessiveness Captain Drago was showing toward the wasp, 
There would be no more pushing him where his ship was concerned. I'll need all the longboats, Nellie said. No crew. We'll control them from here. Fast as only a computer can do, Nellie and her brood had the launches away and reconfiguring in flight. All eight of the WASP's auxiliary antimatter power plants were also drafted into the mission, re-rigged to power reaction motors and sent on their way. Chris, I really love this new smart metal. It's like magic. We all do, Nellie. All this time, they had been doing their best to map the spinning, tumbling wreck. The damage control teams on the WASP helped Nellie spot the alien ship's primary hull strength members, where they'd been revealed by Chris's laser slices. Nellie and family plotted courses for the auxiliary rocket motors and had them dart in as their targets spun into view. Only one motor missed and got batted out fast, narrowly missing the wasp and just barely avoiding a dive into the planet. Damn, Nellie said. Doing it right eleven out of twelve times at bat would put you in the record books for baseball, Jack pointed out. Yes, for a human, Nellie agreed. Chris and Jack just shook their heads. They were approaching Apogee when the eleven rocket motors fired. First they took the spin off, then, with a problem more manageable, they adjusted the rockets to suppress the tumbling. Faster than Chris would have expected, Nellie had the alien wreck lying docile in space, and beginning its dive back to the planet's flaming embrace. There are twelve main hull longitudinal strength members poking out the aft end, Nellie reported. Chris cut them off a bit ragged, but that may help us make a solid connection. Chris was glad her computer found her work acceptable. Jack just grinned. As the wasp extended twelve girders of smart metal out to connect with the target, Captain Drago brought the wasp close alongside the battered stern of the alien. Soon it loomed over them. He halted his approach five clicks out. I'm not going any closer until someone assures me that Hulk is dead and no one has hung around to blow me up. There's not enough time for my Marines to get over there if you also want to get this mess nudged into a high orbit. Then have your marvelous Nelly send her minions over there for a quick look-see. Nano's on their way, Nelly replied, as a swarm of them departed from the tips of the docking girders. I'll replace them before you need to dock, she assured the humans. For a long fifteen minutes, the nanos scoured the aftmost compartments of the hulk. All showed signs of explosive decompression as the departure of the engineering section opened the stern to space. There was no evidence of explosives or booby traps left behind. There were lots of bodies, a horrible lot of them. Even Jack gulped as the picture became clear. I think we'll leave the examination of the Hulk to Nanos. I'm not sure I could get my Marines through that, Chris agreed. Captain Drago brought his wasp in to mate with the alien wreck a good half hour before they were due to graze the atmosphere. By applying power in a slow, gently rising fashion, they secured the mating and got themselves edged into an orbit that never came closer than 150 clicks to the grasping planet below. That is one huge hood ornament, Captain Drago said finally with a major sigh. I hope your highness wasn't expecting us to make more than 1G on our way back to Alwa. 1G was more than I dared hope for, Chris admitted. They strengthened the docking with the Hulk as they swung around the planet and headed back out to a second apogee. The Wasp began applying power to the jury-rigged docking collar as they approached their highest point and had them drawing free of the distant planet before they began another dive. Around them, the hull of the Wasp groaned and moaned, but nothing broke loose. Quarters are going to be a bit tight. I'm going to keep the Wasp at something between Condition Baker and Charlie, Captain Drago announced to all hands. But we're headed home. In the privacy of her day quarters, 
Chris wondered aloud to Jack. You think Captain Drago would appreciate it if you moved in with me? <laughs> think of the space we'd save. Jack gave her a good night kiss and sent her on her way to her lonely night cabin. But the question would soon come up again. 43. Two days later, they were accelerating at 1G on approach to their jump out. There was no question of hitting it with the speed they'd come in with, nor was anyone willing to put 20 revolutions per minute on the jury-rigged wreck hanging on the wasp's nose. The way home would be a different set of jumps from the way here. Chris wasn't expecting Captain Drago when he came in and plopped down on her couch. Something on your mind? Chris asked. Jack's been spending a lot of time here. Yes, Chris was quick to point out. In my day quarters. He has his own night cabin a deck down and halfway around the ship. Yes, I know. You two have been scrupulous to give the ship's company a good example. The conversation hung there for a long time. Chris joined the captain, taking an overstuffed chair beside his couch. Jack took the chair opposite her. "'What's on your mind, Captain?' Chris finally said. She knew how to wait out a reluctant petitioner, but being Commodore was teaching her the bad habit of not wasting time. "'Cookies moved in with Mother McCready,' Captain Drago finally spat out. "'Those two must be approaching eighty, Chris said. The captain scowled. Trust me, young lady, when you are old and grey, you will find the comfort of human companionship no less desirable. That wasn't what I meant, Chris said, then realized it was what she meant. Well, they're both contractors, consenting adults and old enough to know better. I don't see how it's a Navy problem. So the captain told her. In the last two days, with quarters shrunk, a lot of folks have chosen to merge their living space, and no doubt other things as well. I suspect the vast majority of my contractors and your boffins have set up abbreviated housekeeping. Still not my problem, Chris pointed out. You know that cute astrophysicist that made the diagnosis of heavy metal poisoning? Well, at breakfast, she suggested to the skipper of the Musashi Marine Detachment that he move in with her. No, that's my problem, Jack said. It's not your only one, the captain said. Abby and Sergeant Bruce are a couple. What about Kara? Chris asked. She would have considered a teenager as good a chaperone as any 70-year-old. Kara is spending most of her time with your younger women, Marines, Captain Drago said. They've even fitted her for a uniform of sorts and have found her a battle station with their central aid station. She's almost 14 and getting quite handy. And leaving my maid free time on her hands to get in trouble. I think we can count on Abby to take care of herself, Jack put in. How far has this, uh, adjustment of quarters gone? Chris asked. I really don't know, the captain said, raising his eyes to the overhead, which meant he had a pretty good idea, but officially was working hard not to notice. Ah, Nellie said. I can get you an answer. Ah, uh, if you want it. Nellie, you're getting quite tactful, Chris said. Captain, do we want it? Before we decide that, Jack said. Can we first examine the situation we're in? Such as, Chris said. We've come close to being killed twice in the last month. Only one fight was at close to even odds. We're all the way across the galaxy for most of our next of kin, or any kin, at all. I'd also like to point out we don't have any sure establishment to speak of, 
It's not like we can reassign one half of a couple, wed or otherwise dirt side. And if we start shuffling crews because folks are seeking creature comforts, we'll be breaking up train teams on the eve of battle. And we are always on the eve of some battle. Chris, Captain, this is one major problem, and it's not going to fit into any of the usual answers. And we do know that the other ships of the squadron were having issues with people using that app to open doors between quarters, Chris said. And we chose to look the other way. I wonder what we'll be going back to, the captain said, with a frown that had way too much grin in it. So what I'm hearing is that we need a solution for the moment, here on the Wasp. But we better be ready to apply it throughout the squadron when we get back. And we hope, Jack pointed out, that the squadron will be reinforced. Jack, I love you, but I'm hating you at the moment, Chris replied. You're the Commodore, Viceroy, and CEO, dearest love. Chris would have stuck her tongue out at Jack, but they weren't alone. She chose to let him have the last word and turned to Captain Drago. So you brought this monkey in. Are you just dumping it on my back, or do you have some idea for getting it off all of our backs? I have discussed it with the Wasp senior chiefs, but I didn't want you hearing it the first time when you go to dinner. Thank you for caring about my digestion, Chris said dryly. I intend to let my division heads and leading chiefs know that I'm willing to loosen the rules on Navy personnel since it's already come loose for all the contractors. We couldn't limit the forward lounge to just civilians, could we? Good analogy, Jack said. I'll tell them this is just a wasp practice, and we'll see how things go when we get back to the squadron. Where this will land in my lap, Chris said. <laughs> yep. Tell me, Captain, is there a girl you have your eye on? Chris asked. No, Captain Drago shot back bluntly. I don't think there's anyone willing or able to break the splendid solitude of my command, he paused. Though I might have trouble saying no to a few of the more mature women aboard, let us pray that I am not led into temptation. One question, Chris said, as the captain stood to go. I'm assuming that your female contractor personnel have been issued the same birth control implants that are required by the Navy for all females signing up. Chris had been issued her first set right after she was sworn in. Three years in, she'd been issued a second set. What with Jack around... She'd better make sure she got her new implants in a couple of months when she passed her sixth year in the Navy. You don't think Admiral Crossenshield would forget a thing like that, do you? Strange, if I do say so, after some thirty years of service, how we insist that our men and women not use certain gear God issued them, but we make real sure that nothing can come of it if they do. <laughs> the right way, the wrong way, and the Navy way. Chris said for the millionth or more time since she'd raised her right hand and been sworn in. With that, the captain left, leaving Chris and Jack alone. You know, this is going to cause trouble, Chris said. Men and women being men and women have caused trouble since time began, Jack pointed out. We'll have spats and breakups and love triangles, Chris said. Just like they do in the civilian world. Ever watched the movies? I found those topics deadly dull. Somehow, I don't think there will be any dull in our future. Still, if things get too messed up for anyone, we can ship them off to another frigate. And we do have the station to keep staffed. The worst offenders can find themselves protecting the fisher folk, Chris muttered. <laughs> That's my girl. Solving every problem before we come to it which left Chris staring at Jack as he stared at her. The question hung in the air between them, thick enough to stab with a knife. At the same moment, both shook their head, 
Maybe Nellie could have spotted who started shaking first, but Chris really didn't want to know who first came to the obvious conclusion and who took a split second longer. I'll keep my separate quarters, Jack said, and I will sleep there. I think that's a good idea. At least until and if this question is dumped in my lap for the whole squadron. For a moment longer they stared at each other, tasting their decision and finding it good. Then Chris let herself slip on an impish grin. But we can save water if we shower together. That sounds like a great idea, Jack said. And I could use a shower about now. As soon as he had shucked his uniform, it was clear he needed a shower. A cold one. Chris was only too happy to provide an alternate solution to his problem. 44. The trip back held few other surprises. The wasp and the wreck held together. Nellie found a route that almost landed them in Elwa. They dropped into a system with a working jump buoy, just as Captain Drago called time to refuel. While they used the jump buoy to message Alwa that they would be home in just a few days, they settled into orbit around a gas giant, and the wasp's pinnace did two refueling runs. That made it possible for Captain Drago to accelerate at 1G until halfway to the jumps, then decelerate the rest of the way. They went through dead slow and on an even keel. Three days later... They nudged their way into Alwa's system to find the Princess Royal and the Constellation waiting for them. "'Good Lord, Wasp!' Captain Catano said on screen. "'What happened to you?' <laughs> "'Look what followed me home,' Chris said proudly. "'More like what you pushed home,' Catano replied. "'It does kind of look that way. Nellie, send to the Professor. "'Have I got an alien artifact for you to study?' It doesn't look in very good shape, Kitano said. Again, no survivors, but this time I sliced the reactors off so they couldn't blow themselves to dust. No one has been aboard the wreck, but our nanos report it's crammed with bodies. They popped the hatches at the last second and spaced themselves. Kitano just shook her head. Then she seemed to change her thoughts. Commodore, I hate to say it, but I'm very glad to see you back. Is it safe for me to come aboard the Wasp, or would you prefer to come to the P Royal? The Wasp is quite safe. We've proved it through more jumps than I care to count. Come aboard, Captain. I would like a full report on what's happened. Oh, by the way, we saved the Hornet's crew, all but three. We arrived in the nick of time. I'm glad to hear that, ma'am. I'll be with you in fifteen minutes. I'll have Captain Drago delay starting our acceleration until you're here. Ten minutes later, as the Princess Royal's gig docked solidly with the Wasp, Captain Drago put on one G of acceleration, and the deck was once again down. A few minutes later, Captain Catano joined Chris in her day quarters. Jack and Captain Drago came in a second later. "'What's our situation?' Chris asked, as the four of them settled onto the couch and stuffed chairs. "'We deployed the buoys, as you no doubt noticed.' We've lost one, six jumps out from the one the aliens would have used if they made it past your fleet, Commodore. So they're out there and nibbling, but they're keeping their distance. It seems that way. And our defensive efforts? We've dug bases a thousand meters down on all three moons. One is mainly ice, but we found something solid. We've got two launch tunnels dug on all three and are working on a third one for each, the Hellburners have gone live on all those satellites. The crews are mainly the ostriches, with a few roosters, colonial and navy, thrown in. The second division of the squadron is online and has shaken down very well. Well done, Chris said. I'll leave the situation dirt side to Granny Rita and the industrial situation to Pipra, but I think you'll find them all satisfactory or better. It's my handling of the navy personnel that may be a problem, ma'am. That app that opens doors between quarters, Chris said, to save the young woman from beating around the bush. Yes, ma'am. 
I thought that when we offloaded most of the boffins, our problem would go with them. <laughs> But no. Many that went dirt side to work on the food supply came back with attachments. Some local, but lots of navy. Once some officers relaxed discipline, others followed. I tried jacking up the security on the smart metal and having only the chiefs be able to move metal. But we want people to do damage control, and the chiefs don't want to be answering calls for every little thing. Katano shrugged. Besides, some smart sailor cracked the new code. If I keep increasing it, ma'am, I run the risk of getting close to the hull algorithm, and I don't want that. I've got morale problems with the sailors, chiefs, and officers. We're trying to follow the regs, ma'am, but it's not working. Now, I don't know what to do. It's not like I can order half the couples ashore permanently. I'd be grounding twenty, thirty percent of our crews. They sent us the younger officers and enlisted personnel. The ones with no attachments, Chris supplied. And now they're forming attachments under the threat that any day could well be their last. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from my division heads and chiefs, ma'am. Has it caused trouble? Damaged unit cohesion? Jack asked. That's what has surprised me, Captain Kitano said. There have been a few blow-ups, but not all that many. Where things went sour, I usually get a request from one or the other for a reassignment. So far, they've been few enough for us to handle, and they've had no impact on our battle efficiency. I don't know how the folks back home would take to this, but here, just letting sailors be boys and girls works best. We are here. And we do have an alien something nibbling at our perimeter, and everyone knows that any day they could be fighting for their lives. Chris concluded. Am I missing something, or are all hands handling themselves to meet their needs and the needs of the mission? I wouldn't want to tell the king that, but yes, ma'am, it does look that way. Let me handle my grandpa, Chris said. You don't seem very surprised. Captain Catano said, "The Wasp has had the same pressures on its crew, and they've been in two fights to boot. Captain Drago here issued his own order violating Navy policy before we started home. I would have been surprised if you hadn't dropped this in my lap." "What do you plan to do, Commodore?" Captain Catano asked. "When we dock, I'll call the captains and key staff together and hash it out. If we can come to a unanimous consensus." I'll go that way. I don't think you'll have too much of a problem," Kitano said. "Chris," Nelly said, "there's a message coming in from the jump buoy at Jump Point Beta. Ships from the U.S. have jumped into a system three jumps out." "Hmm," Chris said. "Do we get our own consensus or wait for the new kids to arrive?" "I'm glad I don't have your job," three voices said in harmony. Half an hour later. Chris transferred her flag from the Wasp to the Princess Royal and headed for Alwa at 2.5 G's. That gave her time to get a report from her vice viceroy. Alwa was producing a lot more food. If you liked fish, the Alwins were bringing a lot of forest edibles to market and did like the electronic goods the Moon Base was starting to turn out. Also, that copper mountain was slowly dripping copper into the non-polluting catch basins. There was grumbling from some of the old elders, but not from the new, not quite so elders stepping forward. They were more in step with the average Alwyn on the path, and only too aware the new humans were the only thing standing between them and the biggest eats everything they had ever dreamed of. Pepper reported to Chris in her day quarters on the Princess Royal as soon as she docked. Chris invited her to take a comfortable chair away from the table. The fabricators are starting to produce parts for weapon-caliber lasers. The miners aren't interested in being in unarmed ships when the aliens show up. The asteroid mining was going as well as could be expected. I could use more ships to bring rare earths and other metals down system. Pippa was sure her techs would be excited to get their hands on the Hornet's reactors. So, you found what you were looking for. Pippa seemed quite surprised. 
They were on an island and near death. We got there just in time. Now, how are we coming on making our own reactors and smart metal? We're getting there. We've started a prototype reactor on the moon. Not much output yet, but it's not breaking down either. We've put out some smart metal. They're using it for trucks, dirt side, freeing up your metal to go back to the frigates. We're having much better luck with aluminum and steel. We're replacing the fishing fleet with them. Our main problem is getting enough rare earths to power things. We've got a solar cell plant up, but without batteries, you can't keep the ship out after dark. Same for trucks. Keep on it then. How are your personnel holding up to being on the front line of humanity's next fight with the alien bastards? I figured that would come next, Pepra said, leaning back in her chair. The three managers who tried to drink Canopus Station dry were cut off at the bar and sent dirt side. Two are working as farm hands. One disappeared into the forest. We've had a few suicides. Nothing above the average for folks in high stress jobs. Since we started closing up the bars early, folks have been going home and finding their own comfort. Lots of marriages, hand fastings, and civil unions for folks who don't want a preacher involved. Not a few of our folks are betting down with your sailors, ma'am. I hope that isn't a problem. Your Highness. That's my next meeting. Any of your folks want to ship on with the Navy? If some of our folks wanted to try their hand at your trades? Our skill sets are nowhere close, ma'am. We're a pretty select set of specialists here. Retraining your folks to our jobs and our folks to yours would not be an efficient use of resources at this critical time. All of us heard about that buoy six systems out that went silent. We're working twelve or more hours a day, six or seven days a week. Work hard, play hard, Chris said. Yes, ma'am, and we treat them like adults. What they do on their own time, what they have of it, is their own business. My next meeting may see that apply to the fleet as well. well. Good. It's about time, if you don't mind my saying so, that you uniform types treated grown-ups as grown-ups. You tend to your knitting and I'll tend to mine, Chris said, dismissing the future CEO before she decided to give Chris more advice she didn't need. Yes, ma'am, Pippa said, standing. Glad to have you back. Looking forward to working with you. How soon do you think we have before the bastards attack? If I knew that, I'd be a lot more relaxed than I am, Chris said as she ushered Pipra to the door. That left her with exactly three minutes before her meeting with the frigate skippers. That was scheduled for the wardroom. XOs, chief engineers, and skippers of the marine detachments had been invited, as well as command senior chiefs and gunnies. Chris was none too sure how far she'd go with this consensus process, but she wanted all her ducks in a row, where she could knock them down with one stone if she had to. She got the a ten hut and as you were over with as quickly as possible. Again, most of the audience were close to the coffee urns, so she took her stance beside it. She first announced that the crew of the Hornet had been found, starving and sick, but were on their way here. Those present cheered only too aware that it could have been them, and they had a commander who would go the extra million light-years to find them. That done, Chris glanced at Captain Catano, half expecting her to report the issue that was to be the main topic of this meeting, but Catano didn't respond to a glance. When Chris opened the floor up for any problems, the captains only eyed each other. Then Chris saw the reason. Lieutenant Commander Sampson, Former skipper of the Constellation had taken a seat at Chris's far right, half looking at her, half eyeing the other skippers. When their eyes met, Samson locked on her, a cruel twist to her lips. Was she daring Chris and the other skippers to step across the line, to violate Navy regs? Chris had no intention of letting a failed skipper dictate policy to a long knife. As she took a deep breath to start, the door opened and Admiral Benson, retired, stepped inside. He quickly but quietly covered the distance to the chair next to Samson and settled into it. The failed skipper did not look very happy to have her new supervisor seated at her elbow. Chris took another breath and began to lay the problem out in a methodical way. She explained that most of them had been chosen for this assignment 
so far from any other humans, because of their lack of personal attachments. Few had left wives, husbands, or significant others on the other side of the galaxy. All hands needed to be able to make quick emergency adjustments to smart metal. That also made it easy to acquire attachments, and the lack of shore facilities made it hard, if not impossible, for commanders to respond to violations of regulations. That, and the total lack of any replacements to take the place of anyone detached for punishment, put leadership in a lose-lose situation. So, <laughs> what do we do? Chris asked rhetorically. You don't violate Navy regs, Samson snapped. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander, but I'd like to hear from officers actually facing this leadership challenge. They should face it, but they're not. They're all in violation of Navy regs. Samson almost shouted, keeping the floor from any others. Since she insisted on doing all the talking, Chris decided to give her the floor. For a while. And how would you propose solving this leadership challenge, miss? Samson cringed at Chris's slap, addressed as one might a midi or boot ensign, but she charged ahead. As I did with the Constellation. Open space barracks and bed checks. And we saw how well it worked for you, Captain Catano shot back. Most of your crew wanted off your ship. Only because your love boats were out there for them to transfer to, was her comeback. May I remind everyone that we're here to fight a pretty nasty set of aliens, not bicker like kids in the sandbox, Chris pointed out. But you're all behaving like kids, Samson growled. More like teenagers, retired Admiral, now Yard Supervisor Benson put in. These young men and women have a tough job to do, a deadly fate looming in their future, and the need to work it out without the external discipline that usually goes with this job. It's not a good place to be. Samson glared at her supervisor, who ignored her, and gave Chris a placid look. Jack and four Marines marched through the door before Chris said another word. Jack glanced around, spotted Samson, and marched for her. As I understand it, you are not on the approved list for this meeting. Would you please come with me? I'm a serving officer in the U.S. Navy. I can go where I wish. This meeting is for skippers and their key staff, Jack snapped. You are not in any of those billets. Either come with me now, or I will have my Marines remove you to the brig. Sputtering nasties under her breath that Chris was careful not to hear, Samson went where Jack led. At the door, she whirled and pointed at the yard supervisor. What's he doing here? I invited him, Chris said. With that, Jack half ushered, half shoved the red-faced officer out of the room. The last Marine out closed the door. Chris now turned to her officers. Okay, let's talk. Now that you've lived with the app that lets doors show up where we'll never know, what problems have you identified, and what do you think we should do about them? Chris heard no surprises. The list of problems was what you'd expect to hear when men and women worked hard in close proximity. Admiral Benson was kind enough to point out that he was facing them at the shipyard where most of his personnel were civilian and living under looser rules. Captain Kitano summed it up for all. They're grown-ups. They're going to live or die because of what the sailor or officer next to them does. They know it as well as we do. So, if they want to be treated as grown-ups, why shouldn't we let them? There are reinforcements coming only a few systems out, Sims of the Constellation said. Shouldn't we wait for them to establish policy? We've been living with this for a lot longer than they have, another skipper said. Let's do it and let them adjust to us. The more that show up, the more likely we are to get people like Samson. Besides, the Commodore didn't wait to get any chops on her marriage request. Someone in the back tossed in. It sounded like an old chief. 
and pipe down, or that Marine that frog-marched Samson out of here may do you next, an exo snapped. Chris frowned. Was she losing control of the meeting? Kitano stood up. Enough of that. Commodore Longknife had a narrow window when she could do what she wanted, and it wasn't illegal. She grabbed it. I don't know about you, but I like her style. She's offering us a similar window. I say we take it. The room seemed to mull that over for a few seconds, then sounds of agreement filled the wardroom. If we're going to suspend one set of Navy regs, we need to put something in its place, Chris said. I hate to do this, but I need a committee. Two or three skippers, two from each of the rest of you, exos, engineering, marines, chiefs. This policy will be yours to manage. I want the command senior chief and gunny from each frigate working on this. I think we need two from weapons and two from deck division, Captain Kitano tossed in. Okay, Chris said. I want names on my desk in an hour. I want a rough draft on my desk by 0800 tomorrow. If that means some folks miss a night's sleep, so be it. Chris walked out while the skippers were volunteering either themselves or someone of their teams. Jack was waiting for her outside. Sorry about not being there immediately. Nellie called and I came running as fast as I could grab four stray marines. Nellie, thanks for the initiative, and Jack, thanks for the help. Where is our failed skipper? I had the marines escort Samson to the brig to cool off. Once we had her in the passageway, she blew up. She started shouting stuff that, if I'd heard it, might make me have to bring her up on charges for unbecoming and prejudicial. She did that to me last time we talked. Have a medical officer drop down to check her out in the brig. I have to wonder if something's wrong with her. Besides being just plain wrong-headed? Yes. Superintendent Benson slipped out of the meeting. Sorry about that. Samson got away from her desk when I wasn't looking. I'd heard you were back and figured you'd be trying to solve this matter. As soon as I spotted her missing, I came. Thanks for your support. Tell me, in your previous incarnation as an admiral, and considering that an admiral might be included in the reinforcements headed our way, how would you take to what is going on here and what I'm doing? Admiral Benson, retired, rolled his eyes at the overhead. I'd probably have an epileptic fit, to tell you the truth. Samson's problem is that she's old school, like I was. We don't handle some leadership challenges very well. But you've got a similar situation at the yard. Yes, but as I keep reminding myself, I'm a civilian, and so are those working for me. None of us have to get a laser on target the first time every time. Don't get me wrong, I never faced any leadership challenge like you're up against, so I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. It's just not something I would ever do. He paused, then looked Chris hard in the eye. That's likely one of the reasons why King Ray chose you for command here, and not one of the more senior types around. Which gave Chris pause. Had her Grandpa Ray once more hand-picked her for one of his worst messes? Thank you, sir, Chris said, for your advice and guidance. It's worth every penny you paid for it. Now, where's my gal, and how much will it cost me to bail her out? She's in the brig, superintendent, Chris said. But I'd really like to have a medical officer look her over before we turn her loose. I'd hate to discover six weeks from now that she had a brain tumor and we didn't spot it after she acted up like that. A brain tumor would be easier to handle than her just being old line, the former admiral said as he headed down to the brig. So... You got any more hand grenades to toss today, my lovely viceroy and sector commander? Jack asked. <laughs> nope. I can't think of a thing more to do. Oh, when's the wasp due in with our prize? Have we arranged for it to dock? I have arranged a dock for the wasp, Nellie said. I'm assuming we'll park the wreck in a trailing orbit fifty clicks behind the station. Another well done, Nellie. Gosh, Jack. What can we do with ourselves? How about me 
take you to dinner on the station, Jack suggested. It's been a while since I had a date with my wife. 45. Dinner with Jack was beyond nice. They were ushered to a quiet corner and left alone for the evening. The meal was unrecognizable, but Chris enjoyed what the chef had done with meat, roots, and sprouts that had never seen Earth's sun. And there was a band. They danced to tunes from the present to long before humanity ventured from its home. You know, we don't have our song. Jack said. I'm sure we'll find one sooner or later, Chris assured him. They returned to Chris's quarters and soon needed a shower. You know, you have your quarters and I'm down a deck and around the other side, but I really don't think we've quite got the spirit of the policy correct. Jack whispered in Chris's ear as he scrubbed her back. We'll see what the policy is tomorrow, Chris said. And started on his front. Still, before twenty one hundred, Jack was on his way to his quarters, and Chris was back at her desk going through reports. One caused her pause. Professor Labeo thought they had matched the star fields that always decorated the overhead of sacred places on the alien ships. If true, it was about three thousand light years back the way Chris and the fleet of Discovery had come. Interesting. Chris pondered what to do. Knowledge was power. Would a visit to the alien home world give them power? Would any ship dispatched on such a recon mission survive? Chris would have to balance the risk against the return. If she did choose to send someone, who should it be? It would be nice to give Samson another ship and get her out of Chris's hair. The problem was she was more likely to take off for home, whining all the way. Rather than risk her neck to answer any questions, Chris could think of at least one person who was good at asking and answering questions. The only question was, could she risk her? Chris fell asleep at her desk, reviewing food production projections from both the colonial farms and Alwyn. Next morning, on her way to breakfast, Chris found a bleary-eyed XO with two senior chiefs at her side, waiting outside the wardroom. Here's our draft policy. Chris flipped through it. You left a place for me to sign, she pointed out. Captain Catano said we might as well do a full staff job. Whatever draft you sign, we'll need a place to do it at, right? Chris thanked the chiefs for their effort and led the XO into the wardroom. She read the policy through with Jack looking over her shoulder. You see a problem from the Marine side? She asked him. No. I trust my gunnies. Besides, if there is a problem, that's what Mod One and Mod Twelve are for. Chris signed it and handed it back to the XO. See that this is published before noon today. The young lieutenant was grinning from ear to ear. Yes, ma'am, she said. There is an upside to having a long knife for a commander. Not many, Jack assured her, but a few. The exec saluted and headed off at a jog. Is that your first policy? Jack asked. <laughs> Maybe, Chris said, around a bite of bran muffin. Certainly, my first to supplant a Navy reg. We'll have to wait to see how that goes. Yes, we will. Chris was back at her desk in her day quarters when the screens on her walls came to life. Commodore, Captain Kitano reported, we've got activity at Jump Point Beta. Lots of it. Show me what you're getting. Jack, who had been going over his marine reports on the couch, stood up to join Chris in front of her screens. Ships are coming through. U.S. Registry out of Wardhaven, Kitano reported. Renown, Repulse, Royal Sovereign, Resistance, and Resolute. The chief thinks those are heavy frigates. They're followed by the Supply and Ajax. Auxiliaries, but none of them are in our recognition books. Nor are their pennant numbers ones we have. Send my greetings. If we don't hear something friendly from them in two hours, we'll take the squadron to general quarters and sortie. Issue a preliminary order for a sortie. Aye, aye, Commodore. Then another section of Chris's screen lit up. Commodore Hawkins here. 
I hope we didn't scare you, Admiral. Yep, it's Admiral. The king sends his compliments and your official promotion to captain and frocks you up to rear admiral. You'll need the rank. I'm just the first division through the jump. Wait until you see what's behind me. Over to you. Chris, there is a Commander Hawkins in our database. Facial recognition gives a 99.89% match to him. He was on the fast track and it looks like they moved him ahead of a lot of seniors to come here. Let's hope he's as good as they think he is. Commodore Hawkins, good to see you. We've got plenty of seats by the fire. Come on down. Chris knew there would be a long wait for any reply. More ships, Captain Katana reported. Triumph, Swift Shore, Hot Spur, and Spitfire, all from the Helvetican Confederacy, They've got two ships following them, North Star and Enchanter, heavy frigates and supply, too. Let's hope these Triumph and Swift sure have more luck under my command than the last two, Chris muttered. Jack came to rest a supporting hand on her shoulder. Captain Catano, are all these ships smart metal? Chris asked on net. Sensors say they are. Why? Because we're going to need more docks real soon. I hope some of the auxiliaries can be merged into Canopus Station, or it's going to get downright cozy here. Pass that along to Admiral Benson. Doing so, ma'am. Oh, and by the way, congratulations on your promotion, Admiral. Let's wait until we see the orders that come with it. I no longer trust my grandpa, your king. Yes, ma'am, the captain said with equanimity. Apparently, she was getting used to Chris's attitude toward the large herd of elephants she descended from. If she kept up with Chris, she might find herself commodore of a frigate squadron, since there was now an opening for a new boss for the eight frigates who had held down the fort for six weeks. More ships coming through, Kitano reported. On Chris's screen, more green dots popped into view. Names quickly appeared next to them. Haruna, Chikuma, Atago, and Tone. There was a pause, then more appeared. Arasi, Hubuki... Amatukaze and Arare. Musashi was making a major contribution. Again, Chris's screen came to life. I am glad to greet you in a better space, Admiral Longknife, said now Commodore Miyoshi. I see something huge and mangled approaching your station with a ship I don't recognize, but engines my sensor people say are Mitsubishi built. I hope you have left something for us to hunt. I'm very glad to see you again, too, Commodore, as well as the ships you've brought. And yes, the space around Alwa is still a target-rich environment. Glad to have you aboard. That message would also take a while to be received and responded to. Following those large frigates are four more ships, Taige, Soyo, Singe, and Kagumaru. That last one is huge, as in canopus size, they may be bringing their own space dock. I'll talk to Commodore Miyoshi about merging it with Canopus Station, Chris said. Or they can do what they want. I'm just glad to have them. I heard there was a lot of fun going on, Penny said, joining Chris and Jack in Chris's day quarters. It looks like the cavalry just arrived, Jack said. Hope it's enough. Ever the pessimist, Chris said. We need at least one in this shop. Penny said. Be nice to her, Jack said. She's now a permanent captain and a frocked up rear admiral. They're fattening the calf before the slaughter, Penny said wryly. The bastards will certainly know they've been in a fight this time, Chris said. When we were picking the bones of the last mothership, I didn't notice that they hadn't been in a fight last time. Don't think we did either, Jack said. Quiet in the peanut gallery, more ships coming through, Chris said. U.S. from Lorna Dew, Warrior, Warspite, Nelson, and Churchill. How very British of them, Katano said. Argus and Activity are their supply ships. Good show. You think that's the last of the parade? Jack asked. I hope not. What's that give us? Nine Wardhaven ships to start with, plus five more. Eight Musashi and four each from Lorna Dew and Helvetica. Thirty to face 200 or more, depending on how many motherships hit us next time. Now who's the pessimist? Jack asked. 
So we take turns. For the next five minutes, you be the optimist, Chris said. Hold it. There are more, Penny said. Another U.S. ship, the Lion from Savannah. That sounds familiar, but... An industrial planet we helped train fast attacks for, Chris said. Until someone tried to bomb me and we got the boot. Right. I remember them. It was the second place we got bombed, Jack said. And the fourth place we got the bums rush out of, Penny recalled. That was before we ended up on chance. Now those were good times. Good times, Chris said. The only thing good about them was we didn't get suddenly dead. Yes, but we survived, Jack said, and we went on to greater and more fun things, and now we can look back on them fondly. Just think, five years from now we'll be looking back on this and saying, now those were the good times. Because we're in worse trouble than this, Penny said. God help us. Rest assured he will, Jack said. She will. Penny shot back. Crew, crew, look at what Santa brought us. Lion, tiger, jaguar, and puma. What, no skunk? Trust me, Penny, if it would get me another 20-inch frigate, I'd make it my flag. Well, Savannah is adding a cougar, cheetah, lynx, and leopard, Jack said. Still no skunk, Penny sighed. No, but Sirius, Regulus, Polaris, Castor, and Pollux should help keep us supplied. Thirty-eight frigates and fifteen auxiliaries, Jack said. Now tell me, how are we going to feed them all? You were supposed to be the optimist, Chris pointed out. My time was up. I can go back to my default mode. An optimistic marine is usually a dead one. You want me pessimistic. Pessimists are cautious and stay alive. Okay, my love, you may be a pessimist if it will keep you coming home to me, Chris said, and gave him a quick kiss. Penny raised an eyebrow. Haven't you read my first policy memo, Penny? The new lieutenant commander shook her head. Fraternizing is now allowed, so long as it is not harassment. If he harasses me, I get to shove him off to another ship. But she only fraternizes with me, Jack put in. You're biting the bullet, Penny said. Will this change anything between you and Izuka Masao? I don't dare. The last time I loved a guy and married him, he got killed. I almost got killed, and Wardhaven nearly got pounded to dust. I'm unlucky at love for all those around me. More ships coming through, Captain Kitano announced on net. We're not done, Chris said, turning from her friend to the screen. More blips appeared, identified as Altair, Algol, Andromeda, and Defada of the Starline. They've only got two reactors, Senior Chief Benny retired announced on net. I'm showing no lasers, but they're big. As an old chief, I'd bet they're transports, big ones. What has Santa Claus sent this good little girl? Chris asked with a grin. Are you a good little girl? Penny shot back. Chris gave Jack a sideways glance. Well, she's certainly a good girl, her loving husband supplied right on cue. Chris rewarded him with another quick peck before turning to Penny. We'll find out what they are when they get here. Now, Penny, girlfriend to girlfriend, you can't really believe you're responsible for what happened at Wardhaven. Vicky Peterwald as much as told us that her old man was behind the whole attack. I know, Penny said. In my head, I know. But somewhere between there and my heart, my gut, and lower down, I can't seem to get it. The jump point had finished disgorging presents for Chris. She pointed Penny at the couch, and the two of them adjourned to the comfortable seats. Jack seemed to sense girl talk was on the schedule, and excused himself for marine business. Penny, how well is your head screwed on? Chris asked. She'd planned to give Penny a job, a critically important and very dangerous job. However, if her friend was only holding on to herself by her fingernails, Chris might have to look elsewhere. Chris, I'm fine, Penny said, folding her hands into her lap. 
Have you had any problems with my work? None whatsoever, Chris said. Are you up to commanding a ship? Penny made a face. The last time I commanded a ship, I think I killed Hank Peterwall. Have you got another old boyfriend you want popped? He was never a boyfriend, and you didn't kill him. Whoever sabotaged his survival pod did that. But actually, this time, I would most definitely not want you to get in a fight. You're ordering me to command a ship, but not get in a fight? Strange words from a long knife. What's my potential command, a garbage scow? I'm not sure what your command is at the moment, though I'm sure it will have the six 18-inch lasers we took off the wasp, three pointing forward, the others aft. So I've got just as much firepower running as chasing, huh? Pretty much. Here's the situation. Professor Lebeo thinks he's narrowed the location of the alien homeworld to four or five stars. Assuming the stars we saw in several places on the overhead of the alien mothership is actually a night sky of their homeworld. I need someone to go look, see, and run back home fast to report. You're not sending me with any hellburners, are you? No. And I mean no. Take a peek. If you see any ships, run. That will tell me as much as you're seeing the planet. I have a hunch that these folks have all but abandoned their home world. However, if you start running into heavy traffic, that tells me to forget that hunch. I see, Penny said thoughtfully. I poke my nose under the tent but keep one eye on the exit the whole time. She paused for a moment to think. I can be that timid. This really has to be a recon, one where I learn what you see. Heroes need not apply. I get the point, Chris. <laughs> I'm your coward. I don't think any coward would take this mission. It takes a lot of guts to stick your head where the lion's mouth may be. What ship can you give me, the Wasp? Sorry, I can't let a 20-inch laser out of orbit here, Penny. I was thinking of patching some of our spare smart metal to the leftover Hornet reactors and six of the 18-inch lasers, but these new ships arriving may give me other options. As in, re-spinning a smart metal transport into a scout ship? Something like that. How do you think the crew will take to that? Part of me says not well, but another part of me wonders why anyone would agree to come out here if they weren't overstocked on a spirit of adventure. Penny smiled as she shook her head. You expect a lot out of folks, Chris. And sometimes they give me more than I have any right to ask for, like you, Penny. Will you take Izuka Masao with you? The man is waiting with more patience than I deserve for me to get my act together. Will he follow me into the lion's den? I'll have to ask him. You go ask him. And Nellie, make sure Mimsy gets a copy of my new fraternization policy. My kids already have it, Chris. It's you humans who haven't opened your mail. I'll read it, I'll read it, Penny said. Now, don't you have some other fine person's life to ruin? As a matter of fact, I do. Have a good one, Penny. You deserve it. And change your shoulder boards. A frigate skipper is a commander's billet. Penny was already making for the door. Thank you, Chris. Goodbye, Chris. Leaving Chris smiling and wondering whose day a princess should mess with next. Nellie settled it. She had the manifests from the Starline ships. 46. Chris doubted she was messing with Granny Rita's day when she called her. Granny, you won't guess what just dropped into the system. You sound chipper, so it can't be aliens. Don't keep the old girl guessing. Life's too short to waste it on silly games. Yes, Grandmother, Chris drawled. Your king and former husband seems to remember you fondly. What makes you say that? was lathered in caution. Twenty-eight frigates and fifteen auxiliaries just jumped into your nice system. How are we going to feed them all? Granny sighed. There are four honest-to-God transports trailing them, and I just got the inventory of their cargo. 
They're loaded with farm implements, trucks, smart metal fishing boats, all kinds of goodies. How will we power them all? Granny, you are a disgusting downer. Don't you credit Grandpa Ray with the sense God promised a billy goat? A goat, yes. Your grandpa, not so much. They're also loaded with solar power plants and individual cells. Grandpa Ray has not sent you gear that will just sit there and frustrate you. Farm gear, transportation, boats, and power. Did you say anything to Ray? Nope. He wasn't here long enough to see much of anything, his former wife mused. He did take off with twenty or so of your best young people, Chris pointed out. I figured the old bag of wind would be doing all the talking. Ray does have an ego. Apparently, he must have listened a bit because those ships are full of stuff you need. You keep this up and you're going to force me to reassess the old fool. He is a mystery, isn't he, Granny? So, how soon do we get all these wonderful presents? The fleet came in by Jump Point Beta and are making a 1G approach. Say, sometime late today, probably too late to do much until tomorrow. Do you have port facilities for all of them? Not even close, Chris said. Well, have fun. Don't you hate being a grown-up? Goodbye, Granny. Chris's next call was to Ada. There was no reason for her to hear the good news secondhand. The chief of ministry sent back a glory hallelujah reply and said she'd get the colonials ready for the king's largesse. That left Chris with the problem of conjuring a ship for Penny out of thin air. She decided the shipyard was the best place to look for a solution. Besides, if she did what she was thinking of doing, the yard would have a whole lot of new problems to solve. Admiral Benson, retired, was in his office with a large window overlooking the shop floor beneath him. No surprise, he had already heard of the new arrivals. It's nice to see the tip of the spear getting a bit sharper. Thirty-eight frigates to hold off a mothership and her brood of a couple of hundred huge monsters. Odds leave something to be desired, Chris said. Oh, yes, but they're three, four times better than they were yesterday. I have some problems I could use your help solving. How many and how bad? The old Navy man said. First, rumor is I've been made an admiral. You didn't bring along any old shoulder boards, did you? He was grinning before she finished the sentence and reaching into a drawer of his desk. I kept my first set of admiral shoulder boards around for good luck. May you wear them in good health, he said, tossing a pair of boards across the desk to Chris. Would you mind helping me put them on? Chris asked. Shouldn't your husband do that? If they're your lucky shoulder boards, I wouldn't want to do anything to jinx the luck. He did the honor, then stood back and gave her a salute. He might be a civilian at the moment, but Gunny would thoroughly approve of his form. So, one problem down, what next? All the auxiliaries are smart metal. What kind of warship do you think you could re-spin two or three of them into? What do you have in mind? The asteroids are coming up with all kinds of rare and exotic materials, just what we need for making lasers of our own. The crew in my weapons lab can't wait to get their hands on the old Hornet's lasers and start reworking them. Same for her reactors, though I'm not sure I'd trust them out of my sight. What's the phrase? They've been rid hard and put away wet. Yes, I suspected you'd say something like that. Yes, I want more support ships for the asteroid mines, but I need to spin out a frigate as well. Are the Wasps and Intrepid's original 18-inchers gathering dust? We put one of them in each of the Hellburner bases we set up on the moons. Assuming they get slagged real good by the bastards, we'll need to recut our launch tunnels to get the Hellfires out. That still leaves eight or five. Have we dug bases to cover the beta jump point? Just starting, but those lasers aren't being wasted. I've got them mounted on my station, and we've trained ostriches to man them. Those birds are smart and not afraid to be mean. Any chance they might sign up for ship duty? Chris asked. What do you have in mind? Chris told him. 
His reaction was, at best, noncommittal. I don't know. Spin out a frigate to the wasp's design? I think we can do that. Find a crew, that might be a problem. You sure the merchant folks arriving plan to stay? I haven't asked them, Chris admitted. Ever heard of shanghaiing? Likely I've been guilty of that a few times in my life. Come to think about it, a lot of folks might want to hitch a ride back on those empty transports. Any idea how we keep from hemorrhaging our workforce? By my count, there were 28 frigates escorting those 19 auxiliary and merchant ships. How many folks do you think would want to ride the convoy home with no escort? You're a hard woman. I'm a long knife. I've got a fight coming in 38 warships to hold the line. Would you lose a few to an escort mission? The retired admiral didn't say anything for a long while. Finally, he muttered, I guess I'd look at my orders. Mine are rather vague. Put up a fight. I don't have to win. I just have to make it look good enough that the bastards don't think they need to go looking for where we might be from. Me, I'd prefer to win. I get to stay alive if I win. We sure don't if we lose, Benson agreed. You just get ready to re-spin a lot of smart metal into what we need. Leave the personnel to me. Gladly. The wasp was on its final approach. It parked the wreck a good hundred clicks back, trailing the station. Good idea. There might well be more ships stuck swinging around each other if there wasn't anything to grow the station coming in. The wasp also dumped the wreckage of the hornet ten clicks back. Yard tugs were quickly picking through the pieces. The reactors were the first to be towed in for examination. There were shuttles coming up from Alwa, loaded with boffins wanting a first look at the alien technology. There were also docs who had been dirt-side, researching the local biology or starting up the geriatrics clinic. Every medical type available had been recalled to help with Phil Tausig's survivors. Chris was there when they wheeled Phil up from the Wasp's Pier. Good heavens, Chris. You've got quite a setup here. Oh, pardon me, Admiral. In bed, weak as he was, he tried to lie at attention. How many generations of Navy did he have stiffening his backbone? At ease, Commander. I'm just a jumped-up captain my grandfather, the King, frocked up to an admiral. And you'll be a full commander as quickly as Nellie can cut the paperwork. Listen, Phil, I've got a problem. <laughs> Don't you long knives always. Chris quickly filled him in on what she'd found on Alwa. Wow. So we weren't just fighting for a bunch of weird bird folks, huh? Nope. My own granny and two shipfuls of survivors and their kids and grandkids. So, what's the situation now? We've got a potential alien attack marshalling somewhere out there. They could hit us any time. My problem is that I want to hang on to every asset I've got. My second problem is that if ever survivors deserved home leave, you and your crew do. If I send a ship back for you, I may have a whole lot of people hitching a ride along with you. I see, Phil said. His head sank deeper into the pillow. Was moving him tiring him out, or was it the heavy load she just dumped on him? Maybe she shouldn't have said anything. After all, if she got hit with a full-fledged mutiny, or if a couple of those frigates had orders already to escort the merchants back, this might all be for nothing. If so, she would do whatever she had to do. We're here, Chris. That's all that matters. Do with us what you will, Phil said, then seemed to collapse into his gurney. She left Phil as a flock of people in white coats began to gather around him. Chris found herself in a situation she was all too familiar with. It was that time before battle, when she'd done everything she could and now had to wait to see if it had been enough. She hunted up Jack and they had a quiet lunch. He listened as she recounted her morning, nodding support, asking a few questions that helped clarify her thoughts. Yes, she was prepared to countermand orders given back in human space. What came here stayed here. 
Would she force the crew of the Hornet to sit out the coming attack in hospital beds? That stumped her. She needed ships. She needed crews. Certainly she owed the Hornet. She and the Wasp's crew would likely have been stuck there with them if Phil hadn't gone one way and let her go the other. I think I'm starting to understand how Grandpa Ray got to be such a bastard, Chris finally muttered. Chris returned to her desk. Reports were piling up. Professor Labeo wanted to know if Chris was going to do anything about the possible alien home planet. If so, a lot of boffins that Chris would have credited with good sense wanted in on the mission. Ada had already started making plans to extend the colonial farmlands. Her question was where the labor would come from, and did Chris think any of the newly pacified forest land could be made available to the colonials? Ada hadn't yet contacted the Elwyn elders about that hot potato. It looked like she wanted Chris to handle it. The planetary survey was not quite done. They'd found some rare earths and other minerals needed for lasers and smart metal, but they were not in places easy to get to. As far away as the asteroids were, it was likely that they could be exploited faster. There was something about biological research that seemed to offer hope of a spectacular breakthrough, but the report was very vague. Like everyone in human space, Chris had heard about potential world-changing science, only to find it vanish down the no-not-really tubes with as little fanfare as possible. Chris read on. About supper time, Jack came to dig her out. I've got something special for you. Want to show it to me? Chris purred. You have a one-track mind. I've had a very bad day. The surprise was a new restaurant, the Burger Carnival. The proprietor had painted it up like an ancient traveling circus, complete with clowns and old earth animals. Remind you of any place? Jack said. Chris wondered if she blushed, but apparently admirals were too shameless for such things. The place where I decided to draft you, Chris admitted. I thought so. Jack said. Can you forgive me? Chris asked. For starting us on the road to here? What's to forgive? They ordered hamburgers and fries. Cheese apparently was not available for love nor money. Jack led Chris to a table in the back of the restaurant, which was actually the front of the station. They had a spectacular view of Alwa as it revolved below them. Chris tried not to look for anything she'd read about in her reports. I'm having dinner with my husband, right. Do you know what's special about today? Jack said, reaching across the table for her hands. Besides the cavalry arriving to either rescue us or go down in our defeat? Forget the job, Jack growled. Today is our second anniversary. It's been two months since we let Granny Rita talk us into taking the plunge. Do you regret it? Never, Chris said, squeezing Jack's hand. Two months. I totally forgot about it. I can hardly keep track of the time. How'd you do it? I had Sal do it for me. Nellie, why didn't you tell me? I didn't know it mattered to you. I know it's a very romantic thing for you humans. I just didn't know if it would include you, Chris. Yes, I'm human. And yes, I'm romantic, at least for Jack. And Jack, why are you doing all the girl things and me doing all the stupid boy stuff? You're the admiral, he said with a shrug. Chris let out a sigh. I don't like that, Jack. But you have to. That's what long knives do. They do what they have to do. Well, I want to do more. Stuff I want to do as well as what I have to do. Dinner arrived, brought by a moonlighting marine. The haircut gave him away. Just what you ordered, Colonel. Two burgers with all the trimmings and two orders of fries. Chris took a breath and was transported back in time. Then she frowned. Onions, tomatoes, real potatoes. How'd you do it, Jack? A quick glance around showed other diners making do with produce from the native Alwyn fields. These are from your Granny Rita's garden. Don't look too closely at the meat, though. It's from the deep forest. But I promise, 
It's off one of the more delectable vegetarians rather than a tough type that still thinks marine might taste good. Jack awarded a grin to their waiter. He blushed at his superior's attention. You amaze me, Jack. You remember our anniversary and do it enough ahead of time to talk my granny out of the fruits of her garden. Oh, I didn't talk her out of anything. It was pure horse trading. My marines will deliver a truckload of fish offal to her and all her neighbor's gardens. Nobody gets anything free from your granny. Which leads me wondering if she's all that different from Ray, Chris said, taking a bite. I will do my best to stay different enough to save you from the long knife curse, Jack said as he began to enjoy his own dinner. They ate in quiet ease, content to bask in each other's company. Maybe I can become a comfortable old married woman, Chris thought with as much hope as doubt. They were almost done when their view window suddenly lost its view. What the... Jack said, standing. Chris was on her feet almost as fast. A huge cylinder slowly moved between them and the planet below. On its side was Kagu Maru, in standard and kanji. There was also the Mitsubishi Heavy Space Industry logo. It was easily as big around as Canopus Station, maybe longer. Once it was fully in view, it began to edge slowly into formation ahead of the station. When it covered the entire front, the thing began to take on spin, first slowly, then faster, until it was matching the rotation of Canopus Station. Then it began to creep back. Somebody's awfully confident they aren't going to rupture a hull, Chris said. That brought looks of terror from the other diners, and some abandoned their meals to head for the exit. Both stations are made of smart metal, Jack said in a raised command voice. If anything rips, they can have it fixed in seconds. The exit slowed. The hull rang as the two cylinders made contact. Canopus Station lurched backward, but hardly enough to make Chris sway on her feet. Not bad, she said in admiration. Want to bet your buddy Katsu-san is at the bottom of this? Good Lord! If he came out again, I just might have to send him back, Chris said. Then again, he might be very helpful in re-spinning ships. Now you're taking on my nasty role. Whatever, Jack said with a shrug. Want to bet the fleet's in? And you need to see a lot of new officers? Let them see you? Oh, yes. Nellie, send to all the ships, frigates, auxiliaries, and merchants. Officers call in two hours. Captains and execs required. Marines, boffins, engineering, and weapons and chiefs of the boat may also attend. The location is in the Wasp's forward lounge, two-drink limit. Chris had been approached by Mother MacReady as spokesperson for all the tap shops on station, requesting the two-drink limit. It will stretch the supply. Besides, we've got a foul drink that the Alwyn's guzzle coming up. Two of them will put any old drunk under the table. Chris had signed the order. Chris did paperwork before the meeting. This time it was the good kind, a promotion list. Kitana went to full commander and was frocked up to Commodore. She'd find out why later. All the frigate skippers got full commander. They'd have to do the paperwork to promote their XOs and division heads themselves. The Wasp presented Chris an interesting challenge. She solved it in the usual long knife way. Nelly, activate Captain Drago's reserve commission, bring him out of retirement, and give him a captain's rank. Chris, I'm not sure I can jump a man from lieutenant to captain in one afternoon. Nelly, he dropped himself from rear admiral to lieutenant in less time. If you have to, ask him how he did it. Of course, Nelly found a way. The magnificent Nelly did not ask mere mortals for help. 47. Two hours later, the forward lounge was going strong. The crews of Chris's squadron had arrived first and occupied the tables closest to the bar. Apparently, Musashi had been first to dock, probably on their own section of the station, and Commodore Miyoshi and his command teams were catching up with the Musashi Navy folks, 
who had come out on the WASP. Commodore Hawkins had set up shop for the newly arrived U.S. contingent against the far wall, and officers from Lorna Du, Savannah, and Wardhaven mixed freely. The Helveticans joined the Musashi Navy in the middle. The four merchant skippers and their first mates had a table next to the door. As Chris entered, she took all this in with a glance, even as someone shouted, A ten hut! Admiral on deck! And she got, as you were, out before most people could even start to get to their feet. The merchantmen didn't even make an effort. They would be a challenge. Chris marched to the table in the front Penny had reserved for them. Her shoulder board showed commander stripes. Jack stayed two steps behind Chris. Once at the front of the lounge, Chris turned and let her eyes rove over the young men and women before her. Silence quickly fell. Thank you for coming on such short notice, Chris said, and let chuckles roll around the room at the double meaning of her words. Commodore Hawkins, I haven't gotten a copy of your orders. Can you share them with us? The man pointed his wrist at the screen behind Chris, and it came to life. I am ordered to report to you, Admiral, and conform to your orders. Thank you, Chris said. Will I for once have a chain of command that isn't a knot fit only for a kitten to play with? She turned to Commodore Bethia from Savannah. She stood to attention and announced, My orders are the same. We are U.S. Navy and we follow you. Apparently Grandpa Ray was getting more united in his societies than when Chris last passed through, or maybe they just sent her the committed Federalists. The captain from Lorna Du quickly rose to her feet. Same here. We are at your command, Your Highness. Chris would have preferred Admiral, but she'd answer to whatever got her a fighting fleet. Now she turned to the hard one. Commodore Miyoshi, it's so good to see you again. And very nice it is to see you in better circumstances, he said. He also pointed his wrist unit at the screen and his orders appeared. I am to place myself and my command under your orders and serve honorably at your side, Admiral. You will note that my orders were endorsed by the Emperor himself. I know of no naval force that has ever sailed with that kind of an endorsement from the throne. I am honored, Chris said, giving the Commodore a deep bow from the waist that he promptly returned. Now it was the Helvetican captain's turn. It looks to me like everyone's been drinking from the same beer mug. My orders are identical to yours, Commodore, he said, raising his wrist and letting the screen show basically the same orders without the imperial chop. That settled, Chris asked the obvious question. How was your voyage out? The three Commodores glanced around at each other, seemed to toss a coin among them. Then Hawkins began. Not bad. We took a separate route than the king took. We did pass through a system with something going on, definitely a reactor, but it was planet-bound and nothing hailed or shot at us. Good. Your auxiliaries, will they be staying here? Chris asked. The repair ship, certainly. Having two dockyards should be nice, but having your own repair ship that I command for my division is better. The supply ships? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I have no orders there. Do any of you other folks have orders? That was met with a lot of head shaking. Commodore Miyoshi seemed to speak for all. What are your orders, Admiral? They're smart metal, and we found a lot of uses for it, Chris said, vaguely, then turned to the table with the merchantmen in the rear. What about you? You're from the Star Line. They took stock among themselves. Then an old salt stood. We were told to unload and head back immediately. You'll be going without an escort, Chris said. That brought another look around among the skippers. We can't sail without an escort, someone still seated said. No insurance if we do. Aren't you going to give us an escort? The standing salt asked. I need all the frigates here with me. Chris said. I told you they was going to get us good, 
came from someone. I think we ought to make a run for it, was someone's input. May I point out, Chris said softly, that Starlines is a wholly owned subsidiary of New Enterprises, and I'm the authorized CEO of said enterprises here on Alwa. That was met by groans from the back and quite a few chuckles from the navies. We been had. Yes, I think you have, Chris admitted. Please continue offloading tomorrow. When you're done, I'd like you to dock your ships in the yard portion of the station. We're likely going to use you for ore carriers. We want to make our own lasers. We've found the ore and are mining it, but we need to ship it from the asteroid belt to the moon, here. That was met with more groans. There is, however, one other possibility. Several heads came up. I want to dispatch a ship on a dangerous recon mission. We'll arm the ship, but it's not intended that you will fight. Just take a peek and run back. Take a peek at what? What we think may be the home planet of the aliens, Chris said. That brought on louder groans from the merchants and longer chuckles from the Navy types. When quiet returned, a young woman stood. I'm pushing the Altair, ma'am. Me and mine wouldn't mind talking a bit more about that scout mission, if you will. Chris had to work real hard not to hear some of the comments from the other merchant types. You can join me at my table for a drink after we finish here, Chris said. The woman sat down and pulled her chair a bit away from the other merchant skippers. Now, for the fleet. We've got warning buoys six jumps out. One of the outer ones has gone silent. We haven't checked to see if it just broke or if it's been shot up. I don't intend to. The fleet that's here will stand by to fight when, not if, the aliens come at us again. For that fight, we need to reorganize. Chris turned to her old squadron mates. Commodore Kitano, you will command Batron 1, with two divisions of four frigates each. Aye, aye, Admiral. Commodore Hawkins, you and the Lorna Du contingent will form Batron 2, with two divisions. Yes, Admiral. Uh, pardon me for asking, ma'am, but we were dispatched as a frigate squadron. Battle squadron? You're packing 20-inch lasers, Commodore. Our ships may be frigates, but we're forming battle squadrons. Does that answer your question? Certainly, Admiral. Commodore Bethia, Savannah will form Batron 3. Glad to, Admiral Longknife. Commodore Miyoshi, you have Batron 4. Honored to serve with you, Admiral. The Helvetican Division will form Independent Division 9. If we can knock together some lasers, you may have some of the auxiliaries upgunned into fighting ships with you. Several of the auxiliary skippers looked more than willing to follow that path. Captain Drago, Chris said, and the old sea dog stood, now in a full Navy captain's uniform. The Wasp and the Intrepid will form Independent Division 10. I'm aware of the handicap your slower reload rate places on you. You will continue to be my flag, and we will accommodate your ship's limitations. The Wasp is a very good ship, Admiral. I know very well that it is, Captain, Chris said, then turned back to the fleet in general. Tomorrow at 0900, the battle fleet will sortie for a speed run to the nearest gas giant. We will proceed through the asteroid belt and use them for target practice. No asteroids larger than one meter will be targeted. We don't want to spoil any miner's claim. We will launch pinnaces and refuel from the gas giant. Any questions? There were none. Then, all hands, as Viceroy of Alwa, let me thank you for coming to the aid of both the colonials and natives of this planet. Know that we are in for a fight, but that there is every prospect that we will be the victors in it. Now, enjoy your first night on Canopus Station, and yes, we have a policy restricting you to two drinks. Sorry, but the resources of the planet beneath us are being pushed to their limits to support us. I appreciate the agricultural gear you brought, but must point out that it may be several months before a new crop comes in. 
Chris paused to see how this sank in. From the look she'd got, their logistics problem was not a surprise. She'd have to check in with the Commodores after the meeting to see just how well supplied they were. Again, thank you. And please enjoy our hospitality. The room broke out in talk. As Chris expected, the four Commodores quickly gravitated to her table. All were young, clearly advanced ahead of their time. The war would show if they truly merited the honors. No surprise, their supply ships were loaded. All expected to be self-supporting for the next three months. That took a load off, Chris. It was newly promoted Commodore Kitano who caused Chris to cancel the next day's sortie. She asked if the other frigates had been modified to permit high-speed jinking. That brought blank stares. She and Captain Drago explained the need for dodging and the required mods they had made to their ships. Instead of drills, the next day would need to be devoted to bringing the new frigates up to Alwa fighting standards. Both Kitano and Drago promised to share expertise with the newcomers. All the time this conversation was going on, Chris kept catching the skipper of the cargo ship Altair waiting close, but not too close. Only after the Commodores moved off to share schematics of changes and schedule visits by chief technicians did the young skipper and the two women who worked for her settle down at Chris's table. "'An all-woman crew, Captain?' Chris asked. "'No, just most of the officers willing to serve with me,' the woman skipper answered. Chris introduced Penny to Jade O'Dell. "'Penny is my intelligence officer,' and will be nominally in command of the frigate Endeavor. You already have a ship? No, but when your ship is respun, it will be a frigate, with six 18-inch lasers. Nobody said anything about fighting, her engineering officer said. Three guns will point aft and three forward. With the bastards we're dealing with, you don't want to just have running as your only option, though I'd prefer it. Okay, I got engineering, but I don't have anyone trained with guns, Odell said. The canopy station manager wanted to have some protection. He mounted the smaller lasers from the Wasp and hired Alwyns to fire them. I planned to borrow both. <laughs> Reprogramming my ship into a warship, Odell mused. Mounting guns manned by aliens. Any more surprises? The Boffins are standing in line to go with you. Half the scientists want to get a look at the alien world. They all figure they can extract the real meaning of the place. So we'll have a mob of eggheads, the first mate said. No, Penny said. You will have only as many as I and Professor Labeo say go. Fifty, a hundred at most. Passengers, the chief engineer said, and made it sound like a dirty word. Many have sailed with me, Chris said and I can vouch that they are housebroken. If they don't behave themselves, Penny here will activate their reserve commission and make them toe the mark in uniform. And us? The captain asked. Penny and I are used to having a contractor commanding our ship, the Wasp. Penny will make the call where you go and when you run. Any problem with that? How many years you been with this long knife? The engineer asked. Over five, and I'm still alive and kicking. Penny said. Well, sounds good enough. We'll get a chance to do something important, see the galaxy, have a story to tell, and shame those prissy boys. Win all around, Odell said. Chris watched them go. On lesser things, great victories had turned. Then she turned to her next problem, making sure that the other merchant skippers didn't try to make a run for it with their cargo still aboard. Not a problem, Chris. Nellie said. I checked. Their tanks are as bone dry as you can get. One jump, not a bit more. Oh, and their ships have two reactors, an orange program to spin off a pinnace. I checked. So they have to stay. Good planning on someone's part. Which left her wondering whose. Just how twisted was Grandpa Ray's mind? Or had he just delegated that to someone like Commodore Hawkins? She glanced around and spotted Jack talking to several other Marines. Their eyes met, and Jack quickly finished up what he'd been doing. "'You ready to head home?' he asked as he joined her. 
all meeting doubt. Hope you saved something. I moved my gear into your quarters and let Drago have my space back. There has to be some advantage to being all the way across the galaxy from people who make silly regs. I'll set up a marine command center tomorrow. Could I borrow one of your screens? Half of what I have is yours. One screen will do. I'll do my marine work there. But you're sleeping beside me. 48. Without the sortie, Chris was stuck with administrative work the next day. The prospects seemed less onerous after waking up beside Jack and showering and dressing together before dropping down to the ward room for breakfast. Granny Rita didn't let Chris finish her bran muffin and juice of an unidentified variety before she had Nellie get her a list of what each ship had and started arguing over what priority to land them. She didn't like it when she heard that the Altair would unload first. She was still grumbling as Chris explained why. Long knives, even former long knives, could be a real pain. Chris oversaw getting the flow of material dirt sides started, then touched base with Admiral Benson retired. He was already pulling his hair out. Have you any idea how much energy it takes to get smart metal flowing? Chris admitted she didn't. He told her. Have you asked the folks on the Musashi half of the station if you can have one of their huge reactors? Chris asked. Will you ask them? I don't want to seem too needy and, you know. Chris knew very well how it was with businessmen. She put on her CEO of local new enterprises hat and had tea with a kind old gentleman, Hiroshi, the manager of the Mitsubishi yard. It turned out that he expected to surrender three of his many reactors. He was just waiting for someone to tell him where to send them. Chris connected him with Superintendent Benson, and they were soon best of friends, since Benson only coveted one of those reactors. Chris's next stop was Pepra. She now had a very Spartan office next to the Thai restaurant. Wasn't smart metal nice. That was one hard-ass twist you took to drafting those ships and their crew, was her greeting for Chris. I need them. At least one of those ships is going to be a frigate and go scout the alien homeworld. Still, you might have offered them a bonus for staying on. Chris paused to consider that. Hmm, good point. I keep forgetting that money is a motivator for your sector of the economy. Don't make it sound dirty. It's getting you lasers. How's that coming? We've started shipping the parts for a couple of them up to the station. You'll get most of the ships when they're unloaded. It will help. How long do you think we have? I don't know, Chris said. Then Nellie cut in. Chris, they want you back at the command center. Why? Another jump buoy just got popped. I'll be right there. Get the Commodores headed that way as well. Ask a stupid question, Pepper said. Get the answer you don't want to hear. Please keep this under your hat, Chris said. At least until I get back to you with something more definite than we lost a buoy. I don't even know which one. I'll keep quiet until lunch. Having the latest news gives me points. You must know that. What Chris knew was that Father did his best to keep news away from the news. She headed for the wasp and found herself walking briskly beside Commodore Miyoshi. Is this it? he asked. We've got six layers of buoys. This could be a fifth one out, or another of the farthest ones. Or they could have done a big jump like we did. It's hard to get a base ship moving very fast. Would you want to risk twenty, thirty billion people on a bad jump? I know what I'd do, Commodore Miyoshi said. I don't know what they'd do. What's a bad jump for folks that are born and live their whole lives in space? Good point. But they're after us. Jumping all to hell and gone won't do us any damage. Let's quit guessing and see what's happening. They crossed the brow to the wasp just as the other Commodores arrived. It was a silent group that entered Chris's day quarters. Jack was there, as was Penny. Captain Drago entered from the bridge as they came in from the passageway. 
Chris's screens lit up. We've lost another buoy, said Drago. It's one of the outer ones. That's good, Commodore Miyoshi said. Mm, maybe not so good, Chris said. Nellie, am I right? Does that system lead to the beta jump point? Yes, Chris. Nellie, get me Pepra. On the line, Chris. Pepra, I'm glad you're not out gossiping about what you heard. Tell me, how are things coming at digging in a hellburner base on the gas giant's moons near Beta Jump Point? I thought the aliens were coming in the Alpha Jump again. Looks like they are keeping their options open. We need to get a base near Beta. We haven't started. We need to start right now. That's going to slow down the mining and transportation for more lasers. Can't be helped. Lasers aren't going to dent a mothership. Get the drilling operation moving to Beta. Change the unloading priorities. Push the Altair. But concentrate on one of the others as much as you can. Ignore the other two. Once you get the second unloaded, re-spin it into two transports and get them out to the mines for ore. Then we can do the third and fourth. Granny Rita is not going to be happy. She wanted specific stuff out of all four of them in her own order. Leave Granny to me. Whether or not we survive the next attack depends on this. Understood, Long Knife. There goes my lunch. Now you've fixed it so I won't have a chance to gossip about all my inside tidbits. You can tell everyone whose day you have to ruin by changing their priorities. All about how you learned it from rubbing elbows with that damn long knife. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. Pipra out. That young woman is downright insubordinate, Hawkins said. She's a civilian. They don't have to be subordinate. And whether or not we win the next battle depends as much on what those civilians do as what we war fighters do. Get used to it. Chris paused a moment to let that sink in, then went on. Captain Drago, run through the situation with these warning buoys for the new members of our command staff. Nellie, could you please call up the system where we just lost our buoy? The captain said. Nellie did. It showed a worthless system with three jumps. Two led into it. One led inward toward Alwa. The buoy we lost was this one. One of the outer jumps lit up. Immediately upon its falling silent, the buoy at the inbound jump slipped out of the system and started the report coming in. Could it tell how strong the force entering the system was? Commodore Miyoshi asked. Or how many reactors jumped in? Our jump buoys have been modified, Penny put in. Yes, they identify reactors, so even if they aren't shot up, we know they've been visited. The bastards, however, Chris said, always shoot. Shoot and never talk. Would it help if you knew how many reactors had jumped in the system? Nellie asked. Definitely, Chris said, as the Commodores nodded. I can do a software mod and add that capability to the buoys. It might take a few days for the upload to reach the outer buoys. Is there a downside to the change? None that I can project, Chris. Then get started immediately. Nellie, change the screen to show all the systems we've put buoys in. Nellie did. We lost sensors in these two systems, so now we have two buoys waiting at the next jump. We only need one. Nellie, after you get the updated software to these two outer buoys, order one of them to duck back into the silenced system, do a reactor count for 30 minutes, then come back. Good, Jack said. We'll know if those systems are now bases or we're just hit-and-run raids. Do you think they're playing with us? Commodore Hawkins asked. I would be very surprised if the bastards even allowed their children to play, Chris said. No, I think they are feeling around our perimeter. They lost a mothership and a whole lot of her little monsters, and now they've lost a few more. We would recon a target more thoroughly that gave us a bloody nose, 
especially if this is the first bloody nose we'd had in a long time. They are feeling us out. Do they have to come through all six layers of our buoys? Commodore Miyoshi asked. No, Nellie said. There are several of the systems four out that they could jump into directly. That is why I recommend as thick a warning perimeter as we could make. The Commodore seemed startled that Chris's computer would answer them direct, all but Miyoshi, who only smiled at the other's surprise. Exactly, Chris agreed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Now, I suggest we all get back to work. The bastards are out there. I'm not surprised they are threatening us. They won't be here today. Let's get ready for them when they do come. The Commodores left with hurried steps. Throughout the station, people walked faster, looked more intent. The enemy wasn't something just seen in media reports. It was blasting human gear out of space, scant jumps from them. Things needed doing that might just save lives, your own life. Time was blood. The Altair finished unloading and was moved into the yard for reconstruction. Granny Rita complained she had containers dirt side that needed to be on the moon. There were plenty of lighters going down, so that meant plenty to get stuff back up. Still, cargo masters were warned to be more careful. The team of diggers who had just finished arming three moons around one gas giant took off at two G's for the other one, a third of the way across the system. No one complained about the wait. Even before the Algol was unloaded, it gave up a reactor to the Endeavor. That scout would still be underpowered compared to the Wasp, but that was the best Chris could do for Penny. Once unloaded, the Algol would take on two huge reactors from the former Kagumaru and ship them to the factories on the moon. That would free up several ship-sized reactors to power potential armed merchant cruisers. The engines from the old Hornet could not be recertified for space. They also headed for the moon to release more power plants for ships. A suggestion came from one of the loadmasters that the three cargo ships just park their containers in orbit, a few clicks from the station. Then they could start splitting the cargo ships into smaller ore carriers and get them headed for the asteroid belt. Chris slapped her forehead and agreed to the change. That likely meant more containers routed wrong, but there was nothing critical for the moon in the shipment, and the asteroid ore was desperately needed for the laser-building program. The change was made smoothly. The ordered chaos lasted all day as decisions were made and their application identified problems. Those were examined by not only the command staff, but the people doing the work, and better ideas often came up. Chris was amazed at how fast the decision cycle could whirl through that process, but her people were good. They knew their lives were on the line. Jack took Chris to dinner. This time it was Kiet's Thai food, and the stir-fry was distinctively local. Even the spices had been replaced with things available dirt side. Some of my customers are telling me I should change the sign to Kiet's Alwin food. <laughs> But a couple of Alwins have dropped by, Kiet himself explained to Chris as he seated them. Both the roosters and the ostriches turned up their noses at my best. No accounting for taste, Jack said, and ordered from the menu for Chris. One of my officers suggested this. I think I can trust her taste. As it turned out, they very much could. The food served them had the echo of ancient earth behind it, but it clearly was something new. It delighted Chris's taste buds. This is the first time humanity and another species have come together without trying to kill each other, Chris muttered when the meal was done. We've got to save these people. That's what you're doing your level best to do, Jack said. The meal was wonderful, romantic, and relaxing, even if they were interrupted twice. Jack took Chris back to their quarters and insisted on taking his time to fill the evening with slow lovemaking. Chris smiled and relaxed into his arms, knowing full well they'd be interrupted before Jack got too far along. Surprise! Chris's expected calls never came. 
Next morning, Jack admitted to having bribed Nelly to hold all calls. How he bribed a computer, he didn't say, but Chris's callback list didn't turn up anything during breakfast that hadn't been solved without her. Who says you long knives are indispensable? Jack said with a knowing grin. The fleet sorted at exactly 0900. Division 10 with the Wasp and Intrepid dropped back to a trailing orbit, while Div 9's four frigates pulled away to form up forward of the station. That smartly done, the four battle squadrons began to spin off the station smoothly. Each bat run was to form on the station at 90-degree intervals, north, east, south, and west of the station's long axes. Each rotation, a ship would spin off at each major point of the compass and head out to join its squadron flag. Eight rotations, and the eight ships of each squadron were in line. Chris looked upon what she had ordered and found it good. Deorbiting burn three on my mark, she sent. It had been years since battle fleets had formed up, and those fleets had been ponderous, ice-encrusted monsters that lumbered along in formation, hardly budging in their course, confident in their powerful lasers and thick ice armor. Chris had never gone to war in such a line, and she had no intention of doing so now. She was a product of the fast attack boats, nimble, quick, thin-skinned but heavily armed, and deadly. That was how she intended to fight this new enemy. In a battle formation, but with each ship free to do its own dance with death, dodging and thrusting while laying on heavy laser fire at the longest range possible. It had worked for her before. She intended to make it work now. Nellie had come up with a series of fleet orders. Chris had reviewed them with Jack the night before and found them probably workable. Nellie had issued the fleet its new order books with graphics to show her dozens of jinx patterns. Now they would find out if it worked. Today, all ships were at triple intervals. If this didn't work as well as it should, hopefully they wouldn't dent any of their smart metal. The deorbiting burn worked as planned. They dropped no lower than Chris wanted, then blasted off for the closest gas giant. Along the way, Chris had the fleet form a line ahead of her. Yes, Jack, I'm keeping my flag at the rear of the line, she told her security chief. Fine, Admiral. I really don't see any reason for you to be at the head of it, do you? Chris didn't offer an answer, but then ordered the fleet to condition Charlie, an upped acceleration to two Gs. Not an engine sputtered. This was going better than she'd expected. Then again, they'd spent a day getting ready for this and weren't making any of the mistakes Chris's first squadron had in their first drill. Chris crossed her fingers and ordered the fleet into a line abreast to the left. Ponderous battle lines had done this in years gone by, with the lead ship making a hard left turn and then having all the ships follow, making their turn at the same point in space. Then, when all the ships were in a column going left, or whatever degree had been ordered, they would all turn 90 degrees again and be in the desired column, abreast. Chris very much doubted the bastards would give them time for all those twists and turns. Her fleet did it differently. The lead ship held its course in acceleration. The other ships altered course a few degrees in the desired direction and added a fraction of a G to their speed. The entire line swung wide into the line Chris wanted. Once in position, the ships altered course and acceleration back to the fleet's course, and there they were, all 34 of them, with their six 20-inch lasers pointed at whatever they were headed toward. About turn on my mark, Chris ordered. She paused for acknowledgments from the squadron leaders to come in. They waited until all of their division flags reported that each ship had the word. This takes way too long. Chris drew up a revised plan for her fighting instructions, where every ship would send its acknowledgments straight to her board. She'd implement that before they finished today's exercises, but for now she was doing it the old Navy way. Execute about turn, she said, and the fleet did it at two G's. There were some interesting burbles in the drill. Some ships flipped up, others down. One ship swung to the right. Chris smiled. 
An old line admiral would probably throw a fit, but she wanted her ships to be unpredictable. Well done, fleet. I like the uncertainty in your maneuver. We never help the enemy by being predictable. How many of you commodores are biting your nails at that? They went through the order book with Nellie sounding more and more proud of herself. There were no surprises, though Chris decided that she'd never have her ships at less than double interval when hard maneuvering was expected. Ships needed their room. They were in two lines abreast, one atop the other, doing 3.75 Gs and following Nellie's jinx pattern six, the toughest, when they approached the asteroid belt. Chris had altered the course to keep them clear of the big ones that had mining operations going full tilt. Still, she restricted her target practice to rocks of less than half a meter in size. There were plenty of targets, and few of them survived long enough to need a second shot. Chris had wondered how good her personnel were. A cursory review of their files showed them young, fit, and all volunteers. Their officers were young, too, promoted ahead of their classmates often twice. The records had given Chris pause. Now she saw she had no reason to doubt them. They drilled like grizzled vets. When they faced a wall of hostile fire, would it be another matter? They made orbit around the gas giant, and each ship deployed a pinnace to refuel it. Again, Chris had the ships convert to condition able with extra fuel tankage. They loaded almost four times their maximum reaction mass and headed back to Alwa, looking like a maternity ward waiting to happen. Chris held the acceleration down to 1.5 Gs and no jinx. Still, they went through different maneuvering drills and swept another section of the asteroid belt free of small targets. They were back by 0900 the next day. Docking didn't go as smoothly as the departure. Several ships missed their hook to the station and had to wait for a second revolution to catch the pier. Still, when the Wasp came in last, the fleet landing had taken less than twice as long as it would have if done perfectly. Kelly called for her commodores and independent division heads to report. Well done. I know the book I gave you just hours before we sorted was different from any you ever would have expected. I know long knives, Commodore Miyoshi said, and I expected strange. But you managed to surprise me. With any luck, we'll surprise the enemy. Have you reviewed thoroughly the reports of my last two fights? Yes, Hawkins said. They've added some kind of stone armor, at least to their bows. But the 20-inch laser seems to have the range on them. Exactly, Chris said. Our maneuvers are designed to take advantage of the longer range. We can expect to fight running away from them, so flipping ship will be a regular and reoccurring maneuver. Did jinking at 3.5 Gs cause any crew casualties? Commodore Bethea from Savannah shook her head. They told us you preferred young crews. I thought it was just because of your youth. <laughs> now I see why. I've tried those jinx patterns with 40-something officers and CPOs with disastrous results, Chris said, and found herself wondering how Cookie, Mother McCready, and some of the older boffins managed. None had ever complained. Likely it was a secret the old farts were keeping to themselves. Chris wondered if the day would ever come when she'd need to beg admission to their secret society. Chris, the endeavor is about to see a lux, Nellie reported. If we have nothing else, I'd like to see that ship off. Maybe it will find some answers about the people who insist we kill them or they will kill us. No one had any further business, so Chris fast walked the short distance to where the Endeavor was tied up. Chris requested permission to come aboard from an ostrich, who seemed very serious about being the OOD. She quickly passed through familiar territory. The Endeavor was a replica of the earlier wasp before the recent changes. Admiral on deck, surprised Chris, as much as it did the bridge crew. As you were, still left a bridge watch of civilians, borrowed navy, and Alwyns of both varieties a bit flustered. Before anyone could speak, Chris said, 
I'm just here to say good luck and Godspeed. I want you to come home with information. We'll do you proud, Captain O'Dell said. And we'll come home, with as much to report as we timid souls can find, Penny added. Fair winds, Chris said, and excused herself. As she walked back, the Endeavor was already backing out. Was that quick visit a waste of her time? Chris shook her head. A fighting team is a lot more than metal and circuitry. It was human heart and blood. Had Grandpa Ray forgotten that, or was it just harder to spot under all the scar tissue? Jack was waiting as she returned to the Wasp. You give them a good send-off? The best a long knife can do. Then they are well sent. So why are you here? We've got a report from one of our probes, and it's ugly. Chris started to jog for the wasp, then slowed. Admirals don't jog, not in public, not when people around the A-deck of the station are watching and looking worried. Chris walked briskly beside Jack, smiling, and even managed to laugh. Let the watchers wonder about the joke her security chief had told her. She arrived in her command center only a few seconds later than a jog would have gotten her there. What do we have? she asked Captain Drago. A series of reports of sorts from our probes at Datum 2, the one that leads to the beta jump. We sent a probe through and it reported several thousand reactors, more than it could specifically count. That's a mothership and brood, Chris said. Likely, Drago agreed. It pulled back and sent the report, as expected. Then we sent the other through with orders to stay an hour and report back. It never did. So they either don't like us peeking at them, or they're coming, Jack said. Anything from the next system in? Chris asked. Nothing. But remember... We're dealing with a lot of speed-of-light lag time. How can I forget? Chris muttered. Thank you, Captain. Now, if you don't mind, I have reports to catch up on. Running the fleet around on my string is fun, but I've got these two other hats and I've got to wear them. Captain Drago withdrew. You know, Chris, you need a chief of staff, Jack said. You applying for the job? Nope. I got to drop down and do marine stuff. The Alwins are now making hunting rifles and smokeless ammo. They've got a lot more power and range. They're working night and day to arm the Colonials and as many Alwins as want to fight. It's surprising how many do. The hold of the Elders is slipping away as the aliens get closer. So what are you doing? Ada has drawn up an evacuation plan. If the aliens get through you... We don't intend to give them any big targets, and when they come dirt side, we'll be waiting for them. My Marines are training the locals to hit something from 400 meters. Until they steal your air and water, or gas you, you'll put up quite a fight. Who knows? Maybe you won't be as dead as you could be. Maybe you can come charging back with a fleet to blast them out of orbit and save us poor settlers' hides. <laughs> Happy thoughts. I thought you Marines were pessimists. We just have to save our optimism for the right time. Like when your back is against the wall, huh? I'll miss you while I'm dirt side. I'll miss you too. And yes, I'll try to stay safe and stay human. Jack gave her a kiss, then went on his way. She waited until the scent of him was pulled away by the air circulation, then dove into her reports. Good. The first 20-inch laser was up and holding a charge. It even worked when test-fired. While she was gone, the two last Starline cargo ships had been respun into four smaller vessels and sent off to the asteroid belt. Big ships were nice, but when you needed them in four different places, smaller was better. The miners had arrived at the second gas giant and were already digging into two moons. The third was a problem. 
It had a water ocean beneath a kilometer of ice. They were hunting for an island, but so far had found none. They doubted they would. That gas giant might only have two battle moons. So, of course, Beta Jump would be the one the raiders looked to use. Chris sent a well done to all concerned with each project. It was nice to let them know the boss was watching and happy. Chris went to sleep that night wishing Jack were in bed to distract her. She could not stop her mind from whirling from one project to another. She found herself staring at the overhead at O200. She fell asleep, only to find herself being chased by Vicky Peterwald and a dozen ugly bug eyed monsters. Vicky insisted Chris dress for a ball. The monsters didn't say anything but had huge teeth. Chris wasn't about to let them get close. At 07.30 the next morning, Chris was awakened by a knock at her door. The aliens had made their move. 49. The aliens have jumped from hot datum 2 to a system only three jumps out. Captain Drago reported to Chris in her day cabin. She was still in her sleep shorts and tank top. How'd they go from five jumps out to only three? Chris demanded. It was always possible, Nellie answered. We covered all the jump points in a system, but some of the jumps take you farther than others, even if you stay at half a G and no spin. This was one of the long ones, and why I said we had to cover six jumps. Thank you, Nellie. Are there any more surprise double jumps that I don't know? No, Chris. There were a few jumps outside the six that went to four. To get to the closest systems, you have to be in one we're monitoring. Okay. They've jumped closer, faster. What did the probe show? Chris said, moving on. They blasted the buoy when they came through the jump. The reporter buoy across the system immediately jumped in to let us know we had a hot datum. The receiving buoy then dropped back into the invaded system. It's likely filling up with lots and lots of reactors. How soon before they can jump to the next system? Assuming the mothership doesn't go above 1G, we've got four days plus before they get here. If the baby monsters put on 2Gs, we've got less than two days. So we wait and see, Chris said, and went to shower and dress. She took the reports that had kept her awake most of the night to breakfast with her and was asking for updates even as she ate. Pipra must have gotten even less sleep because she had them flowing back to Chris before she finished eating. The diggers were working on both hellburner bases. Still no luck with the third. The lasers were doing well. All the smart metal from dirt side was back. Did Chris want to return it to the frigates it had been borrowed from? or spin out more ships using the new lasers. Chris thought long and hard on that question, but had no one to talk it over with. Jack was dirt side, and Penny was flossing some lion's teeth. This issue didn't seem appropriate to Abby's pay grade. She was pretty sure Captain Drago would vote for getting his armor back. When she dropped by the bridge to ask him, Drago surprised her by thinking long and hard. Yes, I'd like the armor back. But that will take yard time, and it would be nice to have more targets to confuse the alien's aim. Hard choice. How will you crew these new warships? Good question. Bring back the Navy folks' dirt side, throw in some Alwins, see if anyone in the yard or station wants to ship out for the fight. There are merchant crews on the ships we're likely to spin into frigates. Drago grinned. You think they'll be any more enthusiastic than they were when you shanghaied them into staying here? I kind of thought with the aliens this close, they'd see the benefit of fighting. Or running. Chris had gotten used to thinking in heroic mode. Should she offer her civilians a chance to go home, like she had the fleet of discovery? She shook her head. Unescorted, any transport was likely to end up boarded and dead. It could also give away too much information. No, Chris would have to figure out a way to keep those unwilling to fight somewhere out of harm's way, or at least not in her line of fire. 
I take it that you'd like your armor back? If I can get any effective fighting out of these jumped-up merchant hulls, I should consider it a bonus. Untrained, inexperienced, no practice either as a ship's company or in formation. They strike me as more a hazard to navigation than as a fighting force. Thanks for your advice. I'll talk to the yard about rotating Batron 1 and Div 10 frigates through the yard. You do that and make it happen soonest. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing at attention. Chris really didn't want to do what she had to do next. Shipyard artificers were a limited skill set. Still, in a few days, she'd be desperate for war fighters. Chris found Admiral Benson retired in his office with his feet up on his desk, watching the analysis of the latest laser test firings. He seemed happy. Admiral, have I got a deal for you. The old Navy man put his feet down, leaned forward, and scowled. My wife warned me when I took this job that you'd be saying that to me one day. We've got all the smart metal back from dirt side. I need it pumped back into the frigates. Can you do it in the yard, or should we try to do it pier side? It will go faster in the yard, what with the new reactor Mitsubishi loaned me. Bring the ships in tomorrow, and we can probably do all nine in one day. Good. That brings me to my second offer. Do you want to spend the next fight here, a sitting duck? Or would you like the plates of a fighting ship under your feet? He eyed her. The answer is obvious, but no doubt the devil is in the details. So true. Here's the situation. We've recovered almost all the smart metal from the moon base. Can you believe some of it was replaced with stone? The aliens are using stone for armor. <laughs> What's wrong with simple? Well, we've got smart metal and reactors enough to spin out two frigates. When you add the ore carriers and mining ships, I think we could patch together another four. Assuming the bastards give us time. Yes. If we have the time, how many lasers can you produce? I've got a dozen ready now, and we're doing four a day. We could go to eight if we got the materials. Which are on the ore carriers we want to convert. What about crews? The retired admiral said, his face slipping into something sly and not at all ready to buy a pig in a poke. That is a problem. How many of your yard personnel are Old Navy and don't like being sitting ducks? How many ostriches have you trained to fire the lasers? How many of the merchant crews will volunteer? And are they any good? I'd trust a rooster before I'd trust some murchies. Down, Admiral. We're all in this boat together, and we sink or swim together. So I've heard. I haven't heard it from any of them, he paused, then said, What do you propose to do with this bunch of untrained amateurs? I can't picture Drago wanting them in a line with his wasp. He's already suggested I not do that. A smart man. How about you commanding the auxiliary squadron? The old Navy man said nothing, just pushed back in his chair, gaining distance from Chris. That's what my wife warned me about. An offer of a fighting command in a hopeless situation. Damn you, temptress! It has been a long piece, hasn't it? Chris said. She knew she was talking to a highly trained and experienced leader of men, who'd spent his entire career training for one thing that never happened. He had probably dreamed all his life of a fight in the worst way, and now Chris was offering him a chance to wade into a fight, but in the worst possible way. He took a deep breath. How long do I have to decide? The longer you take, the less time you have to make it happen. I hate your logic, he said as he tapped his wrist unit. Send out standard memo A to all hands. Tell them they have two hours to volunteer, or they get to wave goodbye to us warriors from the pier. 
You already had the memo written? The day after my wife warned me this would happen, she knew me better than I did myself. Smart woman. Promised she'd never speak to me again if I got myself killed. I'm going to have Mitsubishi start spinning out the first two frigates, what with you up armoring Batron 1. You tell Admiral Hiroshi that he can't have more than one of those ships for his volunteers, and we all have to contribute crews to the other four. The yard superintendent there is Old Navy, too? Who else do you think would volunteer for this kind of duty? The Emperor said there was a good chance of a hopeless fight with no survivors, and Hiroshi was out the gate and running, <laughs> just like me. Don't worry, Admiral, Your Highness, Viceroy. You'll have your ships. Batron 5, Chris said, in reserve, behind the line. And I'll go easy on you old-timers when it comes to jinking. You young brat. Remember, you're getting older every day. Some day you'll be as old as I am if you're smart enough to live that long. No one is taking bets that I will, Chris said as she headed for the door. By the time she closed it, Benson was already talking to Hiroshi. That evening, Chris got a surprise she didn't want. Fifty. Chris was halfway through her supper when Captain Drago hurried in and took the empty chair next to her. We've lost the probe in Hot Datum 3's system. It took Chris a moment to switch gears. Weren't we supposed to keep that until tomorrow morning? Even if they headed for it at 2 G's? Yes, Chris, Nellie said. My calculations say they must have had a ship cross the system at 3.5 G's. They either squished the dickens out of the crew of one of their monster ships, or they have knocked together some speedsters, Drago said. Just a second, Chris said, glancing down at where Nellie rode below her collarbone. How come you're telling me this and not Nellie? I told Nellie I wanted to tell you, Captain Drago said. And I concluded, Nellie said, that no harm would come from this being delivered a bit slow. Having a human do it might help you. I guess I thank you both. Don't do it when time matters. I won't, both said at once. Maybe Nellie was a bit faster. Have they made the next jump? Chris asked. No, I think they will wait until the mothership is ready to go through with them. Why? both Nellie and Chris asked. We're waiting for them here, because you have the hellburners up your sleeve. They don't know that. They don't know that you won't cut behind them and hit their mothership when the fleet is rushing off to meet us. Now, if the mothership has most of their people, they will protect it. Somewhere, there's a report from the boffins on the wreck you brought in. When they sorted out the bodies, they found a six-to-four ratio of men to women, about like our warships. Want to bet the mothership has more women and children? No bet, Captain. You want to organize an attack from their rear? No, not unless they actually do move faster than the mothership can. I think after the way you smashed up the last one, these folks are taking very good care of Mother. Chris thought for a long minute. Nellie, Design me some low-tech probes that can do a good job of tracking them, that can get me a real count on the number of reactors, maybe lasers, too. Drago, alert the intrepid that she'll be sortieing at once to drop those probes off in the systems in the aliens' direct path. They'll be tiptoeing right up to a jump the aliens could be on the other side of, the captain pointed out. It's a risk we have to take. Tell her to run if she sees anything. No fighting allowed until the rest of us can get a piece of the action. You're telling a lot of folks to get close, but not touch. Trust me. When the time comes, I'll switch gears without a thought. The captain left to give the orders. Nellie went quiet for a while, then said, I've got the shipyard knocking out six probes. 
They're large and clunky with optics radar and a crude atom laser to counter alien noses. An old type computer with plenty of storage. They'll be ready in two hours. Chris, could the intrepid be up armored before she leaves? Ask Superintendent Benson if he can do it before they finish the probes? He says no. They aren't ready to begin uploading the smart metal. They'd need two more hours. I'm not willing to trust we'll have those two extra hours. Tell the skipper to have the intrepid ready to go in two hours and to put the spurs to it. 3.5 Gs or more all the way. I passed along your order, Chris. Doesn't it bother you to send them out to face the enemy with less than they should have? That was not a question Chris had expected from Nellie. But then she'd never expected Captain Drago to persuade Nellie to hold her tongue so he could talk first. More surprises. Yes, Nellie, it bothers me. But the Wasp fought its last battle with thin armor, and we had the wreckage of the Hornet aboard. In situations like this, risk is just part of the job. You have a dangerous job, Chris. But then you usually have a dangerous job. I'm just now realizing how dangerous it is. I guess I'll have to get used to it. Sorry, Nellie. Next time we're back on Wardhaven, would you like me to give you to one of my nieces? One of them should be getting school tall soon. No, Chris. I'm your computer, and you're my person. I see the difference between me and my children growing every day as they relate to their own human. Your niece might be safer to be around, but I'd be so bored singing nursery rhymes like we once did. Chris did a walk around after dinner. More material had arrived from the moon fabricators. Eight twenty inch lasers were laid out and under construction on the shop floor at one yard. Chris dropped in on all four of her commodores. Each was happy to see her, but busy. Apparently, more gear had come loose during yesterday's training cruise than had been passed up the chain of command. The repair ships and ship personnel were busy. In the Mitsubishi yard, Two frigates were already spinning themselves into shape. It had taken months to build the Wasp. Admittedly, here they had the reactors, lasers, and merchant ships to form the seed around. Still, the speed at which they took shape amazed Chris. One ship already had her name visible. Temptress, no doubt, would be Benson's flag. Chris crossed the brow of the Intrepid a good fifteen minutes before it was scheduled to depart. She found the young captain busy on the bridge, and managed to suppress their immediate reaction before they started it. I want to wish you good luck and Godspeed, she told the bridge crew. I know this mission is risky, but we need to know what we're facing. Is this one alien mother ship or two? How many escort ships do they have? Go quickly. Avoid a fight. Deploy your probes and get back here fast. If your orders don't fit your situation. Please be guided by the principle of calculated risk. We need the probes out there, but we need you here when the fight starts. You can count on us, Admiral," the captain assured her. Chris shook her hand, then left. Again, she'd done all she could do to emphasize her orders: do the job and run. Before long, she would have to issue different orders, but for the moment, running for home was what she wanted. No heroics for now. Tomorrow, Chris would somehow have to figure out a way for each of her ships to kill seven or eight of the aliens. That assumed there were only two hundred coming. The corvette, fearless, had killed her seven or eight, but at the cost of her life. Chris didn't want to trade one of her ships for eight of the aliens. That wouldn't guarantee that Jack and Granny Rita would not be pounded by the survivors. No, Chris had to repel the aliens with as much of her fleet intact as possible. How would she do that? Chris returned to the Wasp. There were no new surprises. The aliens were still in hot datum three, doing whatever they wanted to do. With Chris none the wiser, Chris went to bed with visions of ships sweeping through space. Her fleet would flee as long as it could to keep the range open for the twenty-inch guns. Assuming the aliens didn't have a surprise of their own in the gun category.
but Chris could only run so far before she had her back to Alwa. Chris brought Nellie into her thoughts, and the two of them studied the battles that Grandpa Ray and Granny Rita had fought against the Aitichi. Chris examined them and found them wanting. The frigates really did mean a new way of fighting. They reached back farther into the appalling history of human slaughter. In the bloody 20th century, Chris began to find bits and pieces that seemed to fit into her puzzle. She finally fell asleep to dream of aircraft climbing and diving as freely as her frigates in a three-dimensional battlefield. 51 Two days later, Chris was on the pier, impatiently waiting for the intrepid to lock down and unseal her quarterdeck. As soon as she did, Chris was aboard and headed for the bridge. Someone from the quarterdeck must have been on their toes this time, the captain called a ten hut even before Chris entered the bridge. For the first time in her life, Chris let them stay at attention. I thought I ordered you not to get in a fight. We didn't, Admiral. The lasers never fired. The captain was trying to avoid smiling, but it was clear she was proud of herself and her crew. Chris knew exactly how it felt. She'd done that often enough when she was a junior officer and hung a senior officer on his own petard. Chris didn't like being that senior. You came very close to having to unload a few rounds. I've seen the reports. Their fast squadron was closing in on you. We left an hour before they got there, Admiral. You told me to be guided by calculated risk. We detached the first probe at the farthest jump and it came up dead. I launched the next two and sent them through, while we retrieved the first probe and fixed it. Then one of the probes returned and gave us a picture of what was happening on the other side. Yes, there were three ships headed for us at 3.5 Gs, but they were hours away. So we hung there, switching probes through the jump point and getting a better and better picture of what was on the other side. Yes, Chris said. You got very good intel. You deserve a very well done. Thank you, ma'am. Now the proud smile did slip out. We left an hour before they were in range of the probe. They did enter the system, but when they saw us an hour ahead of them, they went back after blowing up our probes. Ma'am, I was an hour ahead of them, and if I'd had to, I could have gone to four G's. And showed them what we have. Chris pointed out. Yes, ma'am, but if they had gotten there any sooner, they would have showed me what they had. Our cursory review of the intel says the big monsters are stuck at 2 Gs and the mothership is holding at around 0.75 Gs. The new fast ones can't beat 3.5. From the look of smaller ships spread out behind the three that reached our jump, I'd say they built a lot of fast ships, but most of them can't hold 3.5 Gs. Chris's analysis of the report agreed with hers. Well, thank you, Captain. I'm glad to see you back. Now, the yard is waiting to reinforce your armor. Next time out, I'm sure you'll need it. Yes, ma'am. Sounded way too eager for the coming fight. Two days later, Chris was at the Mitsubishi yard to christen ships, the Temptress and the Kakuke, which someone said meant lucky chrysanthemum. If so, Admiral Benson's temptress had started something of a competition for the most outrageous name. The next two ships spinning at Mitsubishi were the Proud Unicorn and the Lucky Leprechaun. The two forming at the Canopus Yard would be the Fairy Princess, with hints Chris should use it for her flag, and the Mischievous Pixie. While Chris had her reservations about approving the names, they seemed to be working. Crews were lined up for all six ships, and they might go to space with more than they needed. Chris said a few encouraging words, then stood by as two lovely young women from each of the yards broke a bottle of water over each ship's bows. Lovely girl, isn't she? Admiral Benson said as the girl emptied the water on the temptress. Very lovely, Chris agreed, hoping her new policy hadn't started April to December hookups. My granddaughter, 
the retired admiral said. Your wife let her come? Chris said, raising an eyebrow to back up the question. My granddaughter signed up on her own. I spotted her name on the crew list and ordered her ashore. She hid out until we sailed. That little pixie has a heart of oak and a whim of iron. Will she be fighting with you on the temptress? I've tried to persuade her she should join the Marines' dirt side. How much luck do you think I've had? The young woman caught sight of her grandfather. She gave him a sassy wave. <laughs> About as much luck as my great-grandfather had keeping me safe, Chris said. Oh, the younger generation. Thank God they aren't as bad as my generation was. And with that, Chris returned to work. The aliens were in the last system out. Their speedy scouts had blown away the probes at the last jump, but not before the probes had gotten solid intel. Chris knew exactly what she faced. One mothership of the gigantic variety. Of the four or five hundred tonners, there were 257 in two flavors. Most shared the same power plants as the three raiders Chris had fought around the dead mothership and the Hornet's Refuge, Forty-five had different reactors of the kind Chris had fought with the first alien horde. Apparently, the survivors had transferred their allegiance to this swarm. And swarm they were. Chris had pored over the reports, studying the way the smaller monsters huddled around the slow-moving mothership or came to roost on it. Of squadrons or divisions, she could spot nothing. The ship seemed to ebb and flow around the central ship like a hive of bees— would they fight that way? Chris arranged for one last probe to be deployed at the jump point. This tiny spy alternately deployed two different periscopes through the jump, getting a visual and a sensor fix on the advancing death. Together, they told Chris she had a good 72 hours before the mothership would be ready to come through the jump. The 24 smaller but high-speed ships that lurked around the jump failed to detect the periscopes. Chris hoped they stayed as blind while she readied her deployment for battle. Chris had finally come up with an idea for how to get a hellburner on that third watery moon. Chris's research in the 20th century had given her the hint. They'd quickly spun out a submarine from the last of the smart metal and shipped it off. They drilled a hole through the kilometer-thick ice to launch it. The aliens could scorch a lot of ice and not get close to the sub deep in the ocean below. They would have to retrieve the sub as soon as the battle was over. It had only a week's worth of oxygen. If the fleet died in battle, the sub crew would die a long, slow, and cold death. All through the system, operations were closing down. The last loads of ore and their miners had ridden in on the carriers that were now being converted to fighting ships. The moon fabricators were processing their final stock and shipping most personnel to Alwa, where they'd at least have air to breathe and a fighting chance. A handful of volunteers would keep the reactors going. In the event of the fleet's defeat, they'd make sure the reactors lost containment. The aliens would find little to examine in their victory. When the fleet sortied, Canopus Station would not be totally abandoned. The fleet's auxiliaries, the repair and replenishment ships, were still tied up to their piers. Their reactors produced enough plasma to blow them to gas. The last of the 18-inch lasers were being mounted on the station. Several teams of trained ostriches had refused to withdraw and were demanding the chance to fight. Other than the Alwins and a volunteer reactor watch, the last humans would depart for Alwa in a matter of hours to hide away, there to await the victory or a long, bitter war of wits against overwhelming force. If Chris's fleet couldn't keep the aliens out of Alwa's orbit, the station and the attached auxiliaries would also blow themselves to atoms. There was one last shuttle still attached. The crew on final reactor watch could use it to try for Alwa. They might make it if they were lucky. Very lucky. Chris's next reinforcements weren't due for at least a month, probably two, those would be cruel days on Alwa if Chris's fleet couldn't stop the aliens. Chris went down her to-do list and found very little left. 
Nellie interrupted. Chris, there's a call from Jack. Hi, love. Have you found a nice South Sea island to sit out the war on? She asked. Any South Sea island here would be surrounded by eats everythings and no fun to be on. How are you doing, Chris? I'm about done. We're closing up shop and sending you everyone but the reactor operators and a few die-hard laser gunners. I know. We're putting folks to work digging shelters in the deep woods or any place else we think they won't flatten. There are a lot of colonials and elders who don't want to abandon their homes. Despite my best effort, the bombardment may get a few people. You can only advise, folk. This is a democracy, I think. Jack paused to think long and hard before he asked, Do you want me back? Of course I do. But you've got your job and I've got mine. Isn't that the way it goes? How are you making do? Your entire team is scattered to the winds. <laughs> Lord, do I miss a good argument with you or Penny or lots of folks? Chris said, seeing ghosts around herself. When this is over... We've got to take a hard look at setting you up a staff, Jack said. When this is done, Chris repeated, emphasizing the when, no if. Have you come up with a battle plan? I've got an idea that should take advantage of all we've got, she said. I know it's a good one, honey. Trust your God. It's taken good care of you so far. Thanks, love. You take care. I'll see you in a little bit. I'm looking forward to that. I've reserved our cabin on the beach for us once this is over. I'll take you up on that promise. As I see it, I deserve a month-long honeymoon, and only one day's been used up. Jack chuckled. I like a girl who keeps count. Maybe Jack ended the call with a kiss. Chris knew she did. She looked around the station. The silence echoed. Somewhere, ostriches shouted in their own language as they rigged the last laser. They'd be sitting ducks if the fleet lost, but at least they would not be shot in the rear with their head in the sand. Chris found she was beginning to like those crazy folks. Maybe she should have one on her staff. She boarded the wasp. This time out, it would be the last to leave the station. The battle squadrons were already launched and forming up, it was time to go. Chris crossed the brow and turned to salute the flag painted on the aft bulkhead, then saluted the OOD. Permission to come aboard, she said. Permission granted. Somewhere, the 1MC announced, Alwa Defense Commander arriving. Immediately, the order came down. Seal hatches. Single up the lines. Prepare to stand out. Chris headed for her command center. The final battle. No. This battle had just begun. 52. Chris sat in her egg. With the wasp at condition Z, she commanded from a much reduced and very solitary flag bridge. The screens around her showed her fleet array a hundred thousand clicks from the beta jump point. If this was going to be a running gunfight, she intended to give herself a lot of running room. At the moment, Commodore Kitano, newly frocked up, had her Batron 1 drifting in microgravity with their forward batteries aimed at the jump. Kitano commanded the seven big Wardhaven frigates that had been here the longest, Princess Royal, Constitution, Constellation, Congress, Royal, Bulwark, and Hornet, reinforced with the newly arrived resistance. Each of the other three squadrons were deployed in a line by divisions to form a loose box around the jump. Commodore Hawkins's Batron II was high with the new Wardhaven ships, Renown, Repulse, Royal Sovereign, and Resolute, brigaded with a contribution from Lorna Dew, Warrior, Warspit, Nelson, and Churchill. Commodore Miyoshi's Batron III held the low position with Haruna, Chikuma, Atago, Tone, Arasi, Hibuki, Amatukaze, and Arare. 
Commodore Bethea's Batron IV with the big cats from Savannah prowled off to the left. These last three squadrons were not in battle mode, but had extended a pole from one ship to another, so that four pairs of ships swung around each other, giving the crew some benefits of down for now. Twenty thousand clicks behind the four battle squadrons, the Ninth Division with the Helveticans Triumph, Swift Sure, Hot Spur, and Spitfire, held position beside Captain Drago's own tiny Tenth Division of Chris's flagship Wasp and the Intrepid. All swung at anchor. Thirty thousand clicks farther back, Commodore Benson's reserve squadron of merchant cruisers swung in three pairs as best they could. Unbalanced, each pair did its own crazy little jig. What could you expect from the likes of unicorns, pixies, and leprechauns? Chris heard Navy types grumble. All the crews, Navy hands, retreads, or volunteers of human or Alwyn persuasion, now waited for battle in their high G stations. Every hour, one of the forward bat runs would break out into a fighting line, and the other would go into anchor mode. A second board showed Chris that all the ships were green, reactors online, lasers charged, armor and structure undamaged. No doubt that would change soon enough. However, the fleet had been waiting for hours for the aliens to make their move, and the bad guys had declined to do much of anything. The periscope into the next system showed the alien mothership parked ten thousand clicks out from the jump. Her monster brood ebbed and flowed around her. The speedsters were up next to the jump, but they too seemed to be waiting for the auspicious moment. Chris was as prepared for battle as she'd ever be. She waited, wondering if under another star, some alien honcho was sacrificing a goat and studying its entrails. She wished he'd hurry up. Waiting was boring. At that moment, one of the speedy ships nudged through the jump and began to flip for a hasty return. One laser from each of Batron One's ships shot out, and the smaller ship vanished in a ball of gas. Apparently, the small guys hadn't gotten the rock armor. Half a minute later, a second and a third ship shot out of the jump. Accelerating at 3.5 g's, each was taken under fire by Bat Run One. As the rest of the squadrons deployed for the coming fight, Bat Run One held the line. Then there was a long pause. Apparently, another goat was needed for sacrifice. Chris waited for what the aliens might come up with next. What came through was tiny but moving fast. Chris thought atomics. Even as four recharged lasers from Katano's Batron One tore into it, whatever it was, it vaporized before it did anything. That had plutonium in it, reported Professor Labeo on net. They're using nasty stuff. Batron Five, reverse course a hundred thousand clicks and return to alert. If atomics were going to be flying around, Chris wanted those folks well back. Aye, aye, Admiral," Commodore Benson replied, and began the hard job of shepherding his enthusiastic, if undrilled, charges back. Their line was ragged as they came out of their anchorage, but they did move quickly to obey. Three more fast movers shot through the jump, accelerating as they came, but dying nevertheless. Chris wondered how long their boss would keep this up. He had less than twenty of the small type left. This time, three bombs shot out of the jump. The gunners of Batron One were on a hair trigger. Their lasers got all three again before any of them self-immolated. Isn't there supposed to be something about fratricidal destruction of other atomics when one goes off? Chris asked Nelly. It's in the literature I was able to find. Maybe they don't know about it, or maybe they'd be happy if any of them got us. But we've caught them before they could arm and explode," Captain Drago said. "They must have some safeties on them to keep them from exploding on the other side of the jump." This time, three huge monster ships popped through the jump. Chris had been expecting them. 
Three had led the way into the system the last time Chris had fought a mothership and her brood. Three battle squadrons took them under fire. Sixteen lasers slashed into each one as they appeared. The stone armor bled to dust as a second volley speared the alien ships. They exploded as reactors suffered damage and containment failed. Chris frowned. Boss man on the mothership must be getting tired of sending ships and none reporting back. What would a frustrated alien killer do? By now he must know that Chris was holding the bridge. What was her weakness? Bat Div 9, hold in place, Chris ordered. Bat runs 1 through 4, reverse course. One quarter G acceleration. Bat Div 10, reverse course and join the squadrons when they pass. Prepare for atomic attack. Chris's board lit up with acknowledgments as ships immediately responded to her order. In this battle, there was no time for a preliminary order to be followed later by an execute. Chris had rewritten the book. In an hour, she would know if her book was better than the old one. As the squadrons fell back to 120,000 clicks from the jump, the Wasp and Intrepid flipped ship and joined the withdrawal. Throughout the fleet, any sensor that didn't have to be out was retracted and covered with armor. Three small objects shot through the jump and immediately separated into four smaller ones that spun away on wild courses. The four Helvetica frigates took out eight immediately. Their fire controls switched to the remainders as quickly as computers could. Three more vanished. One took a hit, but still blew. Low-order detonation, Professor Labeo reported. Less than a megaton. He used the ancient form of measurement, one that Chris had no frame of reference for. A regular hardening for space's radiation should handle this pulse. That answered Chris's question before she asked it. Chris's screen showed the status of her entire fleet. Bat Div 9's ships switched from green to red as two reported damage to their sensors. Bat Div 9, reverse course, 1G acceleration. All others cease deceleration, reverse ship. The fleet went to 0G, but momentum continued to move it away from the jump. Rear first. Forward batteries aimed at the jump. The last holders of the bridge decamped and moved to join the rest. Chris ordered a small deceleration burn to park her fleet 140,000 clicks from the jump. Their 20-inch lasers were still in range. They waited for what came next. All too soon, it came. The jump began spitting out monster ships every second. Bat Div 9's rear batteries took out the first one. Squadrons, engage by Plan A, Chris ordered. The eight ships of Bat Run 1 engaged the next ship out, firing half their forward lasers. The second ship through the jump exploded. But there were more. The battle squadrons engaged in order the third, fourth, and fifth targets. Alien ships came through the jump, and alien ships died. It was Batron 1's turn again, but the wreckage and roiling gases from the earlier ships were making the lasers less effective. Let them get out 500 clicks, Chris ordered, and the squadrons held their fire for a fraction of a second before laying on again. Still, there were ships through now that hadn't been fired upon. For every ship they blew... One slipped through and raced off at 2G's acceleration. On the orders of their own Commodores, the squadrons flipped to bring their aft batteries to bear. More monster ships died, some in spectacular explosions, some from a series of internal blows that tore them apart. Alien ships fired back, but their lasers dissipated before they could reach Chris's fleet. Yes, alien ships died but Chris's ships were shooting themselves dry. They needed more time to recharge. As Chris's screen showed her ships firing their last pair of ready lasers, she gave her next order. Deploy chaff. Set course to 210 by 15. 
that would aim the fleet sunward and toward the nearest gas giant. Accelerate at 1G. Deploy mines on my mark. Chris waited ten seconds for the fleet to begin its move away from the laid chaff before giving the mark. As the mines silently slid from the frigates, canisters of ball bearings, metal cubes, and simple rocks left behind became active and blasted toward the alien ships. Some chaff canisters held bits of magnesium and white phosphorus with delayed timers to mix them with oxygen and set them to burning bright and hot. Behind the fleet, space began to sparkle as the chaff masked where the mines waited patiently. Almost thirty alien ships were dead, but they had forced the jump for their master. Chris had made them pay a cruel price, but it was a price someone had paid willingly. More ships came through the jump every second. Chris would not have risked ships at that short an interval, but the alien's commander did. He paid with a couple of collisions that Chris spotted, maybe more that she didn't. While her fleet spent fifteen precious seconds recharging, fifteen ships came through, spread out, and went to two G's acceleration. They formed a circle, then slowed their acceleration while later arrivals filled in the center. A fighting dish, Chris observed. She'd considered that, but dropped it for the advantage that articulated squadrons and divisions gave her. These guys had been doing this a whole lot longer than humans had. Was it nearly instinctive to them? Lasers recharged. Still, Chris continued to back off. The dish came on as more ships came through the jump and formed up in more circles. The lead alien formation approached the waiting mines, their lasers sweeping the space ahead of them. A few mines took hits, but not many. The mines were actually high-acceleration missiles with passive sensors. Once the sensors found reactors of an unknown origin near them, they waited until the aliens passed them by. Then the missiles took off at 9G acceleration, aiming their antimatter warheads for the vulnerable engines. More lasers came alive, as a few ships recognized the attack, but the missiles were close and coming in fast on an erratic course Nellie herself had designed. Explosions began to mark the fighting dish. Ships lost balanced power and shot off in wild course changes. Others began to eat themselves as reactors failed and plasma ripped through the ship. There were two more collisions. The fighting dish shattered. Reverse course, Chris ordered. One G acceleration, if you please. Her fleet flipped and charged, jinking as it closed the distance to the flailing enemy. The aliens were too busy with damage control, or they'd lost their sensors. Only a few fired at Chris's fleet or tried to dodge. Chris's squadrons mopped up the residue of the dish. Fifty-seven down, Nellie reported. Chris had no time to celebrate. Four more fighting dishes had formed up and were now headed her way, at two G's. Pop more chaff, Chris ordered, then reversed course at one G. The oncoming alien dishes began to sweep the space in front of them with their huge battery of lasers. Chris didn't try another mind drop, but she had plenty of chaff, so she did what she could to keep them working their lasers where she wanted them. Forward. Professor, Chief, let me know if their weapons begin to heat up. Human lasers lost some of their efficiency and power when the system overheated. Physics was the same galaxy wide. Chris wanted the aliens worn down before they reached the gas giant. The alien fighting dishes were now arrayed in a box, much like Chris's squadrons, but covering more space. Chris's flanks, right, left, up, and down, were covered. Chris could retreat, but if she turned to fight, she invited the aliens to swarm around her flanks and into her rear. It was not a good picture on the screens of Chris's lonely flag bridge. Another set of four dishes formed up, thirty ships to a dish, four dishes to a square, made for one hundred twenty ships. Two squares should account for all the enemies she'd identified, and then some. 
Either the last square was short a few ships, or Chris's intel hadn't counted them all. Either way, the mother ship should be coming through soon. Finally, it did. The monster fighting ships were huge, at four or five hundred thousand tons. The mother ship dwarfed them. This one was the size of a moon. Unless Chris was wrong, it was cut from the same mold as the one she'd disposed of before. Well, if you have a successful design, why mess with it? While the first square of dishes continued to close on Chris at two G's, the second held back, forming a shield around the mother ship. The smaller, faster ships darted around mother, using their few lasers to vaporize anything that came even close to her. Yep, they'd gotten the word about how Chris blew away their sister. Chris hadn't expected to use the same trick twice. The only question was, would they spot the new trick any faster? The lead box of dishes was 150,000 clicks away and closing. Chris let them get to 120,000 before she went to two Gs. She ordered the hooligan squadron into the line well to the left of Batron 1. With Batron 1 now facing the enemy's center, Chris edged the rest of her squadrons a bit to the right. Then the aliens pulled their first surprise. 53. The lead alien square of dishes has jumped to 2.5G acceleration, Chris, Nellie said. They aren't supposed to do that. No doubt a lot of aliens are feeling the pain. Squadrons, 15 degrees right, engage the closest dish, Chris ordered, as the aliens came within range. The 15-degree angle protected their vulnerable engines. Bat rounds one through four engaged the enemy's far right dish, but the enemy was coming on fast, switching their fire from motes of dust to Chris's ships. At extreme range for their lasers, damage was light, but there was plenty of it. On Chris's board, ship's armor switched from green to yellow as they began to stream steam and take hits. But the aliens were well within range of Chris's 20-inch guns. Her ships lit up the aliens. Twenty-six ships engaged thirty aliens. In a minute, the dish was an expanding ball of gas. But to finish off the aliens, Chris's ships had to flip to use their forward battery. That put the enemy way too close. Accelerate away at 2.75 Gs, Chris ordered. Pop chaff, launch a missile volley. One dish was gone but the top and bottom dishes had angled over, getting the range. The far dish was hammering Commodore Benson's hooligans of Batron 5. The cheery volunteers gave as good as they got, but Benson had to order them to run for it ahead of Chris's orders. The fleet accelerated away from the aliens, who settled back to two Gs. Chris's board was red. Constitution, Tiger, Hot Spur, and Spitfire reported damage to their engines. Chris ordered them to 3Gs to form up as a reserve. All obeyed except Hotspur, who couldn't manage even the fleet's 2.75. Four alien ships accelerated away from the rest and leapt out to engage the trailing Hotspur. They shot it out, with the other three ships of the Helvetican Ninth Div trying to support their sister. Two more alien ships died, but so did Hotspur. The three other ships, what Chris labeled Crip Div 1 for Crippled Division, pulled ahead. Each side paused to lick its wounds. The aliens reorganized themselves. The three remaining dishes reformed in a triangle. Chris reorganized, too. Despite showing yellow for damage, Triumph and Swiftsure moved up from Bat Div 9 to replace Constitution and Tiger, in bat runs one and two. Spitfire swung around to join Captain Drago's Bat Div 10, pretty much eliminating not only one division, but half of Chris's reserves. Chris did get to smile at one thing. Their pressure on the alien's right had driven the mothership to the left. Her course was edging closer to the gas giant. Good. 
the aliens had a problem. They could not handle the edge Chris's long-range 20-inch lasers gave her. The fight drew away from the jump point, but three ships still hovered there. That puzzled Chris. Chief, talk to me about those three aliens holding back. I've been meaning to mention those, ma'am. Their reactor configuration is different from the ones fighting us. One has ten smaller reactors, one has eight. Even the one with six is different. I think its reactors are more powerful than the ones we're fighting. Opinion, Captain Drago? Chris asked. Military observers from other countries. It's an old tradition. So, our next visitors are watching how we handle this bunch for future reference. I hate to say so, but it looks that way. Oh, God. Chris kind of prayed. We haven't figured out how to handle this bunch, and someone is setting us up for the next match. That's what happens when you're the champ. And if we aren't the champ, we're dead, Chris muttered. Thank you, Captain. Any time, Admiral. How long are we going to hang out here, catching our breath? They're on the course I want. Let's see what they do next. The aliens chased. Chris fled, now at a sedate 1.75 Gs. Once, she ordered an attack at long range on the lower dish, but they quickly killed their acceleration, inviting Chris to close on them while the other two dishes advanced above her. She declined. Hm. Smart move. You're learning, Chris mused. You're advancing what you want to do. I'm falling back, which I don't want to do. Chris adjusted her course to take her close to the gas giant and between two Hellburner command stations, then made a feint at the higher dish. When it flinched back, she swung toward the middle one. They all fell back and ended up pretty much in line again. Chris's fleet kept littering their retreat with chaff. Soon, Professor Lebeo reported the aliens' lasers were heating up, and they were cutting back on sweeping their path. Chris dropped off a half-dozen mines along with more chaff. Three mines caught ships. The aliens went back to blasting everything in front of them. Chris smiled as they developed the habit she wanted. The dish opposite the hooligan of Batron 5 suddenly went to 2.5 acceleration, closing the distance between them in a leap. Commodore Benson saw his danger and up the acceleration, too, but his ships had suffered more damage than they knew. The proud unicorn's motors sputtered and one blew away into space. The lucky leprechaun was no luckier. They failed to pull away. Chris ordered Batron's one, two, and three to swing inward, threatening the attacking dish's flank. Still the aliens came on. The other two dishes now were back up to two Gs and edging closer. Chris ordered missiles fired at them and had Drago move Bat Div 10 in to support Bat Ron 4's efforts to meet those two. On her left flank, the hooligans fought their battle with one dish, aided by the arrival of most of the fleet. The unicorn and leprechaun struggled to keep up, then flipped and fired full bow batteries at their tormentors. That cost the aliens two ships, but it cost the two volunteers seconds of precious acceleration. The aliens came on. Now the dish's flank burned under the fire of three battle squadrons. Ship after ship blew or stumbled out of formation, internal explosions erupting into space. Still, what was left of the dish locked its teeth onto its two unlucky victims, and a third, the Kikuke, was proving no luckier than the leprechaun. Commodore Miyoshi's ships concentrated on supporting the Kikuke, and that may have saved her. Still, both the Unicorn and the Leprechaun fell farther behind, bleeding steam and armor from hits, even as they fired ever-decreasing salvos. At close range, they both managed a missile salvo that took their closest enemy with them, as their final moment came. Suddenly, the fight was over as quickly as it had begun. Two more of Chris's ships were gone. 
but an alien dish was gone with them. The Kikuke managed to put on enough G's to crawl ahead and join Crypt Div 1. With Batron 5 reduced to three ships, Chris offered Commodore Benson the chance to take all his ships out of the line and join the cripples in reserve. We've just begun to fight, Admiral, was his reply. On Chris's board, many of her ships were showing some red for damaged. However, as the quiet between storms stretched out, temptresses, fairy princesses, and pixies' hard-working damage control parties brought them back into yellow. The alien commander also seemed to need time to reassess the situation. The two remaining dishes, both battered, slowed their advance to half a G. The rear four dishes and mothership closed on them at one G. The clan was gathering, and their swords were sharp. Chris had started with forty-four ships. She'd lost three and held four damaged ships in reserve. The tip of her spear, the four battle squadrons still had eight ships each, but she had little to play with otherwise. The remnants of Batron Five weren't even a full division, and she wasn't supposed to send her flagship charging into the line. Across space, some 180 monsters formed a hexagon. Possibly worse, 18 speedy small boys were doing a fast run, dropping well below the lowest dish to get behind Chris. So far, those little boys hadn't shown a lot of firepower, but if they got across Chris's line of flight and started tossing atomics at her, things could get messy. Constitution, Tiger, and Spitfire. You up for a high-speed run and some shooting? Chris asked. In theory, their board showed green again, but Chris didn't trust she was getting the real word. She left the Kakuke out. It showed only two lasers online. We're ready now, the skipper of the Constitution said for all. You see their little boys? We can't have them behind us. Proceed independently and stop them. Three big war wagons went to 2.75 Gs and headed down, jinking all the way. Chris could only watch that battle out of the corner of her eye. The hexagon of dishes were again trying to engulf her tiny battle array. First the top dish would edge its speed up, closing the distance a bit, then one of the side dishes would make the threat. Chris chose to feint toward one, shoot a few long-range salvos, never for more than one division of a squadron, then up her own speed to match the creeper. She picked off a ship here, another ship there, and she kept them at bay. But if they kept this up, there would still be a whole lot of them when they made orbit above Alwa. This was no way to win the war. The battle of Chris's cripples and the aliens' fast movers evolved into a swirling fight as the aliens spread out and charged in. Chris could respect their courage and their tactics. She developed similar tactics herself for the fast attack boats. Their jinking patterns are primitive and predictable. Nellie sniffed. Chris's frigates met them, and with longer range guns and the ability to maneuver almost as wildly as they did, the battle was joined. The fast movers died one by one but the lower dish didn't ignore the life-and-death fight so near. Suddenly they were doing 2.65 Gs and closing on the frigates. Chris shouted a warning and ordered Commodore Miyoshi to take his bet round three, the low squadron, down to help. The lower corners of the hexagon put on speed, and Chris had to take her entire fleet down to cover the Musashi squadron's top. Suddenly, the entire alien formation was pushing itself to higher acceleration. Withdraw fighting, Chris ordered. Fleet, go to three Gs. Among the battle squadrons, ships fired full salvos from their bow lasers, then flipped and began to fall back at three Gs. The Constitution flipped, but as it accelerated, several engines failed, sending it into a wild twist. Smart metal could be repaired but it took time for armor to flow back and form new engines. The Constitution didn't have time. 
She was pinned by more lasers that fried away her armor and let later hits slash deep into the hull. Like the enemy ships had done so many times before, the Constitution began to blow herself apart. The reactors lost containment, and the ship was a hot mass of expanding gas. The Tiger suffered the same fate. Only the Spitfire managed to put on three Gs and escape the ambush. Worse, the Otago had taken hits in the effort to save the independent frigates. It stayed in formation but showed bright red on Chris's board in too many departments. Chris gave up the idea of reforming a crypt div. She had nothing in reserve to replace damaged ships in the line, and it looked like soon the entire fleet would be showing damage. Still, she'd gained what she intended. Her rear was safe, and one of the alien's six dishes was showing thin. She dropped more chaff and a few mines. The aliens kept burning lasers to sweep the space ahead of them. And finally, Chris was approaching the gas giant. Her hopes for victory would be decided in the next few hours. 54. Orbiting the gas giant were thousands of large canisters of rocks, pebbles, and dust. Their controls were crude, and their solid rocket motors cruder still. However, when Chris ordered the cans to launch themselves toward the incoming aliens, only three failed to start. Two more didn't blow their dumb cargo into an expanding cloud in the path of the raiders. Chris edged her squadrons toward a path through the rubble, then spiked it with chaff and several dozen mines. The fleet's track wasn't free of rocks, but the five-inch secondaries handled them well, leaving the main battery to load, wait, and cool. The aliens found themselves in a hailstorm of crud. Their main batteries fired just as fast as they could recharge. They're really heating up, Professor Lebeo reported. Heating up and getting weaker. More dispersion and less power per shot. Chris smiled as three mines that had been missed came to life and climbed up the engines of the closest monsters. If possible, the aliens got even more frantic as they shot the rubble from their path. But they didn't ignore the larger problems. Two dozen ships broke away from the six dishes and set course for the eight moons orbiting the gas giant. Three worked over each of the moons thoroughly. Anything on their surface was vaporized. Out of the corner of her eye, Chris watched the moons being sanitized. She concentrated on the main fleet as it was battered by rocks. Their stone bow armor glowed red with the kiss of dust hitting them at several thousand kilometers an hour. Here and there, a laser blew as something more substantial got through. Chris led the aliens through the rocky system, making a few sallies in to shoot up a ship here or there, but the aliens seemed too busy with their own stony torment to do anything to Chris. That was what Chris wanted, an enemy fixated on the problems coming at them and too much on the ropes to waste time at what was behind them. The mother ship was not exempt from the rocks. Plenty got through the dishes ahead of her, and others had been launched from different directions. The mother ship's lasers crisscrossed the space ahead of her, heated up, and fixated on what lay ahead. The mother ship had passed close to the icy moon with the ocean beneath its thick ice cap. The acolytes had burned the ice but likely only singed the top. Now the sub cut a hole through its protection using one of the old Hornet's salvaged 24-inch pulse lasers and launched three hellburners. The Hellburners didn't shoot hell for leather for the mothership. Chris and Nellie had planned for a much more indirect approach. The missile set the tiny chunks of super-heavy neutron star on a course that would pass close by the mothership but not hit it. To a fire control computer, the flying bit of flotsam was just another bit of rubble, a chunk that didn't threaten the mothership and could be ignored, while other more dangerous pebbles got the attention of the overheated lasers. So the ignored hellburners drifted through space behind the mothership and suddenly came to life and slammed into a high-acceleration attack. 
Their specially designed engines sent them roaring toward the alien's vulnerable stern with its huge engines. The attack started and finished in hardly more time than it took to blink. But Chris wasn't blinking. She caught the moment when three missiles came to life. The aliens weren't totally mesmerized by the threat to their front. One laser winged a hellburner as it made its killing dive. Damaged, its engines sent it off course, but it passed close enough to the mothership to blow itself up and stove in 500 square kilometers of laser battery-covered hide. Possibly one of the other two was hit, but it was already committed to its final crash. Both smashed into the stern engines. Suddenly, the gigantic alien traveling moon had no stern. Not just the engineering space, but a huge section forward of it was gone. The immense ship twisted on its long axis. Chris could only imagine how that must be hurtling people about. Secondary explosions showed along the hull, as things that were never intended to be tumbled about took exception and went to pieces. Chris found it easy to pray that she'd never experience what she was putting those aliens through. Stand by, fleet, Chris sent. The aliens are likely to be even more irrational for the next couple of minutes. Chris was right. One of the dishes broke away from the others and put on three Gs, charging Chris's fleet. One ship blew up, and another suddenly lost all way, but the rest hurtled on. Chris had her squadrons do a quick turn away, then speared the attackers with their rear batteries. Lasers cut through ships already stressed way beyond their specs. Alien ships collapsed upon themselves in rolling explosions. The other dishes watched as their sisters threw themselves on their enemy and achieved nothing. Somewhere, some sense of proportion must have survived. Four dishes formed a square to hold Chris at bay, while the other one, what was left of the lower dish, went to the aid of the stricken mothership. Six more hellburners were already launched at the alien. Five were spotted and shot out of space, with their huge explosions wasted on nothing but rock dust. The sixth made it into a formation of a half-dozen monsters, busy trying to figure out how to approach the twisting mothership. The hellburner blew one up, hurled its wreckage against two more, and sent them hurtling into the mothership. Still, the aliens struggled to succor their mothership, leaving Chris to wonder if there was someone or something they held so sacred that they had to save it. Chris had other problems. From the looks of it, some fifty of the ships she had just fought were refugees from the ship she'd fought earlier. Did she want to fight all these ships again, after they joined up with the three Watchers? Not really. The odds were now down to just 120 of them, to 38 of hers. They were the best she'd had all day. She measured the situation and found she liked it. Quickly, she ordered three Batrons to hit the saucer at the left-hand corner of the square. Batron 1 and the survivors of Batron 5, with Chris's flag division, would hold off the rest. The aliens must have been distracted. Half the dish vanished under her frigate's fire before the survivors broke ranks and fled. But not all were running. The right-hand dish launched itself at Chris's flank. Her two battered squadrons held the line long enough for Chris to bring the rest around to reinforce them. The second dish crumbled as half or more of its ships vanished into balls of glowing gas. Now the other two dishes broke and ran. Chris ordered her commodores to pursue, but cautiously. Damaged ships will fall out of line, she ordered, which left a dozen frigates forming up slowly in her rear. Chris didn't mind that. She needed ships to give the final coup de grace to alien ships that were damaged themselves and unable to keep up with their fleeing comrades. The aliens were in a bad way. To flee, they had to show Chris's ships their vulnerable engines, and they fled at a slower acceleration than Chris's fleet pursued. Twice, fleeing alien ships turned and tried to charge Chris's reduced battle squadrons. 
Twice, Chris had the fleet dance back out of the alien's desperate grasp. The Otago approached three hulks spinning in space and prepared to give them the coup de grace. One came to life and shot toward her. The Otago and the alien died in one ball of gas. Chris ordered her cleanup ships to be more careful. She doubted that order was necessary. A dozen ships around the dying mothership held station too long and were destroyed in Chris's sweep. None offered to surrender. None, in final distress, deployed lifeboats. Chris was sickened by the slaughter, but she did not order her ships to break off. It was several hours later before the final ship, running for the jump point at 3.5 Gs, crumbled under the fire of the Haruna. That was fitting, because Commodore Miyoshi's bet round three had led the pursuit. Now we are avenged, he reported to Chris when the final ship was disposed of. Banzai, may their brave spirits now rest in peace. Chris thanked him, but when the remnant of his squadron came to a halt before the jump point with only four ships still with him, he asked Chris if he should continue the pursuit. Chris didn't have to think long on his question. She ordered him to stay in system. We don't know what they've got waiting for us, and we've just shown them how to hold one side of a jump point. Commodore Miyoshi did not question the order. Indeed, Chris could hardly count on half of her ships being in any kind of fighting shape. The jump brought a question to Chris. Nelly, did you notice when the three alien observers ducked out? They took their leave shortly after the mothership was hit, and the general rout began, Chris. I can't tell if they'd seen enough or whether they wanted to get a good head start on us pursuing them. Chris took a second look at her options of charging through that jump point. She carefully checked her board. Not one ship was undamaged. Even the wasp had been lazed hard during the long battle. Nellie, if I ordered a pursuit at 3.5 Gs, could I catch them before they jumped out of the next system? The next system has four jumps. It's very unlikely you could catch all of them, assuming even a 2.5 G flight, before they jumped out of that system. You know very well how hard a stern chase like that can be. As a survivor of one, Chris did. The idea of ordering her ships to stick their noses in that noose when the pursued aliens could be waiting for them with atomics gave her the shivers. This battle is over, she pronounced, and found it good. She gave the order to the Commodores to bring their ships back to the station at whatever acceleration they thought they could maintain. The cost of a battle is not tallied until the last ship made port. Jack, I think we won, she reported, but I need your help. Some of our ships are dead in space. Could you get the crews of the repair ships to the head of the line for the trip to Canopus Station? We need them out here, helping our worst-hit ships limp back. When she got his reply of, Thank God in the Navy. Help is on the way, hun. Long boats were already lifting from Alwa. Help didn't arrive soon enough. The warrior of Lorna Du suffered an internal fire they couldn't control. It reached the reactors. They succeeded in abandoning ship before it blew. Chris had started the battle with 44 ships. Seven had paid the ultimate price to save Alwa. This time. Chris, a ship just jumped into the system, Nellie said. Before Chris could hit the panic button, her computer added, Its signature matches the endeavor. I think Penny's back. A message from Chris's friend arrived hours later. Chris, just a quick report. We found the alien homeworld, I think. More interestingly, we found a world just one jump from it that was attacked with atomics and rocks until it's nothing but a blackened jumble. Hardly anything alive right down to bacteria and viruses. Someone seriously wailed on that planet. 
The home planet shows some serious hits from space too, but it still has people, primitive hunter gatherers, not even farming. Our probes got DNA off several. They match the aliens we're fighting, but no likely mixing for over a hundred thousand years. Oh, and get this: one of the badly damaged areas, little more than a glassy plain, has a pyramid right in the middle of it. We didn't land. <laughs> Your orders, remember? But I'd sure like to see what someone built in the middle of a dead zone. I've got a lot more. Seems like you've been busy. See you back at Alwa. Chris sent Penny a "See you at Alwa" response. That would wait. Other things couldn't. There were wounded, not many. With smart metal, damage was either controlled or catastrophic. No. A memorial service would have to be near the top of Chris's to-do list. Chris tallied her losses and wondered what more might be added to them before the last ship struggled back to Canopy Station. And Chris, Nelly said, "You promised yourself and Jack some more of that honeymoon time too. Don't forget that. I doubt he will." Chris looked at what she had done, and could only mutter. I hope not. I sincerely hope not. This has been an Audible Frontiers production of Defender, written by Mike Shepard, narrated by Dina Perlman, producer Mike Charzak, copyright 2013 by Mike Moscow, production copyright 2013 by Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.